Chapter One of The Lancashire Witches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches. A Romance of Pendle Forest. By William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction. THE LAST ABBOT OF WHALEY CHAPTER I THE BEACON ON PENDLE HILL There were eight watchers by the beacon on Pendle Hill in Lancashire. Two were stationed on either side of the north-eastern extremity of the mountain. One looked over the castled heights of Clitheroe, the woody eminence of Bowland, the bleak ridges of Thornley, the broad moors of Bleasdale, the trough of Bowland, and Wolf Crag and even brought within his ken the black fells overlooking Lancaster. The other tracked the stream called Pendle Water, almost from its source amid the neighbouring hills, and followed its windings through the leafless forest, until it united its waters to those of the Calder, and swept on in swifter and clearer current to wash the base of Whaley Abbey. But the watcher's survey did not stop here. Noting the sharp spire of Burnley Church, relieved against the rounded masses of timber constituting Townley Park, as well as the entrance of the gloomy mountain gorge known as the Grange of Cliviger, his far-reaching gaze passed over Todmorden and settled upon the distant summit of Blackstone Edge. Dreary was the prospect on all sides, black moor, bleak fell, straggling forest, intersected with sullen streams as black as ink, with here and there a small tarn or moss-pool, with waters of the same hue. These constituted the chief features of the scene. The whole district was barren and thinly populated. Of towns, only Clitheroe, Colne, and Burnley, the latter little more than a village, were in view. In the valleys there were a few hamlets and scattered cottages, and on the upland an occasional booth, as the hut of the herdsman was termed, but of more important mansions there were only six, Mursley, Twistleton, Allencoats, Saxfield, Eyton Hill, and Gawthorpe, the vaccaries for the cattle of which the herdsmen had the care, and the lawns or parks within the forest appertaining to some of the halls before mentioned, offered the only evidence of cultivation. All else was heathy waste, morass, and wood. Still, in the eye of the sportsman, and the Lancashire gentlemen of the sixteenth century were keen lovers of sport, the country had a strong interest. Pendle Forest abounded with game. Grouse, plover, and bittern were found upon its moors, woodcock and snipe on its marshes, mallard, teal, and widgeon upon its pools. In its chases ranged herds of deer, protected by the terrible forest laws then in full force and the hardier huntsman might follow the wolf to his lair in the mountains, might spear the boar in the oaken glades, or the otter on the river's brink, might unearth the badger or the fox, or smite the fierce catamountain with a quarrel from his bow. A nobler victim sometimes also awaited him, in the shape of a wild mountain bull, a denizen of the forest, and a remnant of the herds that had once browsed upon the hills, but which had almost all been captured and removed to stock the park of the abbot of Whaley. The streams and pools were full of fish, the stately heron frequented the meres, and on the craggy heights built the kite, the falcon, and the kingly eagle. There were eight watchers by the beacon. Two stood apart from the others, looking to the right and the left of the hill. Both were armed with swords and arquebuses, and wore steel caps and coats of buff. Their sleeves were embroidered with the five wounds of Christ, encircling the name of Jesus, the badge of the pilgrimage of grace. Between them, on the verge of the mountain, was planted a great banner, displaying a silver cross, the chalice and the host, together with an ecclesiastical figure, but wearing a helmet instead of a mitre, and holding a sword in place of a crozier, with the unoccupied hand pointing to the two towers of a monastic structure, as if to intimate that he was armed for its defence. This figure, as the device beneath it showed, represented John Paslew, abbot of Whaley, or, as he styled himself in his military capacity, Earl of Poverty. There were eight watchers by the beacon. Two have been described. 
Of the other six, two were stout herdsmen, carrying crooks, and holding a couple of mules, and a richly caparisoned war-horse by the bridle. Near them stood a broad-shouldered, athletic young man, with the fresh complexion, curling brown hair, light eyes, and open Saxon countenance, best seen in his native county of Lancaster. He wore a Lincoln green tunic, with a bugle suspended from the shoulder by a silken cord, and a silver plate engraved with the three luces, the ensign of the abbot of Whaley, hung by a chain from his neck. A hunting-knife was in his girdle, and an eagle's plume in his cap, and he leant upon the butt-end of a crossbow, regarding three persons who stood together by a peat fire, on the sheltered side of the beacon. Two of these were elderly men, in the white gowns and scapularies of Cistercian monks, doubtless from Whaley, as the abbey belonged to that order. The third and last, and evidently their superior, was a tall man in riding-dress, wrapped in a long mantle of black velvet, trimmed with miniver, and displaying the same badges as those upon the sleeves of the sentinels, only wrought in richer material. His features were strongly marked and stern, and bore traces of age, but his eye was bright, and his carriage erect and dignified. The beacon, near which the watchers stood, consisted of a vast pile of logs of timber, heaped upon a circular range of stones, with openings to admit air, and having the centre filled with faggots and other quickly combustible materials. Torches were placed near at hand, so that the pile could be lighted on the instant. The watch was held one afternoon at the latter end of November 1536. In that year had arisen a formidable rebellion in the northern counties of England, the members of which, while engaging to respect the person of the king, Henry the Eighth, and his issue, bound themselves by solemn oath to accomplish the restoration of papal supremacy throughout the realm, and the restitution of religious establishments and lands to their late ejected possessors. They bound themselves also to punish the enemies of the Romish Church and suppress heresy. From its religious character, the insurrection assumed the name of the Pilgrimage of Grace, and numbered among its adherents all who had not embraced the new doctrines in Yorkshire and Lancashire. That such an outbreak should occur on the suppression of the monasteries was not marvellous. The desecration and spoliation of so many sacred structures, the destruction of shrines and images long regarded with veneration, the ejection of so many ecclesiastics, renowned for hospitality and revered for piety and learning, the violence and rapacity of the commissioners appointed by the vicar-general Cromwell to carry out these severe measures, all these outrages were regarded by the people with abhorrence, and disposed them to aid the sufferers in resistance. As yet the wealthier monasteries in the north had been spared, and it was to preserve them from the greedy hands of the visitors, doctors Lee and Leighton, that the insurrection had been undertaken. A simultaneous rising took place in Lincolnshire, headed by Mackerel, abbot of Barlings, but it was speedily quelled by the vigour and skill of the Duke of Suffolk, and its leader executed. But the northern outbreak was better organised and of greater force, for it now numbered thirty thousand men, under the command of a skilful and resolute leader named Robert Ask. As may be supposed, the priesthood were main movers in a revolt, having their especial benefit for its aim, and many of them, following the example of the abbot of Barlings, clothed themselves in steel instead of woollen garments, and girded on the sword and the breastplate for the redress of their grievances and the maintenance of their rights. Among these were the abbots of Gervaux, Furness, Fountains, Rivo, and Sally, and lastly the abbot of Whaley, before mentioned, a fiery and energetic prelate, who had ever been constant and determined in his opposition to the aggressive measures of the king. Such was the pilgrimage of grace, such its design, and such its supporters. Several large towns had already fallen into the hands of the insurgents. York, Hull, and Pontefract had yielded. Skipton Castle was besieged and defended by the Earl of Cumberland, and battle was offered to the Duke of Norfolk and the Earl of Shrewsbury, who headed the king's forces at Doncaster. But the object of the royalist leaders was to temporise, and an armistice was offered to the rebels and accepted. Terms? were next proposed and debated. During the continuance of this armistice, 
all hostilities ceased, but beacons were reared upon the mountains, and their fires were to be taken as a new summons to arms. This signal the eight watchers expected. Though late in November, the day had been unusually fine, and in consequence the whole hilly ranges around were clearly discernible, but now the shades of evening were fast drawing on. "'Night is approaching,' cried the tall man in the velvet mantle impatiently, "'and still the signal comes not. Wherefore this delay? Can Norfolk have accepted our conditions? Impossible. The last messenger from our camp at Scoresby Lees brought word that the Duke's sole terms would be the King's pardon to the whole insurgent army, providing they at once dispersed, except ten persons, six named and four unnamed.' "'And were you among those named, Lord Abbot?' demanded one of the monks. "'John Paslew, Abbot of Whaley, it was said, headed the list,' replied the other, with a bitter smile. "'Next came William Trafford, Abbot of Sally. Next Adam Sudbury, Abbot of Jervaux. Then our leader, Robert Ask. Then John Eastgate, Monk of Whaley.' "'How, Lord Abbot?' exclaimed the monk, was my name mentioned? It was, rejoined the abbot, and that of William Haydock, also monk of Whaley, closed the list. The unrelenting tyrant, muttered the other monk, but these terms could not be accepted. Assuredly not, replied Pasnew, they were rejected with scorn, but the negotiations were continued by Sir Ralph Elliker and Sir Robert Bowers, who were to claim on our part a free pardon for all, the establishment of a Parliament and Courts of Justice at York, the restoration of the Princess Mary to the succession, the Pope to his jurisdiction, and our brethren to their houses. But such conditions will never be granted. With my consent, no armistice should have been agreed to. We are sure to lose by the delay— but I was overruled by the Archbishop of York and the Lord Darcy. Their voices prevailed against the Abbot of Whaley, or, if it please you, the Earl of Poverty. It is the assumption of that derisive title which has drawn upon you the full force of the King's resentment, Lord Abbot, observed Father Eastgate. It may be, replied the Abbot. I took it in mockery of Cromwell and the ecclesiastical commissioners and I rejoice that they have felt the sting. The abbot of Barlings called himself Captain Cobbler, because, as he affirmed, the state wanted mending like old Shuan, and is not my title equally well chosen? Is not the church smitten with poverty? Have not ten thousand of our brethren been driven from their homes to beg or to starve? Have not the homeless poor whom we fed at our gates and lodged within our wards gone away hungry, and without rest? Have not the sick, whom we would have relieved, died unattended by the hedge-side? I am the head of the poor in Lancashire, the redresser of their grievances, and therefore I style myself Earl of Poverty. Have I not done well?' "'You have, Lord Abbot,' replied Father Eastgate. "'Poverty will not alone be the face of the Church, but of the whole realm, if the rapacious designs of the monarch and his heretical counsellors are carried forth,' pursued the abbot. "'Cromwell, orderly and rich, have wisely ordained that no infant shall be baptised without tribute to the king, that no man who owns not above twenty pounds a year shall consume wheat and bread, or eat the flesh of fowl or swine without tribute.' and that all proud land shall pay tribute likewise. Thus the church is to be beggared, the poor plundered, and all men burdened to fatten the king and fill his exchequer. Oh, this must be a jest, observed Father Haydock. It is a jest no man laughs at, rejoined the abbot sternly, any more than the king's counsellors will laugh at the Earl of Poverty, whose title they themselves have created. "'But wherefore comes not the signal? Can aught have gone wrong? I will not think it. The whole country from the Tweed to the Humber and from the Loon to the Mersey is ours, and if we but hold together our cause must prevail.' "'Yet we have many and powerful enemies,' observed Father Eastgate, "'and the King, it is said, hath sworn never to make terms with us.' 
tidings were brought to the abbey this morning that the earl of derby is assembling forces at preston to march upon us we will give him a warm reception if he comes replied paslew fiercely he will find that our walls have not been crenelled and embattled by license of good king edward the third for nothing and that our brethren can fight as well as their predecessors fought in the time of Abbot Holden, when they took tithe by force from Sir Christopher Parsons of Sladeburn. The abbey is strong and right well defended, and we need not fear a surprise. But it grows dark fast, and yet no signal comes. Perchance the waters of the Don have again risen so as to prevent the army from fording the stream, observed Father Haydock or it may be that some disaster hath befallen our leader. "'Nay, I will not believe the latter,' said the abbot. "'Robert Ask is chosen by heaven to be our deliverer. It has been prophesied that a worm with one eye shall work the redemption of the fallen faith. And you know that Robert Ask hath been deprived of his left orb by an arrow?' "'Therefore it is,' observed Father Eastgate, "'that the pilgrims of grace chant the following ditty.' Forth shall come and ask with one eye, he shall be chief of the company, chief of the northern chivalry. What more? demanded the abbot, seeing that the monk appeared to hesitate. Nay, I know not whether the rest of the rhymes may please you, Lord Abbot, replied Father Eastgate. Let me hear them, and I will judge, said Paslew. Thus urged, the monk went on. One shall sit at a solemn feast. Half warrior, half priest, the greatest there shall be the least. The last verse, observed the monk, had been added to the ditty by Nicholas Demdike. I heard him sing it the other day at the abbey gate. What? Nicholas Demdike of Worston? cried the abbot. He whose wife is a witch? The same, replied Eastgate. Oh, be so counted, sure enough, remarked the forester who had been listening attentively to their discourse, and who now stepped forward. "'But don't know you think it. Believe me, Lord Abbot. Best them darks too young and too pretty for a witch.' "'Thou art bewitched by her thyself, Cuthbert," said the abbot, angrily. "'I shall impose a penance upon thee, to free thee from the evil influence. Thou must recite twenty paternosters daily, fasting for one month, and afterwards perform a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Gilsland.' Beth Demdike is an approved and notorious witch, and hath been seen by credible witnesses attending a devil's sabbath on this very hill, heaven shield us. It is therefore that I have placed her and her husband under the ban of the church, pronounced sentence of excommunication against them, and commanded all my clergy to refuse baptism to their infant daughter newly born. Where's me, I not reap well, Lord Abbot, replied Ashbead. A best text sentence, sorry art. Then let her amend her ways, or heavier punishment will befall her, cried Pasdew severely. Sortilegam non patris vivere, saith the Levitical law. If she be convicted, she shall die the death. That she is comely, I admit, but it is the comeliness of a child of sin. Dost thou know the man with whom she is wedded, or supposed to be wedded? For I have seen no proof of the marriage. He is a stranger here. I know no doubt about him, Lord Abbot, except he come to Pendle a twelve month agone, replied Ashbead. But I knows for well that that tweak cumbling feller robbed me at prettiest lass in old Lancashire. Ah, old Englandshire, for the matter of that. What manner of man is he? Oh, it's a few tack, a very few tack, replied Ashbead. With face as black as a boggart, sooty shiny hair like a mouldy warp, and iron like a staniel. But for running, rustling, and throwing stone, he is no match in this country. I tried him at it, three gems, so I could speak. For the most part, he in a big black bandy hewit with him, and bad mess, I can't help thinking he may as free sometimes with your lordship's books. Ha! This must be looked to. You say you know not whence he comes. It is strange. Miss Bannard Carl boyed no questioning, nor throttle him, replied Ashbead. He owns you with a jab or a thwack of his staff. When I last seat him, he threatened to rattle me bones well, but I soon lowered him a peg. We will find a way of making him speak, said the abbot. 
he can speak, and write well if he pleases, remarked Father Eastgate, for though ordinarily silent and sullen enough, yet when he doth talk, it is not like one of the hinds with whom he consorts, but in a good set phrase, and his bearing is as bold as that of one who hath seen service in the field. My curiosity is aroused, said the abbot. I must see him. No sooner said than done, cried Ashbead, for by Lord Harry I see him standing by yon moss pool atop of the hill, though I get in there dull only knows. And he pointed out a tall dark figure, standing near a little pool on the summit of the mountain, about a hundred yards from them. Talk of ill, and ill cometh, observed Father Haydock. And see, the wizard hath a black hound with him. It may be his wife in that likeness. No, I know his town reet well, Father Haydock, replied the forester. It's a St. Dubert, and a wearin' for fox or badger. Oh, life, feather, where that black bandy with I was speaking on? I like not the appearance of the knave at this juncture, said the abbot. Yet I wish to confront him and charge him with his misdemeanours. Hark, he sings, cried Father Haydock, and as he spoke, a voice was heard chanting. One shall sit at a solemn feast, half warrior, half priest. The greatest there shall be the least. The very ditty I heard, cried Father Eastgate, but list, he has more of it. And the voice resumed. He shall be rich, yet poor as me, abbot and earl of poverty, monk and soldier, rich and poor. He shall be hanged at his own door. Loud derisive laughter followed the song. By our lady of Whaley, the knave is mocking us, cried the abbot. Send a bolt to silence him, Guthbert. The forester instantly bent his bow, and a quarrel whistled off in the direction of the singer. But whether his aim were not truly taken, or he meant not to hit the mark, it is certain that Demdike remained untouched. The reputed wizard laughed aloud, took off his felt cap in acknowledgment, and marched deliberately down the side of the hill. "'Thou art not wont to miss thine aim, Cuthbert,' cried the abbot, with a look of displeasure. "'Take good heed thou producest this scurril knave before me, when these troublous times are over.' "'But what's this? He stops. Ha! He is practising his devilries on the mountainside.' It would seem that the abbot had good warrant for what he said. As Demdike, having paused at a broad green patch on the hillside, was now busied in tracing a circle round it with his staff. He then spoke aloud some words, which the superstitious beholders construed into an incantation, and after tracing the circle once again, and casting some tufts of dry heather, which he plucked from an adjoining hillock on three particular spots, he ran quickly downwards, followed by his hound, and leaping a stone wall surrounding a little orchard at the foot of the hill, disappeared from view. "'Go and see what he hath done,' cried the abbot to the forester, "'for I like it not.' Ashby instantly obeyed, and on reaching the green spot in question, shouted out that he could discern nothing, but presently added, as he moved about, that the turf heaved like a sway-bed beneath his feet, and he thought, to use his own phraseology, would brast. The abbot then commanded him to go down to the orchard below, and if he could find Demdike, to bring him to him instantly. The forester did as he was bidden ran down the hill, and, leaping the orchard wall as the other had done, was lost to sight. Ere long it became quite dark, and as Ashhead did not reappear, the abbot gave vent to his impatience and uneasiness, and was proposing to send one of the herdsmen in search of him, when his attention was suddenly diverted by a loud shout from one of the sentinels, and a fire was seen on a distant hill on the right. "'The signal! The signal!' cried Passview joyfully. "'Kindle a torch! Quick! Quick!' And as he spoke, he seized a brand, and plunged it into a peat fire, while his example was followed by the two monks. "'It is the beacon on Blackstone Edge,' cried the abbot. "'And look! A second blazes over the Grange of Cliviger, another on Eaton Hill, another on Bullsworth Hill, and the last on this neighbouring heights of Padium. Our own comes next.' May it light the enemies of our holy church to perdition! With this, 
he applied the burning brand to the combustible matter of the beacon. The monks did the same, and in an instant a tall pointed flame rose up from a thick cloud of smoke. Ere another minute had elapsed, similar fires shot up to the right and the left, from the high lands of Trawden Forest, on the jagged points of Fowlridge, on the summit of Cowling Hill, and so on to Skipton. Other fires again blazed on the towers of Clitheroe, on Longridge and Ribchester, on the woody eminences of Bowland, on Wolf Crag, and on Fell and Scar, all the way to Lancaster. It seemed the work of enchantment, so suddenly and so strangely did the fires shoot forth. As the beacon flame increased, it lighted up the whole of the extensive table-land on the summit of Pendle Hill, and a long lurid streak fell on the darkling moss-pool near which the wizard had stood. But when it attained its utmost height, it revealed the depths of the forest below, and a red reflection here and there marked the course of Pendle Water. The excitement of the abbot and his companions momentarily increased, and the sentinels shouted as each new beacon was lighted. At last almost every hill had its watchfire, and so extraordinary was the spectacle that it seemed as if weird beings were abroad and holding their revels on the heights. Then it was that the abbot, mounting his steed, called out to the monks, "'Holy fathers, you will follow to the abbey as you may. I shall ride fleetly on and dispatch two hundred archers to Huddersfield and Wakefield. The abbots of Sally and Jervaux, with the prior of Burlington, will be with me at midnight, and at daybreak we shall march our forces to join the main army. Heaven be with you.' "'Stay!' cried a harsh, imperious voice. "'Stay!' And, to his surprise, the abbot beheld Nicholas Demdike standing before him. The aspect of the wizard was dark and forbidding, and seen by the beacon light, his savage features, blazing eyes, tall, gaunt frame, and fantastic garb, made him look like something unearthly. Flinging his staff over his shoulder, he slowly approached, with his black hound following close by at his heels. "'I have a caution to give you, Lord Abbot,' he said. "'Hear me speak before you set out for the Abbey, or ill will befall you.' "'Ill will before me, if I listen to thee, thou wicked churl,' cried the abbot. "'What hast thou done with Cuspert Ashbead?' "'I have seen nothing of him, since he sent a bolt after me, at your bidding, Lord Abbot,' replied Demdike. "'Beware lest any harm come to him, or thou wilt rue it,' cried Paslew. "'But I have no time to waste on thee. Farewell, fathers.' High mass will be said in the convent church before we set out on the expedition to-morrow morning. You will both attend it. You will never set out upon the expedition, Lord Abbot, cried Demdike, planting his staff so suddenly into the ground before the horse's head that the animal reared and nearly threw his rider. How now, fellow, what mean you? cried the abbot furiously. To warn you, replied Demdike. Stand aside cried the abbot, spurring his steed, or I will trample you beneath my horse's feet. I might let you ride to your own doom, rejoined Demdike, with a scornful laugh, as he seized the abbot's bridle. But you shall hear me. I tell you you will never go forth on this expedition. I tell you that ere to-morrow Whaley Abbey will have passed for ever from your possession, and that if you go thither again your life will be forfeited, "'Now, will you listen to me?' "'I am wrong in doing so,' cried the abbot, who could not, however, repress some feelings of misgiving at this alarming address. "'Speak. What would you say?' "'Come out of earshot of the others, and I will tell you.' And he led the abbot's horse to some distance further on the hill. "'Your cause will fail, Lord Abbot,' he then said. "'Nay, it is lost already.' "'Lost!' cried the abbot, out of all patience. "'Lost! Look around! Twenty fires are in sight! Aye, thirty! And every fire thou seest will summon a hundred men, at least, to arms. Before an hour five hundred men will be gathered before the gates of Whaley Abbey.' "'True,' replied Demdike. "'But they will not own the Earl of Poverty for their leader.' "'What leader will they own, then?' demanded the abbot, scornfully. "'The Earl of Derby,' 
replied Demdike. He is on his way thither, with Lord Mount Eagle from Preston. Ha! exclaimed Paslew. Let me go meet them, then. But thou triflest with me, fellow. Thou canst know nothing of this. When scots thou thine information? He did not, replied the other. Thou wilt find it correct. I tell thee, proud abbot, that this grand scheme of thine and of thy fellows for the restitution of the Catholic Church has failed, utterly failed. "'I tell thee thou liest, false knave,' cried the abbot, striking him on the hand with his scourge. "'Quit thy hold, and let me go.' "'Not till I have done,' replied Demdike, maintaining his grasp. "'Well hast thou styled thyself Earl of Poverty, for thou art poor and miserable enough. Abbot of Whaley, thou art no longer. Thy possessions will be taken from thee, and if thou returnest thy life also will be taken.' If thou fleest, a price will be set upon thy head. I alone can save thee, and I will do so on one condition. Condition? Make conditions with thee, bond-slave of Satan! cried the abbot, gnashing his teeth. I reproach myself that I have listened to thee so long. Stand aside, or I will strike thee dead. You are wholly in my power, cried Demdike, with a disdainful laugh. And as he spoke, he pressed the large sharp bit against the charger's mouth, and backed him quickly to the very edge of the hill, the sides of which here sloped precipitously down. The abbot would have uttered a cry, but surprise and terror kept him silent. "'Were it my desire to injure you, I could cast you down the mountainside to certain death,' pursued Demdike. "'But I have no such wish. On the contrary, I will serve you, as I have said, on one condition.' "'Thy condition would imperil my soul,' said the abbot, full of wrath and alarm. "'Thou seekest in vain to terrify me into compliance. "'Vade retro, Satanus! I defy thee, and all thy works.' Demdike laughed scornfully. "'The thunders of the church do not frighten me,' he cried. "'But look,' he added, "'you doubted my word when I told you the rising was at an end. "'The beacon fires on Bullsworth Hill.' and on the Grange of Cliviger are extinguished. That on Padium Heights is expiring. Nay, it is out, and ere many minutes all these mountain watchfires will have disappeared like lamps at the close of a feast. Ah, well, lady, it is so, cried the abbot in increasing terror. What new jugglery is this? It is no jugglery, I tell you, replied the other. The waters of the dawn have again risen, the insurgents have accepted the king's pardon, have deserted their leaders, and dispersed. There will be no rising to-night, or on the morrow. The abbots of Gervaux and Sally will strive to capitulate, but in vain. The pilgrimage of grace is ended. The stake for which thou playedst is lost. Thirty years hast thou governed here, but thy rule is over. Seventeen abbots have there been of Whaley, the last, thou. But there shall be none more. It must be the demon in person that speaks thus to me, cried the abbot, his hair bristling on his head, and a cold perspiration bursting from his pores. No matter who I am, replied the other. I have said I will aid thee on one condition. It is not much. Remove thy ban from my wife, and baptize her infant daughter, and I am content. I would not ask thee for this service, slight though it be. But the poor soul hath set her mind upon it. Wilt thou do it? No, replied the abbot, shuddering. I will not baptize a daughter of Satan. I will not sell my soul to the powers of darkness. I adjure thee to depart from me, and tempt me no longer. Vainly thou seekst to cast me off, rejoined Demdike. What if I deliver thine adversaries into thine hand? and revenge thee upon them. Even now there are a party of armed men waiting at the foot of the hill to seize thee and thy brethren. Shall I show thee how to destroy them? Who are they? demanded the abbot, surprised. Their leaders are John Bradill and Richard Asherton, who shall divide Whaley Abbey between them, if thou stayst them not, replied Demdike. I'll consume them, cried the abbot. Thy speech shows consent rejoined Demdike. "'Come this way.' And without waiting the abbot's reply, 
he dragged his horse towards the butt end of the mountain. As they went on, the two monks, who had been filled with surprise at the interview, though they did not dare interrupt it, advanced towards their superior, and looked earnestly and inquiring at him. But he remained silent, while to the men-at-arms and the herdsmen, who demanded whether their own beacon-fire should be extinguished, as the others had been, he answered moodily in the negative. "'Where are the foes you spoke of?' he asked, with some uneasiness, as Demdike led his horse slowly and carefully down the hillside. "'You shall see anon,' replied the other. "'You are taking me to the spot where you traced the magic circle,' cried Paslew in alarm. "'I know it from its unnaturally green hue. I will not go thither.' "'I do not mean that you should, Lord Abbot,' replied Demdike, halting. "'Remain on this firm ground. Nay, be not alarmed. You are in no danger. Now, bid your men advance, and prepare their weapons.' The abbot would have demanded wherefore, but at a glance from Demdike he complied, and the two men-at-arms, and the herdsmen, arranged themselves beside him, while fathers Eastgate and Haydock, who had gotten upon their mules, took up a position behind. Scarcely were they thus placed when a loud shout was raised below, and a band of armed men, to the number of thirty or forty, leapt the stone wall, and began to scale the hill with great rapidity. They came up a deep dry channel, apparently worn in the hillside by some former torrent, and which led directly to the spot where Demdike and the abbot stood. The beacon fire still blazed brightly, and illuminated the whole proceeding, showing that these men, from their accoutrements, were royalist soldiers. "'Stir not, as you value your life,' said the wizard to Paslew, "'but observe what shall follow.'" End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of The Lancashire Witches – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter The Lancashire Witches A Romance of Pendle Forest by William Harrison Ainsworth Introduction The Last Abbot of Whaley Chapter Two The Eruption Demdike went a little further down the hill, stopping when he came to the green patch. He then plunged his staff into the sod at the first point where he had cast a tuft of heather and with such force that it sank more than three feet. The next moment he plucked it forth, as if with a great effort, and a jet of black water spouted into the air. But heedless of this he went to the next mark spot, and again plunged the sharp point of the implement into the ground. Again it sank to the same depth, and on being drawn out a second black jet sprung forth. Meanwhile, the hostile party continued to advance up the dry channel before mentioned, and shouted on beholding those strange preparations, but they did not relax their speed. Once more the staff sank into the ground, and a third black fountain followed its extrication. By this time the royalist soldiers were close at hand, and the features of their two leaders, John Bradill and Richard Asherton, could be plainly distinguished, and their voices heard. "'Tis he, tis the rebel abbot," vociferated Bradill, pressing forward. "'We were not misinformed. He has been watching by the beacon. The devil has delivered him into our hands.' "'Ho, ho!' laughed Demdike. "'Abbot no longer. Tis the Earl of Poverty you mean,' responded Asherton. "'The villain shall be gibbeted on the spot where he has fired the beacon, as a warning to all traitors.' "'Ha!' "'Heretics! Ah, blasphemers! I can at least avenge myself upon you!' cried Paslew, striking spurs into his charger. But ere he could execute his purpose, Demdike had sprung backward, and catching the bridle, restrained the animal by a powerful effort. "'Hold!' he cried in a voice of thunder, "'or you will share their fate!' As the words were uttered, a dull, booming, subterranean sound was heard, and instantly afterwards— with a crash like thunder, the whole of the green circle beneath slipped off, and from a yawning rent under it burst forth with irresistible fury a thick, inky-coloured torrent, 
which, rising almost breast-high, fell upon the devoted royalist soldiers who were advancing right in its course. Unable to avoid the watery eruption, or to resist its fury when it came upon them, they were instantly swept from their feet and carried down the channel. A sight of horror was it to behold the sudden rise of that swarthy stream, whose waters, tinged by the ruddy glare of the beacon fire, looked like waves of blood. Nor less fearful was it to hear the first wild despairing cry raised by the victims, or the quickly stifled shrieks and groans that followed, mixed with the deafening roar of the stream and the crashing fall of the stones which accompanied its course. Down, down went the poor wretches, now utterly overwhelmed by the torrent, now regaining their feet only to utter a scream and then be swept off. Here a miserable straggler, whirled onwards, would clutch at the banks and try to scramble forth, but the soft turf giving way beneath him, he was hurried off to eternity. At another point, where the stream encountered some trifling opposition, some two or three managed to gain a footing, but they were unable to extricate themselves. The vast quantity of boggy soil brought down by the current, which rapidly collected here, embedded them, and held them fast, so that the momently deepening water, already up to their chins, threatened speedy immersion. Others were stricken down by great masses of turf, or huge rocky fragments, which, bounding from point to point with the torrent, bruised or crushed all they encountered, or, lodging in some difficult place, slightly diverted the course of the torrent, and rendered it yet more dangerous. On one of these stones, larger than the rest, which had been stopped in its course, a man contrived to creep, and with difficulty kept his post amid the raging flood. Vainly did he extend his hand to such of his fellows as were swept, shrieking past him, he could not lend them aid, while his own position was so desperately hazardous that he did not dare to quit it. To leap on either bank was impossible, and to breast the headlong stream certain death. On goes the current, madly, furiously, as if rejoicing in the work of destruction, while the white foam of its eddies presents a fearful contrast to the prevailing blackness of the surface. Over the last declivity it leaps, hissing, foaming, crashing like an avalanche. The stone wall for a moment opposes its force, but falls the next, with a mighty splash, carrying the spray far and wide, while its own fragments roll onward with the stream. The trees of the orchard are uprooted in an instant, and an old elm falls prostrate. The outbuildings of a cottage are invaded, and the porkers and cattle, divining their danger, squeal and bellow in affright, but they are quickly silenced. The resistless foe has broken down wall and door, and buried the poor creatures in mud and rubbish. The stream next invades the cottage, breaks in through door and window, and filling all the lower parts of the tenement, in a few minutes converts it into a heap of ruin. On goes the destroyer, tearing up more trees, levelling more houses, and filling up a small pool, till the latter bursts its banks, and with an accession to its force, pours itself into a mill-dam. Here its waters are stayed until they find a vent underneath, and the action of the stream, as it rushes downward through this exit, forms a great eddy above, in which swim some living things, cattle and sheep from the fold, not yet drowned, mixed with furniture from the cottages, and amidst them the bodies of some of the unfortunate men-at-arms which have been washed hither. But, ha! Ah, another thundering crash! The dam has burst! The torrent roars and rushes on furiously as before, joins its forces with Pendle water, swells up the river, and devastates the country far and wide. Footnote 1. A similar eruption occurred at Pendle Hill in August 1669, and has been described by Mr. Charles Townley in a letter cited by Dr. Whitaker in his excellent History of Whaley. Other and more formidable eruptions had taken place previously, occasioning much damage to the country. The cause of the phenomenon is thus explained by Mr. Townley. The colour of the water, its coming down to the place where it breaks forth between the rock and the earth, with that other particular of its bringing nothing along but stones and earth, are evident signs that it hath not its origin from the very bowels of the mountain, but that it is only rain-water, coloured first in the moss-pits, of which the top of the hill, being a great and considerable plain, is full. 
shrunk down into some receptacle fit to contain it, until at last, by its weight or by some other cause, it finds a passage to the sides of the hill, and then away between the rock and swarth, until it breaks the latter and violently rushes out. The abbot and his companions beheld this work of destruction with amazement and dread. Blanched terror sat in their cheeks, and the blood was frozen in Paslew's veins, for he thought it the work of the powers of darkness, and that he was leagued with them. He tried to mutter a prayer, but his lips refused their office. He would have moved, but his limbs were stiffened and paralysed, and he could only gaze aghast at the terrible spectacle. Amidst it all he heard a wild burst of unearthly laughter, proceeding, he thought, from Demdike, and it filled him with new dread, but he could not check the sound, neither could he stop his ears, though he would fain have done so. Like him, his companions were petrified and speechless with fear. After this had endured for some time, though still the black torrent rushed on impetuously as ever, Demdike turned to the abbot and said, "'Your vengeance has been fully gratified. You will now baptise my child?' "'Never, never, cursed being!' shrieked the abbot. "'Thou mayst sacrifice her at thine own impious rites. But see, there is one poor wretch yet struggling with the foaming torrent. I may save him.' "'That is John Bradill, thy worst enemy,' replied Demdike. "'If he lives, he shall possess half Whaley Abbey. "'Thou hadst best also save Richard Asherton, "'who yet clings to the great stone below. "'As if he escapes, he shall have the other half. "'Mark him, and make haste, for in five minutes both shall be gone.' "'I will save them if I can. "'Be the consequence to myself what it may.' replied the abbot, and regardless of the derisive laughter of the other, who yelled in his ears as he went, "'Bess shall see thee hanged at thine own door!' He dashed down the hill to a spot where a small object, distinguishable above the stream, showed that someone still kept his head above water, his tall stature having preserved him. "'Is it you, John Bradill?' cried the abbot, as he rode up. "'Aye!' "'replied the head. "'Forgive me for the wrong I intended you, "'and deliver me from this great peril.' "'I am come for that purpose,' replied the abbot, "'dismounting and disencumbering himself of his heavy cloak. "'By this time the two herdsmen had come up, "'and the abbot, taking a crook from one of them, "'clutched hold of the fellow, "'and plunging fearlessly into the stream, "'extended it towards the drowning man, "'who instantly lifted up his hand to grasp it. "'In doing so, Bradil lost his balance, but as he did not quit his hold, he was plucked forth from the tenacious mud by the combined efforts of the abbot and his assistant, and with some difficulty dragged ashore. "'Now for the other,' cried Paslew, as he placed Bradil in safety. "'One half of the abbey is gone from thee,' shouted a voice in his ears as he rushed on. Presently, he reached the rocky fragment on which Ralph Asherton rested. The latter was in great danger from the surging torrent, and the stone on which he had taken refuge tottered at its base, and threatened to roll over. "'In heaven's name help me, Lord Abbot, as thou thyself shall be holpen at thy need!' shrieked Asherton. "'Be not afraid, Richard Asherton,' replied Paslew. "'I will deliver thee as I have delivered John Bradill.' but the task was not of easy accomplishment. The abbot made his preparations as before, grasped the hand of the herdsman, and held out the crook to Asherton. But when the latter caught it, the stream swung him round with such force that the abbot must either abandon him or advance further into the water. Bent on Asherton's preservation, he adopted the latter expedient, and instantly lost his feet, while the herdsman, unable longer to hold him, let go the crook, and the abbot and Asherton were swept down the stream together. Down, down they went, destruction apparently awaiting them. But the abbot, though sometimes quite under the water, and bruised by the rough stones and gravel with which he came in contact, still retained his self-possession, and encouraged his companion to hope for succour. In this way they were borne down to the foot of the hill, the monks, the herdsmen, and the men-at-arms having given them up as lost. But there yet lived, yet floated, though greatly injured and almost senseless, 
when they were cast into a pool formed by the eddying waters at the foot of the hill. Here, wholly unable to assist himself, Asherton was seized by a black hound, belonging to a tall man who stood on the bank, and who shouted to Paslew as he helped the animal to bring the drowning man ashore. "'The other half of the abbey is gone from thee. Wilt thou baptise my child if I send my dog to save thee?' "'Never!' replied the other, sinking as he spoke. Flashes of fire glanced in the abbot's eyes, and stunning sound seemed to burst his ears. A few more struggles, and he became senseless. But he was not destined to die thus. What happened afterwards he knew not, but when he recovered full consciousness, he found himself stretched with aching limbs and throbbing head upon a couch in a monastic room, with a richly painted and gilded ceiling, with shields at the corners, emblazoned with the three luces of Whaley, and with panels hung with tapestry from the looms of Flanders, representing divers scriptural subjects. Oh, "'Have I been dreaming?' he murmured. "'No,' replied a tall man, standing by his bedside. "'Thou hast been saved from one death to suffer another more ignominious.' Ah! cried the abbot, starting up and pressing his hand to his temples. "'Thou here? "'I, I am appointed to watch thee,' replied Demdike. "'Thou art a prisoner in thine own chamber at Whaley. "'All has befallen as I told thee. "'The Earl of Derby is master of the abbey. "'Thy adherents are dispersed, and thy brethren are driven forth. "'Thy two partners in rebellion, the abbots of Jervaux and Sally, have been conveyed to Lancaster Castle, whither thou wilt go as soon as thou canst be moved. I will surrender all, silver and gold, land and possessions, to the king, if I may die in peace, groaned the abbot. It is not needed, rejoined the other. Attainted of felony, thy lands and abbey will be forfeited to the crown, and they shall be sold, as I have told thee, to John Bradill and Richard Asherton, who will be rulers here, in thy stead? Would I had perished in the flood, groaned the abbot. Well mayst thou wish so, returned his tormentor, but thou wert not destined to die by water. As I have said, thou shalt be hanged at thy own door, and my wife shall witness thy end. Who art thou? I have heard thy voice before, cried the abbot. It is like the voice of one whom I knew years ago, and the features are like his, though changed greatly. Who art thou? Thou shalt know before thou diest, replied the other, with a look of gratified vengeance. Farewell, and reflect upon thy fate. So saying, he strode towards the door, while the miserable abbot arose, and marching with uncertain steps to a little oratory adjoining, which he himself had built, knelt down before the altar, and strove to pray. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Lancashire Witches This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter The Lancashire Witches A Romance of Pendle Forest by William Harrison Ainsworth Introduction The Last Abbot of Whaley Chapter three Whaley Abbey A sad, sad change hath come over the fair Abbey of Whaley. It knoweth its old masters no longer. For upwards of two centuries and a half hath the blessed place grown in beauty and riches. Seventeen abbots have exercised unbounded hospitality within it, but now they are all gone, save one, and he is attainted of felony and treason. The grave monk walketh no more in the cloisters, nor seeketh his pallet in the dormitory. Vesper or matin song resound not, as of old, within the fine conventual church, Stripped are the altars of their silver crosses, and the shrines of their votive offerings and saintly relics. Picks and chalice, thurible and vile, 
golden-headed pastoral staff and mitre embossed with pearls, candlestick and Christmas ship of silver, salver, basin and ewer, all are gone. The splendid sacristy hath been despoiled. A sad, sad change hath come over Whaley Abbey. The libraries, well stocked with reverend tomes, have been pillaged, and their contents cast to the flames, and thus long-laboured manuscript, the fruit of years of patient industry, with gloriously illuminated missal, are irrecoverably lost. The large infirmary no longer receiveth the sick, in the locutory sitteth no more the guest. No longer in the mighty kitchens are prepared the prodigious supply of meats, destined for the support of the poor, or the entertainment of the traveller. No kindly porter stands at the gate, to bid the stranger enter and partake of the munificent abbot's hospitality. But a churlish guard bids him hie away, and menaces him, if he tarries, with his halbert. Closed are the buttery hatches and the pantries, and the daily dole of bread hath ceased. Closed also to the brethren is the refectory. The cellarer's office is ended. The strong ale, which he brewed in October, is tapped in March by roistering troopers. The rich muscadel and Malmsey, and the wines of Gascoigne and the Rhine, are no longer quaffed by the abbot and his more honoured guests, but drunk to his destruction by his foes. The great gallery, a hundred and fifty feet in length, the pride of the abbot's lodging, and a model of architecture, is filled not with white-robed ecclesiastics, but with an armed earl and his retainers. Neglected is the little oratory dedicated to Our Lady of Whaley, where night and morn the abbot used to pray. All the old religious and hospitable uses of the abbey are foregone. The reverent stillness of the cloisters, scarce broken by the quiet tread of the monks, is now disturbed by armed heel and clank of sword while in its saintly courts are heard the ribald song, the profane jest, and the angry brawl. Of the brethren, only those tenanting the cemetery are left, all else are gone, driven forth as vagabonds, with stripes and curses, to seek refuge where they may. A sad, sad change has come over Whaley Abbey. In the plenitude of its pride and power has it been cast down, desecrated, despoiled, its treasures are carried off, its ornaments sold, its granaries emptied, its possessions wasted, its storehouses sacked, its cattle slaughtered and sold, but though stripped of its wealth and splendour, though deprived of all the religious graces that, like rich incense, lent an odour to the fane, its external beauty is yet unimpaired, and its vast proportions undiminished. A stately pile was Whaley, one of the loveliest as well as the largest in the realm. Carefully had it been preserved by its reverend rulers, and where reparations or additions were needed, they were judiciously made. Thus age had lent it beauty, by mellowing its freshness and toning its hues, while no decay was perceptible. Without a struggle had it yielded to the captor, so that no part of its wide belt of walls or towers, though so strongly constructed as to have offered effectual resistance, were injured. Never had Whaley Abbey looked more beautiful than on a bright, clear morning in March, when this sad change had been wrought, and when, from a peaceful monastic establishment, it had been converted into a menacing fortress. The sunlight sparkled upon its grey walls, and filled its three great quadrangular courts with light and life, piercing the exquisite carving of its cloisters, and revealing all the intricate beauty and combinations of the arches. Stains of painted glass fell upon the floor of the magnificent conventual church, and dyed with rainbow hues the marble tombs of the laces, the founders of the establishment, brought thither when the monastery was removed from Stanlaw in Cheshire and upon the brass-covered gravestones of the abbots in the presbytery. There lay Gregory de Northbury, eighth abbot of Stanlaw and first of Whaley, and William Reed, the last abbot. But there was never to lie John Paslew. The slumber of the ancient prelates was soon to be disturbed, and the sacred structure within which they had so often worshipped upreared by sacrilegious hands. But all was bright and beauteous now, and if no solemn strains were heard in the holy pile, 
its stillness was scarcely less reverential and awe-inspiring. The old abbey wreathed itself in all its attractions, as if to welcome back its former ruler, whereas it was only to receive him as a captive doomed to a felon's death. But this was outward show. Within, all was terrible preparation. Such was the discontented state of the country, that fearing some new revolt, the Earl of Derby had taken measures for the defence of the abbey, and along the wide circling walls of the close were placed ordnance and men, and within the grange stores of ammunition. A strong guard was set at each of the gates, and the courts were filled with troops. The bray of the trumpet echoed within the close, where rounds were set for the archers, and martial music resounded within the area of the cloisters. Over the great north-eastern gateway, which formed the chief entrance to the abbot's lodging, floated the royal banner. Despite these warlike proceedings, the fair abbey smiled beneath the sun, in all, or more than all, its pristine beauty, its green hills sloping gently down towards it, and the clear and sparkling calder dashing merrily over the stones at its base. But upon the bridge, and by the riverside, and within the little village, many persons were assembled, conversing gravely and anxiously together, and looking out towards the hills, where other groups were gathered, as if in expectation of some afflicting event. Most of these were herdsmen and farming men, but some among them were poor monks in the white habits of the Cistercian Brotherhood, but which were now stained and threadbare, while their countenances bore traces of severest privation and suffering. All the herdsmen and farmers had been retainers of the abbot. The poor monks looked wistfully at their former habitation, but replied not except by a gentle bowing of the head to the cruel scoffs and taunts with which they were greeted by the passing soldiers. But the sturdy rustics did not bear these outrages so tamely, and more than one brawl ensued in which blood flowed, while a ruffianly arquebusier would have been drowned in the calder, but for the exertions to save him of a monk whom he had attacked. This took place on the 11th of March, 1537, more than three months after the date of the watching by the beacon before recorded. And the event, anticipated by the concourse, without the abbey, as well as by those within its walls, was the arrival of Abbot Pasnew and Fathers Eastgate and Haydock, who were to be brought on that day from Lancaster, and executed on the following morning before the abbey, according to sentence passed upon them. The gloomiest object in the picture remains to be described, but yet it is necessary to its completion. This was a gallows of unusual form and height, erected on the summit of a gentle hill, rising immediately in front of the abbot's lodgings, called the Whole Houses, whose rounded, bosomy beauty it completely destroyed. This terrible apparatus of condign punishment was regarded with abhorrence by the rustics, and it required a strong guard to be kept constantly round it to preserve it from demolition. Amongst a group of rustics collected on the road leading to the north-east gateway was Cuthbert Ashbead, who, having been deprived of his forester's office, was now habited in a frieze doublet and hose, with a short camlet cloak on his shoulder, and a fox-skin cap, embellished with the grinning jaws of the beast on his head. "'Eh, Rutcher de Rofs,' he observed to a bystander, "'that's a fear for sight, that gallows, who han't been up to toll houses to take a look at it, belike.' "'No, no, I dunna like such sights,' replied Rutcher de Rofs. Beside, there were a great rabblement at gain, one of them lunges archer chaps, knocked me up knob wi' a pike, and told me he'd hung me wi' tabbert if I didna keep out at way. And serve to right too, that cruddenly carl, cried Ashbead, doubling his horny fists. Odds flesh, why didn't you have a tussle wi' him? My aunt's a itching for a bout wi' terrific robbers. Well a day, well a day. "'that we should live to see Tully feathers driven like hummerbees out at your nest. "'Why, they're saying that King Harry had declared there were to have no more monks of fries in all Englandshire. "'Only think of that. "'And don't you know that Tabbots of Gervaux and Sally were hunged on Pies Day at Lancaster Castle?' "'Good Lord, just bless us!' exclaimed a sturdy hind. "'We ain't a pretty king!' First he chops off his wife's head, and then hongs out priests. What'll the world come to? 
"'Eh, but, miss, what when it come to?' cried Roger to Rolfs. "'But we dare not open our mouths for fear of a gog.' "'No, belady, but I stop and mine wide enough,' cried Ashbead. "'And if a dozen of your chaps win join me, "'I'll try to set poor Abbot free when they brings him here.' "'I'd as leave bad till to-morrow,' said Roger to Rolfs uneasily. "'Eh, thou art a timorsome tyke as I told to before,' replied Ashbead. "'But what dost thou say, Alan Abs?' he added to the sturdy hind who had recently spoken. "'I and spilt last drop o' my blood in told Abbot's cause,' replied Hal and Abs. "'We winna stand by and see him unked like a dog. Abbot Passloot at rescue, lads!' "'Ah, Abbot Passloot at rescue!' responded all the others, except Rutgeta Rolfs. "'This must be prevented,' muttered a voice near them, and immediately afterwards a tall man quitted the group. "'What were it spot? cried Hal and Abs. "'Oh, I seen that he witch, Nick Demdike!' "'Nick Demdike here?' cried Ashbead, looking round in alarm. "'Has he heard us?' "'Like a now,' replied Hal and Abs. "'But I didn't mind him afore.' "'No, I neither,' cried Roger to Rolfs, crossing himself and spitting on the ground. "'Oh, Lady O'Wherley, shield us from Borlock!' "'Talking of Nick Demdike,' cried Hal and Abs, "'the old strange adventure we him it neat at great brass to Pendle Hill, and you, Cuthbert?' "'Yeah, Phillips tack him if I hadn't,' replied Ashbead. "'That's dear all about if it will. "'I was sent by Tabbert down till to win a gabs of Perkins of Dannels and Knowles Humphreys Orchard, the Worston Lane, to look after him. "'Well, when I gets out at Stone War, what do you think I sees? Twenty or thirty pikemen standing behind it, "'and they dashes at me as thick as a sleeter, and afore I can roar out.' They blindfolded me and clap an iron gog in my mouth. Well, I could neither speak nor see, but I can use my feet. So I punches at them right and left, and by my troth, lads, you'd a like to hear how they roared, so I should roar too if I couldn't, when they began to thwack me with their rattling paws, and ding me so about the head that I fell back of a swoon. When I come to, I was lying on my back in Remington Moor, Every bone in my eye racked, and my hair were clotted with gore, but T-Bond and Gag were gone, so I gets to my feet, and daddles along as well as I can, when all at once I spies a, a lee glinting afore me, and a dancing about like an oaf or will-o'-the-wisp. Thinks I, that's fra Rush and his lantern, and he'll lead me into a quagmire. So I stops a bit to consider where I'd gotten, for I didn't know up right road exactly. But when I stood still, Fleet stood still too, and then I made out that it come from an old ruined tower, and what I'd fancy were one lantern proved twenty. For when I reached the tower and peeped in through a broken window, I beheld a seat I'd never forget a pack of witches. Ah, witches! sitting in the ring with their broomsticks and lanterns about them. "'Good gorgeous days!' cried Hal and Abs. And "'What else did Sir seem on?' "'Why,' replied Ashbead, "'Toad Hags had a little figure in midst of them, moulded to clay, representing Tabard of Whaley. I knowed it by Mitre and Crozier, and after each at Varmint had stuck a pin in its heart, a tall black mon stepped forward, and tied a cord round its throttle, and unked it up. And black man, cried Hal and Abs, breathlessly, the black mon were Nick Demdike. Yon guessed it, replied Ashbead. Twere he. I was so gloppant I couldn't speak, and my blood froze in my veins. When I heard a fearful voice, I asked Nick where his wife and jilt were. The infant is unbaptized, brought voice. At the next meeting it must be sacrificed. See that thou bring it. Dimdark 
then bound to summat i couldn't see and axe went next meeting were to be held on the night of abbot paslew's execution answered bryce on hearing this i could bear no longer but shouted out witches devils lord deliver us from you and as i spoke i tried to burst through the window in the trice old leets went out there were a great rush to the tower a, a whirring around the air like a covey of partridges fleeing off and then i heard no more for a great stone fell on me sconce and knocked me down senseless when i come to i was in nick demdike's cottage with his wife waiting over me and the unbaptized chilt in her arms all exclamations of wonder on the part of the rustics and inquiries as to the issue of the adventure were checked by the approach of a monk who joining the assemblage called their attention to a priestly train slowly advancing along the road it is headed he said by fathers chapburn and chester late bursers of the abbey alack alack they now need the charity themselves which they once so lavishly bestowed on others where's me ejaculated ashbead money a broad mirk as i had gotten from them they've been kind to us all added the others next come father burnley granger and father howarth cellarer pursued the monk and after them father dinkley sacristan and father moore porter you remember father moore lads cried ashbead yea to be sure we done replied the others a good mon a great good mon he never sent a wet poor no he after father moore said the monk pleased with their warmth comes father forrest the procurator with fathers reed clough and bancroft and the procession is closed by Father Smith, the late prior. "'Down are your whirly-bones, lad, as dolly fathers pass,' cried Ashbead, and craved their blessing. And as the priestly train slowly approached, with heads bowed down, and looks fixed sadly upon the ground, the rustic assemblage fell upon their knees, and implored their benediction. The foremost in the procession passed on in silence, but the prior stopped, and extending his hand over the kneeling group, cried in a solemn voice, "'Heaven bless ye, my children. You are about to witness a sad spectacle. You will see him who hath clothed you, fed you, and taught you the way to heaven, brought hither a prisoner, to suffer a shameful death.' "'But we set him free, holy prior,' cried Ashbead. "'We made up our minds to it. You just wait till he comes.' "'Nay,' "'I command you to desist from the attempt. "'If any such you meditate,' rejoined the prior, "'it will avail nothing, and you will only sacrifice your own lives. "'Our enemies are too strong. "'The abbot himself would give you like counsel.' "'Scarcely were the words uttered than from the great gate of the abbey "'there issued a dozen arquebusiers with an officer at their head, "'who marched directly towards the kneeling hinds, "'evidently with the intention of dispersing them. Behind them strode Nicholas Demdike. In an instant the alarmed rustics were on their feet, and Roger to Rolfs and some few among them took to their heels. But Ashbead, Hal and Abs, with half a dozen others, stood their ground manfully. The monks remained in the hope of preventing any violence. Presently the halberdiers came up. "'That is the ringleader,' cried the officer, who proved to be Richard Asherton, pointing out Ashbead. "'Seize him!' "'No mon shall lay on me,' cried Cuthbert, and as the guard pushed past the monks to execute their leader's order, he sprang forward, and wresting a halbert from the foremost of them, stood upon his defence. "'Seize him, I say!' shouted Asherton, irritated at the resistance offered. "'Keep off!' cried Ashbead. "'Your best! Like a staggered bay I'm dangerous! Where horns, I say!' The arquebusiers looked irresolute. It was evident Ashbead would only be taken with life, and they were not sure that it was their leader's purpose to destroy him. "'Put down thy weapon, Cuthbert,' interposed the prior. "'It will avail thee nothing against odds like these.' "'Maybe, holy prior,' 
rejoined Ashbead, flourishing the pike. "'But I shall only yield with my life.' "'I will disarm him,' cried Demdike, stepping forward. "'No,' retorted Ashbead, with a scornful laugh. "'Come on, then. As to all the fiends he hell at thy back, I shouldn't fear thee.' "'Yield!' cried Demdike, in a voice of thunder, and fixing a terrible glance upon him. "'Come on, wizard!' rejoined Ashbead, undauntedly, but observing that his opponent was wholly unarmed, he gave the pike to Hal and Abs, who was close beside him, observing, "'It shall never be said that Cuthbert Ashbead fought to duel himself unfairly. Now, touch me if thou darest.' Demdike required no further provocation. With almost supernatural force and quickness, he sprang upon the forester and seized him by the throat. But the active young man freed himself from the grip, and closed with his assailant. But though of Herculean build, it soon became evident that Ashbead would have the worst of it, when Alan Abs, who had watched the struggle with intense interest, could not help coming to his friend's assistance, and made a push at Demdike with the halbert. Could it be that the wrestlers shifted their position, or that the wizard was indeed aided by the powers of darkness? None could tell. But so it was that the pike pierced the side of Ashbead, who instantly fell to the ground with his adversary upon him. The next instant his hold relaxed, and the wizard sprang to his feet unarmed, but deluged in blood. Hal and Abs uttered a cry of keenest anguish, and flinging himself upon the body of the forester, tried to staunch the wound. But he was quickly seized by the arquebusiers, and his hands tied behind his back with a thong, while Ashbead was lifted up and borne towards the abbey, the monks and rustics following slowly after, but the latter were not permitted to enter the gate. As the unfortunate keeper, who by this time had become insensible from loss of blood, was carried along the walled enclosure leading to the abbot's lodgings, a female, with a child in her arms, was seen approaching from the opposite side. She was tall, finely formed, with features of remarkable beauty, though of a masculine and somewhat savage character, and with magnificent but fierce black eyes. Her skin was dark, and her hair raven-black, contrasting strongly with the red band wound around it. Her kirtle was a murray-coloured serge, simply but becomingly fashioned. A glance sufficed to show her how matters stood with poor Ashbead, and uttering a sharp, angry cry she rushed forward. "'What have you done?' she cried, fixing a keen, reproachful look on Demdike, who walked beside the wounded man. "'Nothing,' replied Demdike, with a bitter laugh. "'The fool has been hurt with a pike. Stand out of the way, Bess, and let the men pass. They are about to carry him to the cell under the chapter-house.' "'You shall not take him there!' cried Bess Demdike, fiercely. "'He may recover if his wound be dressed. Let him go to the infirmary.' Ha, I forgot there is no one there now. Father Mancroft is at the gate, observed one of the arquebusiers. He used to act as surgeon at the abbey. No monk must enter the gate, except the prisoners when they arrive, observed Asherton. Such are the positive orders of the Earl of Derby. It is not needed, observed Demdike. No human aid can save the man. But can other aid save him? said Bess, breathing the words in her husband's ears. "'Go to!' cried Demdike, pushing her roughly aside. "'Wouldst have me save thy lover?' "'Take heed!' said Bess, in a deep whisper. "'If thou save him not, by the devil thou servest, thou shalt lose me and thy child.' Demdike did not think it proper to contest the point, but approaching Asherton, requested that the wounded man might be conveyed to an arched recess, which he pointed out. Assent being given, Ashbead was taken there, and placed upon the ground, after which the arquebusiers and their leader marched off, while Bess, kneeling down, supported the head of the wounded man upon her knee, and Demdike, taking a small phial from his doublet, poured some of its contents down his throat. The wizard then took a fold of linen, with which he was likewise provided, and dipping it in the elixir, applied it to the wound. In a few moments Ashbead opened his eyes, and, looking round wildly, fixed his gaze upon Bess, who placed her finger upon her lips to enjoin silence, 
but he could not, or would not, understand the sign. "'Oh, so are we me, Bess,' he groaned. "'But I'd rather deed dust with thee beside me than any other way.' "'Hush!' exclaimed Bess. "'Nicholas is here.' "'Oh, I see,' replied the wounded man, looking round. "'But what matters it? I'll be gone soon. "'Ah, oh, Bess, dear lass, if thou'dst promise to break thy compact with Satan, to repent and save thy precious soul, I should thy consent.' "'Oh, do not talk thus!' cried Bess. "'You will soon be well again.' "'Listen to me,' continued Ashbead earnestly. "'Dost thou know that if thy babe be ne'er baptised afore to man a neat, it'll be sacrificed at Prince of Darkness? Go to some at Dolly Vedas. Confess thy sins, and implore heaven's forgiveness. Mayhap thou save thee and thy infant.' "'And be warned as a witch,' rejoined Bess fiercely. "'It is useless, Cuthbert. I have tried them all. I have knelt to them, implored them, but their hearts are as hard as flints. They will not heed me. They will not disobey the abbot's cruel injunction, though he be their superior no longer. But I shall be avenged on him, terribly avenged.' "'Save me, thou wicked woman,' cried Ashbead. "'I do not wish to hear thee no more.' "'Let me dear peace.' "'Thou wilt not die, I tell thee, Cuthbert,' cried Bess. "'Nicholas hath staunched thy wound.' "'He staunched it, sayest thou?' cried Ashbead, rising. "'I never owe my life to him.' And before he could be prevented, he tore off the bandage, and the blood burst forth anew. "'It is not my fault if he perishes now,' observed Demdike moodily. "'Help him! Help him!' implored Bess. "'He shanna touch me!' cried Ashbead, struggling and increasing the effusion. "'Keep him off! I adjure thee! Farewell, Bess!' he added, sinking back utterly exhausted by the effort. Cuthbert! screamed Bess, terrified by his looks. "'Cuthbert, art thou really dying? Look at me! Speak to me!' "'Ah!' she cried as if seized by a sudden idea. "'They say the blessing of a dying man will avail. Bless my child, Cuthbert, bless it. Give it to me,' groaned the forester. Bess held the infant towards him, but before he could place his hands upon it, all power forsook him, and he fell back and expired. "'Lost! Lost for ever! Lost!' cried Bess, with a wild shriek. At this moment a loud blast was blown from the gate-tower, and a trumpeter called out, "'The abbot and two other prisoners are coming!' "'To thy feet, wench!' cried Demdike imperiously, and seizing the bewildered woman by the arm. "'To thy feet, and come with me to meet him!' End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches. A Romance of Pendle Forest. By William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction. The Last Abbot of Whaley. Chapter Four. The Malediction. The captive ecclesiastics, together with the strong escort by which they were attended, under the command of John Bradill, the high sheriff of the county, had passed the previous night at Whitwell, in Boland Forest, and the abbot, before setting out on his final journey, was permitted to spend an hour in prayer in a little chapel on an adjoining hill, overlooking a most picturesque portion of the forest, the beauties of which were enhanced by the windings of the Hodder, one of the loveliest streams in Lancashire. His devotions performed, Paslew, attended by a guard, slowly descended the hill, and gazed his last on scenes familiar to him almost from infancy. Noble trees, which now looked like old friends, to whom he was bidding an eternal adieu, stood around him. 
Beneath them, at the end of a glade, couched a herd of deer, which started off at the sight of the intruders, and made him envy their freedom and fleetness, as he followed them in thought to their solitudes. At the foot of a steep rock ran the hodder, making the pleasant music of other days, as it dashed over the pebbly bed, and recalling times when, free from all care, he had strayed by the wood-fringed banks, to listen to the pleasant sound of running waters, and to watch the shining pebbles beneath them, and the swift trout and dainty umber glancing past. A bitter pang was it to part with scenes so fair, and the abbot spoke no word, nor even looked up, until, passing Little Mitten, he came in sight of Whaley Abbey. Then, collecting all his energies, he prepared for the shock he was about to endure. But nerved as he was, his firmness was sorely tried when he beheld the stately pile, once his own, now gone from him and his for ever. He gave one fond glance towards it, and then, painfully averting his gaze, recited in a low voice this supplication. Miserere mei, Deus secundam magnam misericordiam tuam, et secundum multitudinem miserationum tuarum, dele inequitatem meam, amplios lava me ab iniquitate mea, et apicato meo bunda me. But other thoughts and other emotions crowded upon him when he beheld the groups of his old retainers advancing to meet him, men, women, and children pouring forth loud lamentations, prostrating themselves at his feet, and deploring his doom. The abbot's fortitude had a severe trial here, and the tears sprung to his eyes. The devotion of these poor people touched him more sharply than the severity of his adversaries. "'Bless ye, bless ye, my children,' he cried. "'Repine not for me, for I bear my cross with resignation. It is for me to bewail your lot.' much fearing that the flock I have so long and so zealously tended will fall into the hands of other and less heedful pastors, or still worse, of devouring wolves. Bless ye, my children, and be comforted. Think of the end of Abbot Pasteu, and for what he suffered. Think that he was a traitor to the king, and took up arms in a rebellion against him, cried the sheriff, riding up and speaking in a loud voice and that for his heinous offences he was justly condemned to death. Murmurs arose at this speech, but they were instantly checked by the escort. "'Think charitably of me, my children,' said the abbot, "'and the blessed virgin keep you steadfast in your faith. Benedicite. "'Be silent, traitor, I command thee,' cried the sheriff, striking him with his gauntlet in the face. The abbot's pale cheek burnt crimson, and his eye flashed fire, but he controlled himself, and answered meekly, "'Thou didst not speak in such wise, John Bradill, when I saved thee from the flood. "'Which flood thou thyself caused to burst forth by devilish arts?' rejoined the sheriff. "'I owe thee little for the service, if on aught else thou deservest death for thy evil doings on that night.' The abbot made no reply, for Bradill's allusion conjured up a sombre train of thought within his breast, awakening apprehensions which he could neither account for nor shake off. Meanwhile, the cavalcade slowly approached the northeast gateway of the abbey, passing through crowds of kneeling and sorrowing bystanders. But so deeply was the abbot engrossed by the one dread idea that possessed him, that he saw them not, and scarce heard their woeful lamentations. All at once the cavalcade stopped, and the sheriff rode on to the gate, in the opening of which some ceremony was observed. Then it was that Paslew raised his eyes, and beheld standing before him a tall man, with a woman beside him, bearing an infant in her arms. The eyes of the pair were fixed upon him with vindictive exultation. He would have averted his gaze, but an irresistible fascination withheld him. "'Thou seest all is prepared,' said Demdike, coming up close to the mule on which Paslew was mounted, and pointing to the gigantic gallows looming above the abbey walls. "'Wilt thou now accede to my request?' And then he added, significantly, "'On the same terms as before?' 
The abbot understood his meaning well. Life and freedom were offered him by a being whose power to accomplish his promise he did not doubt. The struggle was hard, but he resisted the temptation, and answered firmly, No. Then die the felon death thou meritest, cried Bess fiercely, and I will glut mine eyes with the spectacle. Incensed beyond endurance, the abbot looked sternly at her, and raised his hand in denunciation. The action and the look were so appalling that the affrighted woman would have fled, if her husband had not restrained her. "'By the holy patriarchs and prophets, by the prelates and confessors, by the doctors of the church, by the holy abbots, monks, and eremites, who dwelt in solitudes, in mountains, and in caverns, by the holy martyrs, who suffered torture and death for their faith, I curse thee, witch!' cried Paslew. "'May the malediction of heaven and all its hosts alight on the head of thy infant!' "'O oh, holy abbot!' shrieked Bess, breaking from her husband, and flinging herself at Paslew's feet. "'Curse me, if thou wilt, but spare my innocent child. Save it, and we will save thee!' "'Avoid thee, wretched and impious woman,' rejoined the abbot. "'I have pronounced the dread anathema, and it cannot be recalled. Look at the dripping garments of thy child. In blood it has been baptised, and through blood-stained paths shall its course be taken. Ah! shrieked Bess, noticing for the first time the ensanguined condition of the infant's attire. Cuthbert's blood! Oh! Listen to me, wicked woman, pursued the abbot, as if filled with a prophetic spirit. Thy child's life shall be long, beyond the ordinary term of woman, but it shall be a life of woe and ill. "'Oh, stay him, stay him, or I shall die!' cried Bess. But the wizard could not speak. A greater power than his own apparently overmastered him. "'Children shall she have,' continued the abbot, "'and children's children. But they shall be a race doomed and accursed, a brood of adders that the world shall flee from and crush. A thing accursed and shunned by her fellows shall thy daughters be.' evil reputed and evil doing no hand to help her no lip to bless her life a burden and death long long in coming finding her in a dismal dungeon now depart from me and trouble me no more bess made a motion as if she would go and then turning partly round dropped heavily on the ground demdike caught the child ere she fell thou hast killed her he cried to the abbot. "'A stronger voice than mine hath spoken, if it be so,' rejoined Paslew. "'Fuge miserime, fuge malefice, qui adjudiatus eratus.' At this moment the trumpet again sounded, and the cavalcade being put in motion, the abbot and his fellow captives passed through the gate. Dismounting from their mules within the court, before the chapter-house, the captive ecclesiastics, preceded by the sheriff, were led to the principal chamber of the structure, where the Earl of Derby awaited them, seated in the Gothic carved oak chair, formerly occupied by the abbots of Whaley, on the occasion of conferences or elections. The Earl was surrounded by his officers, and the chamber was filled with armed men. The abbot slowly advanced towards the Earl. His deportment was dignified and firm, ever majestic. The exaltation of spirit, occasioned by the interview with Demdike and his wife, had passed away, and was succeeded by a profound calm. The hue of his cheek was livid, but otherwise he seemed wholly unmoved. The ceremony of delivering up the bodies of the prisoners to the Earl was gone through by the sheriff, and their sentences were then read aloud by a clerk. After this, the Earl, who had hitherto remained covered, took off his cap, and in a solemn voice spoke, "'John Paslew, sometime abbot of Whaley, but now an attainted and condemned felon, and John Eastgate and William Haydock, formerly brethren of the same monastery, and confederates with him in crime, ye have heard your doom. To-morrow you shall die the ignominious death of traitors.' 
but the king in his mercy having regard not so much to the heinous nature of your offences towards his sovereign majesty as to the sacred offices you once held and of which you have been shamefully deprived is graciously pleased to remit that part of your sentence whereby ye are condemned to be quartered alive willing that the hearts which conceived so much malice and violence against him should cease to beat within your own bosoms and that the arms which were raised in rebellion against him should be interred in one common grave with the trunks to which they belong god save the high and puissant king henry the eighth and free him from all traitors cried the clerk we humbly thank his majesty for his clemency said the abbot amid the profound silence that ensued and pray you my good lord when you shall write to the king concerning us to say to his majesty that we died penitent of many and grave offences among the which is chiefly that of having taken up arms unlawfully against him but that we did so solely with the view of freeing his highness from evil counsellors and of re-establishing our holy church for the which we would willingly die if our death might in any ways profit it amen exclaimed father eastgate who stood with his hands crossed upon his breast close behind pastew the abbot hath uttered my sentiments he hath not uttered mine cried father haydock i ask no grace from the bloody herodias and will accept none what i have done i would do again were the past to return nay i would do more i would find a way to reach the tyrant's heart and thus free our church from its worst enemy and the land from a ruthless oppressor remove him said the earl the vile traitor shall be dealt with as he merits for you he added as the order was obeyed and addressing the other prisoners and especially you john pastew who have shown some compunction for your crimes and to prove to you that the king is not the ruthless tyrant he hath been just represented i hereby in his name promise you any boon which you may ask consistently with your situation what favour would you have shown you the abbot reflected for a moment speak thou john eastgate said the earl of derby seeing that the abbot was occupied in thought if i may proffer a request my lord replied the monk it is that our poor distraught brother william haydock be spared the quartering block he meant not what he said mm, well be it as thou wilt replied the earl bending his brows though he ill deserves such grace now john pastview what wouldst thou thus addressed the abbot looked up i would have made the same request as my brother john eastgate if he had not anticipated me my lord said pastview but since his petition is granted i would on my own part entreat that mass be said for us in the convent church many of the brethren are without the abbey and if permitted will assist at its performance i know not if i shall not incur the king's displeasure in assenting replied the earl of derby after a little reflection but i will hazard it mass for the dead shall be said in the church at midnight and all the brethren who choose to come thither shall be permitted to assist at it they will attend i doubt not for it will be the last time the rites of the romish church will be performed in these walls they shall have all required for the ceremonial heaven's blessings on you my lord said the abbot but first pledge me your sacred word said the earl by the holy office you once held and by the saints in whom you trust that this concession shall not be made the means of any attempt at flight i swear it replied the abbot earnestly and also i swear it added father eastgate enough said the earl i will give the necessary orders notice of the celebration of mass at midnight shall be proclaimed without the abbey 
Now remove the prisoners. Upon this the captive ecclesiastics were led forth. Father Eastgate was taken to a strong room in the lower part of the chapter house, where all acts of discipline had been performed by the monks, and where the knotted lash, the spiked girdle, and the hair shirt had once hung, while the abbot was conveyed to his old chamber, which had been prepared for his reception, and there left alone. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, a Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction, The Last Abbot of Whaley. Chapter Five, The Midnight Mass. Dolefully sounds the All Souls' bell from the tower of the convent church. The bell is one of five, and has obtained the name because it is told only for those about to pass away from life. Now it rings the knell of three souls to depart on the morrow. Brightly illumined is the fane, within which no taper hath gleamed since the old worship ceased, showing that preparations are made for the last service. The organ, dumb so long, breathes a low prelude. Sad it is to hear that knell, sad to view those gloriously dyed panes, and to think why the one rings, and the other is lighted up. Word having gone forth of the midnight mass, all the ejected brethren flock to the abbey. Some have toiled through miry and scarce passable roads, Others have come down from the hills and forded deep streams at the hazard of life, rather than go round by the far-off bridge and arrive too late. Others, who conceive themselves in peril from the share they have taken in the late insurrection, quit their secure retreats and expose themselves to capture. It may be a snare laid for them, but they run the risk. Others, Coming from a yet greater distance, beholding the illuminated church from afar, and catching the sound of the bell tolling at intervals, hurry on, and reach the gate breathless and well-nigh exhausted. But no questions are asked. All who present themselves in ecclesiastical habits are permitted to enter, and take part in the procession forming in the cloister, or proceed at once to the church if they prefer it. Dolefully sounds the bell— Barefooted brethren meet together, sorrowfully salute each other, and form in a long line in the great area of the cloisters. At their head are six monks, bearing tall, lighted candles. After them come the choiristers, and then one carrying the host between the incense-bearers. Next comes a youth holding the bell. Next are placed the dignitaries of the church, the prior ranking first, and the others standing two and two according to their degrees. Near the entrance of the refectory, which occupies the whole south side of the quadrangle, stand a band of halberdiers, whose torches cast a ruddy glare on the opposite tower and buttresses of the convent church, revealing the statues not yet plucked from their niches, the crosses on the pinnacles, and the gilt image of St. Gregory de Northbury, still holding its place over the porch. Another band are stationed near the mouth of the vaulted passage, under the chapter-house and vestry, whose grey, irregular walls, pierced by numberless richly ornamented windows, and surmounted by small turrets, form a beautiful boundary on the right, while a third party are planted on the left, in the open space beneath the dormitory, the torchlight flashing ruddily upon the hoary pillars and groined arches, sustaining the vast structure above them. Dolefully sounds the bell, and the ghostly procession thrice tracks the four ambulatories of the cloisters, solemnly chanting a requiem for the dead. Dolefully sounds the bell, and at its summons all the old retainers of the abbot press to the gate, and sue for admittance. But in vain. They therefore mount the neighbouring hill, commanding the abbey, and as the solemn sounds float faintly by, 
and glimpses are caught of the white-robed brethren gliding along the cloisters, and rendered phantom-like by the torchlight, the beholders half imagine it must be a company of sprites, and that the departed monks have been permitted for an hour to assume their old forms and revisit their old haunts. Dolefully sounds the bell, and two beers, covered with palls, are borne slowly towards the church, followed by a tall monk. The clock was on the stroke of twelve. The procession, having drawn up within the court in front of the abbot's lodging, the prisoners were brought forth, and at sight of the abbot the whole of the monks fell on their knees. A touching sight was it to see those reverend men prostrate before their ancient superior, he condemned to die, and they deprived of their monastic home, and the officer had not the heart to interfere. Deeply affected, Paslieu advanced to the prior, and raising him, affectionately embraced him. After this, he addressed some words of comfort to the others, who arose as he enjoined them, and at a signal from the officer, the procession set out for the church, singing the placebo. The abbot and his fellow captives brought up the rear, with a guard on either side of them. All souls' bell tolled dolefully the while. Meanwhile, an officer entered the great hall, where the Earl of Derby was feasting with his retainers, and informed him that the hour appointed for the ceremonial was close at hand. The Earl arose and went to the church, attended by Bradill and Asherton. He entered by the western porch, and proceeding to the choir, seated himself in the magnificently carved stall, formerly used by Paslieu, and placed where it stood a hundred years before by John Eccles, ninth abbot. Midnight struck. The great door of the church swung open, and the organ pealed forth the De Profundis. The aisles were filled with armed men, but a clear space was left for the procession, which presently entered in the same order as before, and moved slowly along the transept. Those who came first thought it a dream, so strange was it, to find themselves once again in the old accustomed church, the good prior, melted into tears. At last the abbot came. To him the whole scene appeared like a vision, the lights streaming from the altar, the incense loading the air, the deep diapasons rolling overhead, the well-known faces of the brethren, the familiar aspect of the sacred edifice. All these filled him with emotions too painful almost for endurance. It was the last time he should visit this holy place, the last time he should hear those solemn sounds, the last time he should behold those familiar objects. Aye, the last. Death could have no pang like this. And with heart well-nigh bursting, and limbs scarcely serving their office, he tottered on. Another trial awaited him, and one for which he was wholly unprepared. As he drew near the chancel, he looked down an opening on the right, which seemed purposely preserved by the guard. Why were those tapers burning in the side chapel? What was within it? He looked again, and beheld two uncovered biers. On one lay the body of a woman. He started. In the beautiful but fierce features of the dead, he beheld the witch, Bess Demdike. She has gone to her account before him. The malediction he had pronounced upon her child had killed her. Appalled, he turned to the other bier, and recognised Cuthbert Ashbead. He shuddered, but comforted himself that he was at least guiltless of his death, though he had a strange feeling that the poor forester had in some way perished for him. But his attention was diverted towards a tall monk in the Cistercian habit, standing between the bodies, with the cowl drawn over his face. As Paslew gazed at him, the monk slowly raised his hood, and partially disclosed features that smote the abbot as if he had beheld a sceptre. Could it be? Could fancy cheat him thus? He looked again. The monk was still standing there but the cowl had dropped over his face. Striving to shake off the horror that possessed him, the abbot staggered forward, and, reaching the presbytery, sank upon his knees. 
The ceremonial then commenced. The solemn requiem was sung by the choir, and three, yet living, heard the hymn for the repose of their souls. Always deeply impressive, the service was unusually so on this sad occasion, and the melodious voices of the singers never sounded so mournfully sweet as then. The demeanour of the prior never seemed so dignified, nor his accents so touching and solemn. The sternest hearts were softened. But the abbot found it impossible to fix his attention on the service. The lights at the altar burned dimly in his eyes. The loud antiphon and the supplicatory prayer fell upon a listless ear. His whole life was passing in review before him. He saw himself as he was when he first professed his faith, and felt the zeal and holy aspirations that filled him then. Years flew by at a glance, and he found himself sub-deacon. The sub-deacon became deacon, and the deacon sub-prior, and the end of his ambition seemed plain before him. But he had a rival. His fears told him a superior in zeal and learning, one who, though many years younger than he, had risen so rapidly in favour with the ecclesiastical authorities that he threatened to outstrip him, even now, when the goal was full in view. This darkest passage of his life approached, a crime which should cast a deep shadow over the whole of his brilliant after-career. He would have shunned its contemplation if he could. In vain it stood out more palpably than all the rest. His rival was no longer in his path. How he was removed the abbot did not dare to think, but he was gone for ever, unless the tall monk were he. Unable to endure this terrible retrospect, Paslew strove to bend his thoughts on other things. The choir was singing the Dies Irae, and their voices thundered forth. Rex tremendi majestatis, qui salam nos nalas gratis, salva ne fons pietatis. Fain would the abbot have closed his ears, and hoping to stifle the remorseful pangs that seized upon his very vitals with the sharpness of serpent's teeth, he strove to dwell on the frequent and severe acts of penance he had performed. But he now found that his penitence had never been sincere and efficacious. This one damning sin obscured all his good actions, and he felt that if he died unconfessed, and with the weight of guilt upon his soul, he should perish everlastingly. Again he fled from the torment of retrospection, and again heard the choir thundering forth, Lacrimoso dies illa, quaris oget extra villa, judicandos homo reos, huic ego pare deos, piece judomine donna reis requiem. Amen, exclaimed the abbot, and bowing his head to the ground, he earnestly repeated, Pie Jesu Domine, Dona es Requiem. Then he looked up, and resolved to ask for a confessor, and unburden his soul without delay. The offertory and post-communion were over. The requiescat in pace, awful words addressed to living ears, were pronounced, and the mass was ended. All prepared to depart. The prior descended from the altar to embrace and take leave of the abbot, and at the same time the Earl of Derby came from the stall. "'Has all been to your satisfaction, John Paslew?' demanded the Earl, as he drew near. "'All, my good lord,' replied the abbot, slowly inclining his head, "'and I pray you think me not importunate if I prefer one other request. I would fain have a confessor visit me.' that I may lay bare my inmost heart to him, and receive absolution. I have already anticipated the request, replied the earl, and have provided a priest for you. He shall attend you within an hour in your own chamber. You will have ample time between this and daybreak to settle your accounts with heaven, should they be ever so weighty. I trust so, my lord, replied Paslew but a whole life is scarcely long enough for repentance, much less a few short hours. 
"'In regard to the confessor,' he continued, filled with misgiving by the Earl's manner, "'I should be glad to be shriven by Father Christopher Smith, late prior of the Abbey.' "'It may not be so,' replied the Earl, sternly and decidedly. "'You will find all you can require in him I shall send.' The abbot sighed, seeing that remonstrance was useless. "'One further question I would address to you, my lord.' he said, and that refers to the place of my interment. Beneath our feet lie buried all my predecessors, abbots of Whaley. Here lies John Eccles, for whom was carved the stall in which your lordship hath sat, and from which I have been dethroned. Here rests the learned John Lindley, fifth abbot, and beside him his immediate predecessor, Robert de Topcliffe, who two hundred and thirty years ago, on the festival of St. Gregory, our canonised abbot, commenced the erection of the sacred edifice above us. At that epoch were here enshrined the remains of the saintly Gregory, and here were also brought the bodies of Haley Aster Workersley and John de Belfield, both prelates of piety and wisdom. You may read the names where you stand, my lord. You may count the graves of all the abbots, they are sixteen in number. There is one grave, yet unoccupied, one stone, yet unfurnished, with an effigy in brass. Well, said the Earl of Derby, when I sat in that stall, my lord, pursued Pastew, pointing to the abbot's chair, when I was head of this church, it was my thought to rest here among my brother abbots. You have forfeited the right replied the earl sternly. All the abbots, whose dust is crumbling beneath us, died in the odour of sanctity, loyal to their sovereigns, and true to their country, whereas you will die an attainted felon and rebel. You can have no place among them. Concern not yourself further in the matter. I will find a fitting grave for you. Perchance at the foot of the gallows. And turning abruptly away, he gave the signal for general departure. Ere the clock in the church tower had told one, the lights were extinguished, and of the priestly train who had recently thronged the fane, all were gone, like a troop of ghosts, evoked at midnight by necromantic skill, and then suddenly dismissed. Deep silence again brooded in the aisles, hushed was the organ, and mute the melodious choir. The only light penetrating the convent church proceeded from the moon, whose rays, shining through the painted windows, fell upon the graves of the old abbots in the presbytery, and on the two biers within the adjoining chapel, whose stark burdens they quickened into fearful semblance of life. End of chapter 5Chapter Six of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, a Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction, The Last Abbot of Whaley. Chapter Six, Tater et Fortis Casa. Left alone and unable to pray, the abbot strove to dissipate his agitation of spirit by walking to and fro within his chamber, and while he was thus occupied he was interrupted by a guard, who told him that the priest sent by the Earl of Derby was without, and immediately afterwards the confessor was ushered in. It was the tall monk who had been standing between the biers, and his features were still shrouded by his cowl. At the sight of him, Paslew sank upon a seat, and buried his face in his hands. The monk offered him no consolation, but waited in silence till he should again look up. At last Paslew took courage and spoke. "'Who and what are you?' he demanded. "'A brother of the same order as yourself,' replied the monk in deep and thrilling accents, but without raising his hood. 
and I am come to hear your confession by command of the Earl of Derby. "'Are you of this abbey?' asked Paslew, tremblingly. "'I was,' replied the monk, in a stern tone. "'But the monastery is dissolved, and all the brethren ejected.' "'Your name?' cried Paslew. "'I am not come here to answer questions, but to hear a confession,' rejoined the monk. "'Bethink you of the awful situation in which you are placed, and that before many hours you must answer for the sins you have committed. You have yet time for repentance, if you delay it not.' "'You are right, father,' replied the abbot. "'Be seated, I pray you, and listen to me, for I have much to tell.' Thirty and one years ago I was prior of this abbey. Up to that period my life had been blameless, or if not wholly fear from fault, I had little wherewith to reproach myself, little to fear from a merciful judge, unless it were that I indulged too strongly the desire of ruling absolutely in the house in which I was then only second. But Satan had laid a snare for me, into which I blindly fell. Among the brethren was one named Borley Salvatum, a young man of rare attainment and singular skill in the occult sciences. He had risen in favour, and at the time I speak of was elected sub-prior. "'Go on,' said the monk. "'It began to be whispered about within the abbey,' pursued Paslew, "'that on the death of William Reed, then abbot, Borley Salvatum would succeed him, and then it was that the bitter feelings of animosity were awakened in my breast against the sub-prior, and after many struggles I resolved upon his destruction. "'A wicked resolution,' cried the monk. "'But proceed.' "'I pondered over the means of accomplishing my purpose,' resumed Paslew, and at last decided upon accusing Alvertum of sorcery and magical practices. The accusation was easy, for the occult studies in which he indulged laid him open to the charge. He occupied a chamber overlooking the calder, and used to break the monastic rules by wandering forth at night upon the hills. When he was absent thus, one night, accompanied by others of the brethren, I visited his chamber— and examined his papers, some of which were covered with mystical figures and cabalistic characters. These papers I seized, and a watch was set to make a prisoner of Alvertum on his return. Before dawn he appeared, and was instantly secured and placed in close confinement. On the next day he was brought before the assembled conclave in the chapter-house, and examined. His defence was unavailing. I charged him with the terrible crime of witchcraft, and he was found guilty. A hollow groan broke from the monk, but he offered no other interruption. He was condemned to die a fearful and lingering death, pursued the abbot, and it devolved upon me to see the sentence carried out. And no pity for the innocent moved you? cried the monk. You had no compunction? "'None,' replied the abbot. "'I rather rejoiced in the successful accomplishment of my scheme. "'The prey was fairly in my toils, and I would give him no chance of escape. "'Not to bring scandal upon the abbey, "'it was decided that Alvertum's punishment should be secret.' "'A wise resolve,' observed the monk. Within the thickness of the dormitory walls is contrived a small, singularly formed dungeon, continued the abbot. It consists of an arched cell, just large enough to hold the body of a captive, and permit him to stretch himself upon a straw pallet. A narrow staircase mounts upward to a grated aperture in one of the buttresses, to admit air and light. Other opening is there none. Tata et fortis casa is this dungeon styled in our monastic rolls, and it is well described, for it is black and strong enough. Food is admitted to the miserable inmate of the cell by means of a revolving stone. 
but no interchange of speech can be held with those without. A large stone is removed from the wall to admit the prisoner, and once immured the masonry is mortised and made solid as before. The wretched captive does not long survive his doom, or it may be that he lives too long, for death must be a release from such a protracted misery. In this dark cell one of the evil-minded brethren who essayed to stab the abbot of Kirkstall in the chapter-house was thrust, and ere a year was over the provisions were untouched, and the man being known to be dead they were stayed. His skeleton was found within the cell when it was opened to admit Borlace Alberton. "'Poor captive!' groaned the monk. "'Ay, poor captive!' echoed Paslew. "'Mine eyes have often striven to pierce these stone walls, and to see him lying there in that narrow chamber, or forcing his way upwards to catch a glimpse of the blue sky above him. When I have seen the swallow settle on the old buttress, or the thin grass growing between the stones waving there, I have thought of him.' "'Go on,' said the monk. "'I scarce can proceed,' rejoined Paslew. "'A little time was allowed Alverton for preparation. "'That very night the fearful sentence was carried out. "'The stone was removed, and a new pallet placed in the cell. "'At midnight the prisoner was brought to the dormitory, "'the brethren chanting a dole for him. "'There he stood amidst them.' his tall form towering above the rest, and his features pale as death. He protested his innocence, but he exhibited no fear, even when he saw the terrible preparations. When all was ready, he was led to the breach. At that awful moment his eye met mine, and I shall never forget the look. I might have saved him if I had spoken, but I would not speak. I turned away, and he was thrust into the breach. A fearful cry then rang in my ears, but it was instantly drowned by the mallets of the masons employed to fasten up the stone. There was a pause for a few moments, broken only by the sobs of the abbot. At length the monk spoke. "'And the prisoner perished in the cell?' he demanded in a hollow voice. "'I thought so till to-night.' "'replied the abbot. "'But if he escaped, it must have been by miracle, "'or by the aid of those powers "'with whom he was charged with holding commerce.' "'He did escape,' thundered the monk, "'throwing back his hood. "'Look up, John Paslew, look up, false abbot, "'and recognise thy victim.' "'Borlace Alberton,' cried the abbot, "'is, is it indeed you?' "'You see, and can you doubt?' replied the other. "'But you shall now hear how I avoided the terrible death to which you procured my condemnation. You shall now learn how I am here to repay the wrong you did me. We have changed places, John Paslew, since the night when I was thrust into the cell, never as you hoped to come forth. You are now the criminal, and I the witness of the punishment.' "'Forgive me, oh, forgive me, Borley Salverton, since you are indeed he,' cried the abbot, falling on his knees. "'Arise, John Paslew,' cried the other sternly. "'Arise, and listen to me. For the damning offences into which I have been led, I hold you responsible. But for you I might have died free from sin. It is fit you should know the amount of my iniquity. Give ear to me, I say.' When first shut within that dungeon, I yielded to the promptings of despair. Cursing you, I threw myself upon the pallet, resolved to taste no food, and hoping death would soon release me. But love of life prevailed. On the second day I took the bread and water allotted me, and ate and drank, after which I scaled the narrow staircase and gazed through the thin barred loophole at the bright blue sky above sometimes catching the shadow of a bird as it flew past. Oh, how I yearned for freedom then! Oh, how I wished to break through the stone walls that held me fast! Oh, what a weight of despair crushed my heart as I crept back to my narrow bed! 
The cell seemed like a grave, and indeed it was little better. Horrible thoughts possessed me. What if I should be wilfully forgotten? What if no food should be given me, and I should be left to perish by the slow pangs of hunger? At this idea I shrieked aloud, but the walls alone returned a dull echo to my cries. I beat my hands against the stones till the blood flowed from them. But no answer was returned, and at last I desisted from sheer exhaustion. Day after day, and night after night, passed in this way. My food regularly came, but I became maddened by solitude, and with terrible imprecations invoked aid from the powers of darkness to set me free. One night, while thus employed, I was startled by a mocking voice which said, All this fury is needless. Thou hast only to wish for me, and I come. It was profoundly dark. I could see nothing but a pair of red orbs, glowing like flaming carbuncles. Now, differently, continued the voice, thou shalt be so. Arise and follow me. At this I felt myself grasped by an iron arm, against which all resistance would have been unavailing, even if I had dared to offer it, and in an instant I was dragged up the narrow steps, the stone wall opened before my unseen conductor, and in another moment we were upon the roof of the dormitory. By the bright star-beams shooting down from above, I discerned a tall shadowy figure standing by my side. Thou art mine, he cried, in accents graven for ever on my memory. But I am a generous master, and will give thee a long term of freedom. Thou shalt be avenged upon thine enemy, deeply avenged. Grant this, and I am thine, I replied, a spirit of infernal vengeance possessing me, and I knelt before the fiend. But thou must tarry for a while, he answered, for thine enemy's time will be long in coming, but it will come. I cannot work him immediate harm, but I will lead him to a height from which he will assuredly fall headlong. Thou must depart from this place, for it is perilous to thee, and if thou stayest here, ill will befall thee. I will send a rat to thy dungeon which shall daily devour the provisions, so that the monks shall not know thou hast fled. In thirty and one years shall the abbot's doom be accomplished. Two years before that time thou mayst return. Then come along to Pendle Hill on a Friday night, and beat the water of the moss pool on the summit, and I will appear to thee and tell thee more. Nine and twenty years, remember. With these words the shadowy figure melted away, and I found myself standing alone on the mossy roof of the dormitory. The cold stars were shining down upon me, and I heard the howl of the watchdogs near the gate. The fair abbey slept in beauty around me, and I gnashed my teeth with rage to think that you had made me an outcast from it, and robbed me of a dignity which might have been mine. I was wroth also that my vengeance should be so long delayed, but I could not remain where I was, so I clambered down the buttress and fled away. Can this be? cried the abbot, who had listened in rapt wonderment to the narration. Two years after your immurement in the cell, the food, having been for some time untouched, the wall was opened, and upon the pallet was found a decayed carcass in mouldering monkish vestments. It was a body taken from the charnel and placed there by the demon, replied the monk. Of my long wanderings in other lands, and beneath brighter skies, I need not tell you. 
but neither absence nor lapse of years cooled my desire of vengeance, and when the appointed time drew nigh, I returned to my own country, and came hither in a lowly garb, under the name of Nicholas Demdike. Ha! exclaimed the abbot. I went to Pendle Hill as directed, pursued the monk, and saw the dark shape there as I beheld it on the dormitory roof. All things were then told me, and I learnt how the late rebellion should rise, and how it should be crushed. I learnt also how my vengeance should be satisfied. Pasdew groaned aloud. A brief pause ensued, and deep emotion marked the accents of the wizard as he proceeded. When I came back, all this part of Lancashire resounded with praise of the beauty of Bess Blackburn, a rustic lass who dwelt in Barrowford. She was called the Flower of Pendle, and inflamed all the youths with love, and all the maidens with jealousy. But she favoured none except Cuthbert Ashbead, forester to the abbot of Whaley. Her mother would fain have given her to the forester in marriage, but Bess would not be disposed of so easily. I saw her and became at once enamoured. I thought my heart was seared, but it was not so. The savage beauty of Bess pleased me more than the most refined charms could have done, and her fierce character harmonised with my own. How I won her matters not, but she cast off all thoughts of Ashbead and clung to me. My wild life suited her, and she roamed the wastes with me, scaled the hills in my company, and shrank not from the weird meetings I attended. Ill repute quickly attended her, and she became branded as a witch. Her aged mother closed her doors upon her, and those who would have gone miles to meet her now avoided her. Bess heeded this little. She was of a nature to repay the world's contumely with like scorn. But when her child was born, the case became different. She wished to save it. Then it was, pursued Demdike vehemently, and regarding the abbot with flashing eyes, then it was that I was again mortally injured by you. Then your ruthless decree to the clergy went forth. My child was denied baptism, and became subject to the fiend. Alas, alas! exclaimed Paslew. "'And as if this were not injury enough,' thundered Demdike, "'you have called down a withering and lasting curse upon its innocent head, "'and though it transfixed its mother's heart. "'If you had complied with that poor girl's request, "'I would have forgiven you your wrong to me, and have saved you.' "'There was a long, fearful silence. "'At last Demdike advanced to the abbot, and seizing his arm, fixed his eyes upon him, as if to search into his soul. "'Answer me, John Paslew,' he cried. "'Answer me, as you shall speedily answer your Maker. Can that malediction be recalled? Dare not to trifle with me, or I will tear forth your black heart and cast it in your face. Can that curse be recalled? Speak!' <laughs> "'It cannot,' replied the abbot half dead with terror. "'Away, then!' thundered Demdike, casting him from him. "'To the gallows! To the gallows!' And he rushed out of the room. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of The Lancashire Witches this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter The Lancashire Witches A Romance of Pendle Forest by William Harrison Ainsworth Introduction The Last Abbot of Whaley Chapter 7 The Abbey Mill For a while the abbot remained shattered and stupefied by this terrible interview. At length he arose, and made his way, he scarce knew how, to the oratory. But it was long before the tumult of his thoughts could be at all allayed, and he had only just regained something like composure, 
when he was disturbed by hearing a slight sound in the adjoining chamber. A mortal chill came over him, for he thought it might be Demdike returned. Presently he distinguished a footstep stealthily approaching him, and almost hoped that the wizard would consummate his vengeance by taking his life. But he was quickly undeceived, for a hand was placed on his shoulder, and a friendly voice whispered in his ear, "'Come along with me, Lord Abbot. Get up, quick, quick!' Thus addressed, the abbot raised his eyes, and beheld a rustic figure standing beside him, divested of his clouted shoes, and armed with a long bare wood-knife. "'Dunna ye know me, Lord Abbot?' cried the person. "'I'm a friend. Alan Abbs a Wiswell. "'Ye mind Wiswell, your own birthplace, Abbot. "'Dunna be feared, I say. "'I'm getting a stay clapped to yon winder, "'and you can be down it here trice, "'and a long covered way by riverside at mill.' "'But the Abbot stirred not. "'Quick, quick!' implored Alan Abbs venturing to pluck the abbot's sleeve. "'Every minute's precious. Dunna be feared. Abel Croft Miller is below. Poor Cuthbert Ashpeed would have been here instead of me if he could have. But that accursed wizard Nick Demdark turned my aunt again him and drove Pikehead intended for himself into poor Cuthbert's side. They clapped me in a dungeon, but Abel managed to get me out. "'and I then swore to do what poor Cuthbert would have done if he'd been living. "'So here I am, Lord Abbot, come to set you free. "'Now you know no all about it. "'You can have no more hesitation. "'Come, time presses, and I'm feared at guard over here in us.' "'I thank you, my good friend, from the bottom of my heart,' replied the Abbot, rising. "'But however strong may be the temptation of life and liberty which you hold out to me,' I cannot yield to it. I have pledged my word to the Earl of Derby to make no attempt to escape. Were the doors thrown open and the guard removed, I should remain where I am. What? exclaimed Hallanabs in a tone of bitter disappointment. You win a go now as prepared. But mess but you shan. I'd ne'er go back to Abel empty handed. "'If you're sworn to stay here, I'm sworn to set you free, and I'll keep my oath. "'Willy-nilly, you shan go with me, Lord Abbot.' "'Forbear to urge me further, my good Hal,' rejoined Paslew. "'I fully appreciate your devotion, and I only regret that you and Abel Croft have exposed yourself to so much peril on my account. "'Poor oh, Cuthbert Ashbead!' When I beheld his body on the bier, I had a sad feeling that he had died on my behalf. Cuthbert meant to rescue your Lord Abbot, replied Hal, and died resisting Nick Demdike's attempt to arrest him. Be your devils, he added, brandishing his knife fiercely. Warlock shall have three inches of cold steel twixt his ribs the first time I come across him. Peace, my son, rejoined the Abbot and forego your bloody design. Leave the wretched man to the chastisement of heaven. And now farewell. All your kindly efforts to induce me to fly are vain. You win a go, cried Hallan Abbs, scratching his head. I cannot, replied the abbot. Come with me to Winder, then, pursued Hal, and tell Abel so. He'll think I'm failed else. Willingly, replied the abbot and with noiseless footsteps he followed the other across the chamber. The window was open, and outside it was reared a ladder. "'Ye mun go down a few steps,' said Hallan Abbs, "'or else he'll na hear ye.' The abbot complied, and partly descended the ladder. "'I see no one,' he said. "'Now it's dark,' replied Hallan Abbs, who was close behind him. "'Eh, but canna be far off. This I hear him go on.' The abbot was now obliged to comply, though he did so with reluctance. Presently he found himself upon the roof of a building, which he knew to be connected with the mill by a covered passage, running along the south bank of the Calder. Scarcely had he set foot there than Hallan Abbs jumped after him, and seizing the ladder, cast it into the stream, thus rendering Paslew's return impossible. "'Now, Lord Abbot,' 
he cried, with a low, exulting laugh. "'You han had broken your word, and I han kept mine. You're free agin your will.' "'You have destroyed me by your mistaken zeal,' cried the abbot, reproachfully. "'Now to the sort, I han saved you from destruction. This way, Lord Abbot, this way!' And taking Paslew's arm, he led him to a low parapet, overlooking the covered passage before described. Half an hour before it had been bright moonlight, but as if to favour the fugitive, the heavens had become overcast, and a thick mist had arisen from the river. "'Abel! Abel!' cried Palanabs, leaning over the parapet. "'Here!' replied a voice below. "'Is all right? Is he with you?' "'Yeah,' replied Hal. "'What an ye done with stay?' cried Abel. "'Never your mind,' returned Hal. "'But help Tabot down.' Paslew thought it vain to resist further, and with the help of Hallonabs and the miller, and further aided by some irregularities in the wall, he was soon safely landed near the entrance of the passage. Abel fell on his knees, and pressed the abbot's hand to his lips. "'Oh, blessed lady, be praised! You're free!' he cried. "'Donna stand talking there, Abel,' interposed Hallonabs, who by this time had reached the ground and who was fearful of some new remonstrance on the abbot's part. "'I'm feared of pursuit.' "'You needn't be feared of that, Hal,' replied the miller. "'The guard are safe enough. One of our chaps has just took em up a big black jack full of stout ale, and I warrant me they winna stay yet a while. When it please you to come with me, Lord Abbot?' With this he marched along the passage, followed by the others, and presently arrived at a door, against which he tapped. A bolt being withdrawn, it was instantly opened to admit the party, after which it was as quickly shut and secured. In answer to a call from the miller, a light appeared at the top of a steep, ladder-like flight of wooden steps, and up these Paslew, at the entreaty of Abel, mounted, and found himself in a large, low chamber, the roof of which was crossed by great beams, covered thickly with cobwebs, whitened by flour, while the floor was strewn with empty sacks and sieves. The person who held the light proved to be the miller's daughter, Dorothy, a blooming lass of eighteen, and at the other end of the chamber, seated on a bench before a turf fire, with an infant on her knees, was the miller's wife. The latter instantly arose on beholding the abbot, and placing the child on a corn-bin, advanced towards him and dropped on her knees, while her daughter imitated her example. The abbot extended his hands over them, and pronounced a solemn benediction. "'Bring your child also to me, that I may bless it,' he said, when he concluded. "'It's no my child, Lord Abbot,' replied the miller's wife, taking up the infant and bringing it to him. "'It were brought to me this very neat by Abel. I wish it were fair enough, I am sure, for it's a deformed little urchin. One of the eyes is lower set than t'other, and right looks up, while left looks down.' And as she spoke she pointed to the infant's face, which was disfigured, as she had stated, by a strange and unnatural disposition of the eyes, one of which was set much lower in the head than the other. Awakened from sleep, the child uttered a feeble cry, and stretched out its tiny arms to Dorothy. "'You ought to pity it for its deformity, poor little creature, rather than to reproach it, mother,' observed the young damsel. "'Marry came out,' cried her mother sharply. "'You'n getting fine feelings with your learning for good feathers, Dolly. "'And I said before I wished the brat were far enough. "'You forget it has no mother,' suggested Dorothy kindly. "'And no matter if it doesn't returned the miller's wife. "'Bess Demdike's no great loss.' "'Is this Bess Demdike's child?' cried Paslew, recoiling. "'Yea,' exclaimed the miller's wife and mistaking the cause of Paslew's emotion, she added triumphantly to her daughter, "'I told ye wench that Lord Abbot would be a my way of thinking. Child has got witch's mark plain upon her. Look, Lord Abbot, look!' But Paslew heeded her not, but murmured to himself, "'Ever in my path go where I will. It is vain to struggle with my fate. I will go back and surrender myself to the Earl of Derby.' "'Nay, nay, ye shall do that,' replied Hal and Nabs, who, with the miller, was close beside him. 
sit down o that stove by the fire and take a cup o' wine to cheer you and then we'll set out to pendle forest where i find you a safe hiding place and to any reward i never ask but service shall be that yon perform a marriage service for me and dolly one of these days and he nudged the damsel's elbow who turned away covering with blushes the abbot moved mechanically to the fire and sat down while the miller's wife surrendering the child with a shrug of the shoulders and a grimace to her daughter went in search of some viands and a flask of wine, which she set before Paslew. The miller then filled a drinking-horn, and presented it to his guest, who was about to raise it to his lips, when a loud knocking was heard at the door below. The knocking continued with increased violence, and voices were heard calling upon the miller to open the door, or it would be broken down. On the first alarm, Abel had flown to a small window, whence he could reconnoitre those below, and he now returned with a face white with terror, to say that a party of arquebusiers with the sheriff at their head were without, and that some of the men were provided with torches. "'They have discovered my evasion, and are come in search of me,' observed the abbot, rising, but without betraying any anxiety. "'Do not concern yourselves further for me, my good friends, but open the door, and deliver me to them.' "'No, no, that we winner cried Hal and Nabs. "'You're no ten yet, Father Abbot, and I know where to baffle him. "'If you would let him down in river, Abel, I'll manage to get him off.' "'Well, thou'rt, Aunt Nab,' cried the miller. "'There's now been my mon seven year for now, thou know'st ways at Pleck.' Oh, "'As well as any rotten about it,' replied Hal and Nabs. "'Go down to the grinding room, and I'll follow here twice.' And as Abel snatched up the light, and hastily descended the steps with Pastew, Hal whispered in Dorothy's ears, "'Take care now no one funds that child, Dolly. If they break in, hide it safely. And when they're gone, take it to church, and place it near Tulsa, where no ill can come to it or thee. Thy life may hung upon it.' And as the poor girl, who as well as her mother was almost frightened out of her wits, promised compliance, he hurried down the steps after the others, muttering, as the clamour without was redoubled, "'Hey, roar on tell ye, horse, ye winna get in yet a while, I promise ye.' Meanwhile the abbot had been led to the chief room of the mill, where all the corn formerly consumed within the monastery had been prepared, and which the size of the chamber itself, together with the vastness of the stones used in the operation of grinding, and connected with the huge water-wheel outside, proved to be by no means inconsiderable. Strong shafts of timber supported the flooring above, and were crossed by other boards placed horizontally, from which various implements in use at the mill depended, giving the chamber, imperfectly lighted as it now was by the lamp borne by Abel, a strange and almost mysterious appearance. Three or four of the miller's men, armed with pikes, had followed their master, and though much alarmed, they vowed to die rather than to give up the abbot. By this time Hallan Abbs had joined the group, and proceeding towards a raised part of the chamber, where the grinding stones were set, he knelt down, and laying hold of a small ring, raised up a trap-door. The fresh air which blew up through the aperture, combined with the rushing sound of water, showed that the calder flowed immediately beneath, and having made some slight preparation, Hal let himself down into this stream. At this moment a loud crash was heard, and one of the miller's men cried out that the arquebusiers had burst open the door. "'Be on, then, lads, and let him down!' cried Hal and Nabs, who had some difficulty in maintaining his footing on the rough, stony bottom of the swift stream. Passively yielding, the abbot suffered the miller and one of the stoutest of his men to assist him through the trap-door, while a third held down the lamp and showed Hal and Nabs up to his middle in the darkling current, and stretching out his arms to receive the burden. The light fell upon the huge black circle of the water-wheel, now stopped, and upon the dripping arches supporting the mill. In another moment the abbot plunged into the water. The trap-door was replaced and bolted underneath by Hal, who, while guiding his companion along and bidding him catch hold of the woodwork of the wheel, heard a heavy trampling of many feet on the boards above, showing that the pursuers had obtained admittance. Encumbered by his heavy vestments, the abbot could with difficulty contend against the strong current, and he momently expected to be swept away, but he had a stout and active assistant by his side, 
who soon placed him under shelter of the wheel. The trampling overhead continued for a few minutes, after which all was quiet, and Hal judged that, finding their search within ineffectual, the enemy would speedily come forth. Nor was he deceived. Shouts were soon heard at the door of the mill, and the glare of torches was cast on the stream. Then it was that Hal dragged his companion into a deep hole, formed by some decay in the masonry behind the wheel, where the water rose nearly to their chins, and where they were completely concealed. Scarcely were they thus ensconced than two or three armed men, holding torches aloft, were seen wading under the archway. But after looking carefully around, and even approaching close to the water-wheel, these persons could detect nothing, and withdrew, muttering curses of rage and disappointment. By and by the lights almost wholly disappeared, and the shouts becoming fainter and more distant, it was evident that the men had gone lower down the river. Upon this Hal thought that they might venture to quit their retreat, and accordingly, grasping the abbot's arm, he proceeded to wade up the stream. Benumbed with cold, and half dead with terror, Paslew needed all his companion's support, for he could do little to help himself, added to which they occasionally encountered some large stone, or stepped into a deep hole, so that it required Hal's utmost exertion and strength to force a way on. At last they were out of the arch, and though both banks seemed unguarded, yet, for fear of surprise, Hal deemed it prudent still to keep to the river. Their course was completely sheltered from observation by the mist that enveloped them, and after proceeding in this way for some distance, Hal stopped to listen, and while debating with himself whether he should now quit the river, he fancied he beheld a black object swimming towards him. Taking it for an otter, with which voracious animal the calder, a stream swarming with trout abounded, and knowing the creature would not meddle with them unless first attacked, he paid little attention to it, but he was soon made sensible of his error. His arm was suddenly seized by a large black hound, whose sharp fangs met in his flesh. Unable to repress a cry of pain, Hal strove to disengage himself from his assistant, and finding it impossible, flung himself into the water in the hope of drowning him. But as the hound still maintained his hold, he searched for his knife to slay him. But he could not find it, and in his distress applied to Paslew. "'Have you any weapon about you, Lord Abbot?' he cried. "'With which I can free myself from this accursed hound!' "'Alas, no, my son,' replied Paslew, "'and I fear no weapon will prevail against it, "'for I recognise in the animal the hound of the wizard Demdike.' "'I thought the devil were in it,' rejoined Hal. "'Believe me to find it out, and do your get bung, "'and make best of your way to Wessel, "'and join you as soon as I can crush this varmint's head against a stone.' "'Ah!' he added joyfully. "'Ah, Pat Twittle, go, go! I'll soon be after you.' Feeling he could sink if he remained where he was, and wholly unable to offer any effectual assistance to his companion, the abbot turned to the left, where a large oak overhung the stream, and he was climbing the bank, aided by the roots of the tree, when a man suddenly came from behind it, seized his hand, and dragged him up forcibly. At the same moment, his captor placed a bugle to his lips, and winding a few notes, he was instantly answered by shouts, and soon afterwards half a dozen armed men ran up, bearing torches. Not a word passed between the fugitive and his captor, but when the men came up and the torchlight fell upon the features of the latter, the abbot's worst fears were realised. It was Demdike. "'False to your king, false to your oath, false to all men!' cried the wizard. "'You seek to escape in vain!' "'I merit all your reproaches,' replied the abbot. "'But it may be some satisfaction to you to learn that I have endured far greater suffering than if I had patiently awaited my doom.' "'I am glad of it,' rejoined Demdike, with a savage laugh. "'But you have destroyed others beside yourself. Where is the fellow in the water? What ho, Uriel!' But as no sound reached him, he snatched a torch from one of the arquebusiers and held it to the river's brink. But he could see neither hound nor man. "'Strange!' he cried. "'He cannot have escaped. "'Uriel is more than a match for any man. "'Secure the prisoner while I examine the stream.' "'With this, 
he ran along the bank with great quickness, holding his torch far above the water, so as to reveal anything floating within it. But nothing met his view until he came within a short distance of the mill, when he beheld a black object struggling in the current, and soon found that it was his dog, making feeble efforts to gain the bank. "'Ah, oh, recreant, thou hast let him go!' cried Demdike furiously. Seeing his master, the animal redoubled his efforts, crept ashore, and fell at his feet with a last effort to lick his hands. Demdike held down the torch, and then perceived that the hound was quite dead. There was a deep gash in its side, and another in the throat, showing how it had perished. "'Poor Uriel!' he exclaimed. "'The only true friend I had, and thou art gone. The villain has killed thee, but he shall pay for it with his life.' and hurrying back he dispatched four of the men in quest of the fugitive, while accompanied by two others he conveyed Paslew back to the abbey, where he was placed in a strong cell, from which there was no possibility of escape, and a guard was set over him. Half an hour after this two of the arquebusiers returned with Hallan Abbs, whom they had succeeded in capturing after a desperate resistance, about a mile from the abbey on the road to Wizzle. He was taken to the guard-room, which had been appointed in one of the lower chambers of the chapter-house, and Demdike was immediately apprised of his arrival. Satisfied by an inspection of the prisoner, whose demeanour was sullen and resolved, Demdike proceeded to the great hall, where the Earl of Derby, who had returned thither after the midnight mass, was still sitting with his retainers. An audience was readily obtained by the wizard, and apparently well pleased with the result, he had returned to the guard-room. The prisoner was seated by himself in one corner of the chamber, with his hands tied behind his back with a leathern thong, and Demdike, approaching him, told him that, for having aided the escape of a condemned rebel and traitor, and violently assaulting the king's lieges in the execution of their duty, he would be hanged on the morrow. The Earl of Derby, who had the power of life or death in such cases, having so decreed it, and he exhibited the warrant. "'So you have not hung me, eh, wizard?' cried Hallanabs, kicking his heels with great apparent indifference. "'I do,' replied Demdike, "'if for nothing else for slaying my hound.' "'I donna think it,' replied Hal. "'You're not your man, demon. I'm ne'er prepared to die just yet.' "'Then perish in your sins?' cried Demdike, I will not give you an hour's respite. "'You'll be sorry when it's too late,' said Hal. "'Tush!' cried Demdike, "'my only regret will be that Uriel's slaughter is paid for by such a worthless life as thine.' And "'Then why take it?' demanded Hal. "'Specially when you'll lose your child by doing so.' "'My child!' exclaimed Demdike, surprised. "'How mean you, sirrah?' "'I mean this,' replied Hal coolly, "'that if I die to-morrow morning, your child dies too. "'When I undertook this job, I calculated my chances "'and took precautions aforehand. "'Your child's a hostage for my safety.' "'Curses on thee and thy cunning!' cried Demdike. "'But I will not be outwitted by a hind like thee.' I will have the child, and yet not be balked of my revenge. You'll know I it except as a breathless corpse about my consent, rejoined Hal. We shall see, cried Demdike, rushing forth, and bidding the guards look well to the prisoner. But ere long he returned with a gloomy and disappointed expression of countenance, and again approaching the prisoner said, Thou hast spoken the truth. The infant is in the hands of some innocent being over whom I have no power. I told thee so, wizard, replied Hal, laughing. And as I be, I'm a match for thee. <laughs> now, mere life against child, wilt thou set me free? Demdike deliberated. Harky, wizard, cried Hal, if you're natching treason, I'm done. "'Certainty of revenge will sweeten my last moments. "'Will you swear to deliver the child to me unharmed if I set you free?' asked Demdike. "'It's a bargain, wizard,' 
replied Hal and Nabs. "'I swear. But yo mun set me free first, for I winna take your word.' Demdike turned away disdainfully, and addressing the arquebusiers, said, "'You behold this warrant, guard. The prisoner is now committed to my custody. I will produce him on the morrow, or account for his absence to the Earl of Derby.' One of the arquebusiers examined the order, and vouching for its correctness, the others signified their assent to the arrangement, upon which Demdike motioned the prisoner to follow him, and quitted the chamber. No interruption was offered to Hal's egress, but he stopped within the courtyard, where Demdike awaited him, and unfastened the leathern thong that bound together his hands. "'Now, go and bring the child to me,' said the wizard. "'No, I dare bring it to ye myself,' rejoined Hal. "'I know'st better than that. "'But at church porch in half an hour, "'and Bantlin shall be delivered to ye safe and sound.' "'And without waiting for a reply, "'he ran off with great swiftness. "'At the appointed time, Demdike sought the church, "'and as he drew near it, "'there issued from the porch a female, who hastily, placing the child, wrapped in a mantle in his arms, tarried for no speech from him, but instantly disappeared. Demdike, however, recognised in her the miller's daughter, Dorothy Croft. End of chapter 7「The Lancashire Witches」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter The Lancashire Witches A Romance of Pendle Forest by William Harrison Ainsworth Introduction The Last Abbot of Whaley Chapter 8 The Executioner Dawn came at last after a long and weary night to many within and without the abbey, everything betokened a dismal day. The atmosphere was damp and oppressive to the spirits, while the raw cold sensibly affected the frame. All the stir were filled with gloom and despondency, and secretly breathed a wish that the tragical business of the day were ended. The vast range of Pendle was obscured by clouds, and their long the vapours descended into the valleys, and rain began to fall, at first slightly, but afterwards in heavy, continuous showers. Melancholy was the aspect of the abbey, and it required no stretch of imagination to fancy that the old structure was deploring the fate of its former ruler. To those impressed with the idea, and many there were who were so, the very stones of the convent church seemed dissolving into tears, the statues of the saints appeared to weep, and the great statue of St. Gregory de Northbury over the porch seemed bowed down with grief. The grotesquely carved heads on the spouts grinned horribly at the abbot's destroyers, and spouted forth cascades of water, as if with the intent of drowning them. So deluging and incessant were the showers, that it seemed indeed as if the abbey would be flooded. All the inequalities of ground within the great quadrangle of the cloisters looked like ponds, and the various water-spouts from the dormitory, the refectory, and the chapter-house, continuing to jet forth streams into the court below, the ambulatories were soon filled ankle-deep, and even the lower apartments on which they opened invaded. Surcharged with moisture, the royal banner on the gate drooped and clung to the staff, as if it too shared in the general depression, or as if the sovereign authority it represented had given way. The countenances and deportment of the men harmonised with the weather. They moved about gloomily and despondently, their bright accoutrements sullied with the wet, and their buskins clogged with mire. A forlorn sight it was to watch the shivering sentinels on the walls, and yet more forlorn to see the groups of the abbot's old retainers, gathering without, wrapped in their blue woollen cloaks, patiently enduring the drenching showers, and awaiting the last awful scene. But the saddest sight of all was on the hill already described, called the Whole Houses. 
Here two other lesser gibbets had been erected during the night, one on either hand of the loftier instrument of justice, and the carpenters were yet employed in finishing their work, having been delayed by the badness of the weather. Half drowned by the torrents that fell upon them, the poor fellows were protected from interference with their disagreeable occupation by half a dozen well-mounted and well-armed troopers, and by as many halberdiers, and this company, completely exposed to the weather, suffered severely from wet and cold. The rain beat against the gallows, ran down its tall naked posts, and collected in pools at its feet. Attracted by some strange instinct, which seemed to give them a knowledge of the object of these terrible preparations, two ravens wheeled screaming around the fatal tree, and at last one of them settled on the cross-beam, and could with difficulty be dislodged by the shouts of the men when it flew away, croaking hoarsely. Up this gentle hill, ordinarily so soft and beautiful, but now abhorrent as a Golgotha, in the eyes of the beholders, groups of rustics and monks had climbed over ground rendered slippery with moisture, and had gathered round the paling encircling the terrible apparatus, looking the images of despair and woe. Even those within the abbey and sheltered from the storm shared the all-pervading despondency. The refectory looked dull and comfortless, and the logs on the hearth hissed and spluttered and would not burn. Green wood had been brought instead of dry fuel by the drowsy henchman. The viands on the board provoked not the appetite, and the men emptied their cups of ale, yawned and stretched their arms, as if they would fain sleep an hour or two longer. The sense of discomfort was heightened by the entrance of those whose term of watch had been relieved, and who cast their dripping cloaks on the floor, while two or three savage dogs, steaming with moisture, stretched their huge lengths before the sullen fire, and disputed all approach to it. Within the great hall were already gathered the retainers of the Earl of Derby, but the nobleman himself had not appeared, having passed the greater part of the night in conference with one person or another, and the abbot's flight having caused him much disquietude, though he did not hear of it till the fugitive was recovered, the earl would not seek his couch until within an hour of daybreak, and his attendants, considering the state of the weather, and that it yet wanted full two hours to the times appointed for the execution, did not think it needful to disturb him. Braddell and Asherton, however, were up and ready, but despite their firmness of nerve, they yielded like the rest to the depressing influence of the weather, and began to have some misgivings as to their own share in the tragedy about to be enacted. The various gentlemen in attendance paced to and fro within the hall, holding but slight converse together, anxiously counting the minutes, for the time appeared to pass on with unwanted slowness, and ever and anon glancing through the diamond panes of the window at the rain pouring down steadily without, and coming back again hopeless of amendment in the weather. If such were the disheartening influence of the day on those who had nothing to apprehend, what must its effect have been on the poor captives? Woeful indeed! The two monks suffered a complete prostration of spirit. All the resolution which Father Haydock had displayed in his interview with the Earl of Derby failed him now, and he yielded to the agonies of despair. Father Eastgate was in little better condition, and gave vent to unavailing lamentations, instead of paying heed to the consolatory discourse of the monk who had been permitted to visit him. The abbot was better sustained. Though greatly enfeebled by the occurrences of the night, yet in proportion as his bodily strength decreased, his mental energies rallied. Since the confession of his secret offence, and the conviction he had obtained that his supposed victim still lived, a weight seemed taken from his breast, and he had no longer any dread of death. Rather, he looked to the speedy termination of existence with hopeful pleasure. He prepared himself, as decently as the means afforded him permitted, for his last appearance before the world, but refused all refreshment except a cup of water, and being left to himself was praying fervently, when a man was admitted into his cell. Thinking it might be the executioner come to summon him, he arose, and to his surprise beheld Hallan Abbs. The countenance of the rustic was pale, but his bearing was determined. "'You hear, my son?' 
cried Paslew. "'I hoped you had escaped.' "'I'm in no danger, Father Abbot,' replied Hal. "'I ain't gotten leave to visit you for a minute only, so I mun be brief. "'Make yourself easy. You shanna die by Tongman's hands.' "'How, my son?' cried Paslew. "'I understand you not.' "'You'n understood me well enough by and by,' replied Hal. "'Dunna be fit when you see me next, and comfort yourself that whatever comes and goes, your death shall be avenged to your worst foe.' Paslew would have sought some further explanation, but Hal stepped quickly backwards, and striking his foot against the door, it was instantly opened by the guard, and he went forth. Not long after this the Earl of Derby entered the great hall, and his first inquiry was as to the safety of the prisoners. When satisfied of this, he looked forth, and shuddered at the dismal state of the weather. While he was addressing some remarks on the subject, and on its interference with the tragical exhibition about to take place, an officer entered the hall, followed by several persons of inferior condition, amongst whom was Hal of Nabs, and marched up to the Earl, while the others remained standing at a respectful distance. "'What news do you bring me, sir?' cried the Earl, noticing the officer's evident uneasiness of manner. "'Nothing has happened to the prisoners. God's death, if it hath, you shall all answer for it with your bodies.' "'Nothing hath happened to them, my lord,' said the officer, but—' "'But what?' interrupted the Earl. "'Out with it, quickly.' "'The executioner from Lancaster and his two aides have fled,' replied the officer. "'Fled!' exclaimed the Earl, stamping his foot with rage. "'Now, as I live, this is a device to delay the execution till some new attempt at rescue can be made. But it shall fail if I string up the abbot myself. Death can no other hangman be found. Of a surety, my lord, but all have an aversion to the office, and hold it opprobrious especially to put churchmen to death,' replied the officer. "'Opprobrious or not, it must be done.' replied the earl. See that fitting persons are provided. At this moment Hal and Abbs stepped forward. "'I'm willing to undertake the job, my lord, and don't tell it we out for your reward,' he said. "'I'll best him a grudge, I suppose, good fellow,' replied the earl, laughing at the rustic's uncouth appearance. <laughs> "'But thou seem'st a stout fellow, and, and one not likely to flinch, and may discharge the office as well as another.' "'If no better man can be found, let him do it,' he added to the officer. "'I humbly thank your lordship,' replied Hal, inwardly rejoicing at the success of his scheme. But his countenance fell when he perceived Demdike advance from behind the others. "'This man is not to be trusted, my lord,' said Demdike, coming forward. "'He has some mischievous design in making the request. So far from bearing enmity to the abbot, it was he who assisted him in his attempt to escape last night. "'What?' exclaimed the Earl. "'Is this a new trick? Bring the fellow forward, that I may examine him.' But Hal was gone. Instantly divining Demdike's purpose, and seeing his chance lost, he mingled with the lookers-on, who covered his retreat. Nor could he be found when sought for by the guard. "'See you provide a substitute quickly, sir,' cried the Earl angrily to the officer. "'It is needless to take further trouble, my lord,' replied Demdike. "'I am come to offer myself as executioner.' "'Thou?' exclaimed the earl. "'Aye,' replied the other. "'When I heard that the men from Lancaster were fled, "'I instantly knew that some scheme to frustrate the ends of justice was on foot, "'and I at once resolved to undertake the office myself, "'rather than delay or risk should occur.' What this man's aim was, who hath just offered himself, I partly guess, but it hath failed, and if your lordship will entrust the matter to me, I will answer that no further impediment shall arise, but that the sentence shall be fully carried out, and the law satisfied. Your lordship can trust me. I know it, replied the earl. Be it as you will. It is now on the stroke of nine. At ten let all be in readiness to set out for Wiswall Hall. The rain may have ceased by that time, but no weather must stay you. Go forth with the new executioner, sir, he added to the officer, and see all necessary preparations made. 
and as Demdike bowed and departed with the officer, the earl sat down with his retainers to break his fast. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, a Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction. The Last Abbot of Whaley. Chapter Nine. Wiswall Hall. Shortly before ten o'clock. A numerous cortege, consisting of a troop of horse in their full equipments, a band of archers with their bows over their shoulders, and a long train of barefoot monks, who had been permitted to attend, set out from the abbey. Behind them came a varlet with a paper mitre on his head, and a leathern crozier in his hand, covered with a surcoat, on which was emblazoned, but torn and reversed, the arms of Paslew, Argent, a fess between three mullets, sable, pierced of the field, a crescent for difference. After him came another varlet, bearing a banner, on which was painted a grotesque figure in a half-military, half-monastic garb, representing the Earl of Poverty, with this distich beneath it, Priest and warrior, rich and poor, he shall be hanged at his own door. Next followed a tumbrel, drawn by two horses, in which sat the abbot alone, the other two prisoners being kept back for the present. Then came Demdike, in a leathern jerkin and a blood-red hose, fitting closely to his sinewy limbs, and wrapped in a hoopland of the same colour as the hose, with a coil of rope round his neck. He walked between two ill-favoured personages, habited in black, whom he had chosen as assistants. A band of halberdiers brought up the rear. The procession moved slowly along, the passing bell tolling each minute, and a muffled drum sounding hollowly at intervals. Shortly before the procession started, the rain ceased, but the air felt damp and chill, and the roads were inundated. Passing out at the northeastern gateway, the gloomy train skirted the south side of the convent church, and went on in the direction of the village of Whaley. When near the east end of the holy edifice, the abbot beheld two coffins borne along, and on inquiry learned that they contained the bodies of Bess Demdike and Cuthbert Ashbead, who were about to be interred in the cemetery. At this moment his eye for the first time encountered that of his implacable foe, and he then discovered that he was to serve as his executioner. At first Paslew felt much trouble at this thought, but the feeling quickly passed away. On reaching Whaley every door was found closed, and every window shut, so that the spectacle was lost upon the inhabitants, and after a brief halt the cavalcade set out for Wiswell Hall. Sprung from an ancient family, residing in the neighbourhood of Whaley, Abbot Paslew was the second son of Francis Paslew of Wiswell Hall, a great gloomy stone mansion situated at the foot of the south-western side of Pendle Hill, where his brother Francis still resided. Of a cold and cautious character, Francis Baslew, second of the name, held aloof from the insurrection, and when his brother was arrested he wholly abandoned him. Still, the owner of Wiswell had not altogether escaped suspicion, and it was probably as much with the view of degrading him as of adding to the abbot's punishment that the latter was taken to the hall on the morning of his execution. Be this as it may, the cortege toiled thither through roads bad in the best of seasons, but now it rained scarcely passable, and it arrived there in about half an hour, and drew up on the broad green lawn. Window and door of the hall were closed, no smoke issued from the heavy pile of chimneys, and to all outward seeming the place was utterly deserted. In answer to inquiries, it appeared that Francis Paslew had departed for Northumberland on the previous day, taking all his household with him. In earlier years, a quarrel having occurred between the haughty abbot and the churlish Francis, the brothers rarely met, whence it chanced that John Paslew had seldom visited the place of his birth of late, though lying so near to the abbey, 
and indeed forming part of its ancient dependencies. It was sad to view it now, and yet the house, gloomy as it was, recalled seasons with which, though they might awaken regret, no guilty associations were connected. Dark was the hall and desolate, but on the fine old trees around it the rooks were settling, and their loud cawings pleased him and excited gentle emotions. For a few moments he grew young again, and forgot why he was there. Fondly surveying the house, the terraced garden in which as a boy he had so often strayed, and the park beyond it where he had chased the deer. His gaze rose to the cloudy heights of Pendle, springing immediately behind the mansion, and up which he had frequently climbed. The floodgates of memory were opened at once, and a whole tide of long-buried feelings rushed upon his heart. From this half-painful, half-pleasurable retrospect, he was aroused by the loud blast of a trumpet, thrice blown. A recapitulation of his offences, together with his sentence, was read by a herald, after which the reverse blazonry was fastened upon the door of the hall, just below a stone escutcheon on which was carved the arms of the family, while the paper mitre was torn and trampled underfoot, the leathern crozier broken in twain, and the scurril banner hacked in pieces. While this degrading act was performed, a man in a miller's white garb, with the hood drawn over his face, forced his way towards the tumbrel, and while the attention of the guard was otherwise engaged, whispered in Paslew's ear, "'I am failed in my schemes, Father Abbot, but rest assured I an avenger. Dem the action I my Sheffield twittle in his heart before he's a day older.' "'The wizard has a charm against steel, my son, and indeed is proof against all weapons forged by men,' replied Paslew, who recognised the voice of Hal and Abs, and hoped by this assertion to divert him from his purpose. Ah, "'Say you so, Father Abbot,' cried Hal. "'Then I'll reach him with somewhat sacred,' and he disappeared. At this moment word was given to return— and in half an hour the cavalcade arrived at the abbey in the same order as it had left it. Though the rain had ceased, heavy clouds still hung overhead, threatening another deluge, and the aspect of the abbey remained as gloomy as ever. The bell continued to toll, drums were beaten, and trumpets sounded from the outer and inner gateway, and from the three quadrangles. The cavalcade drew up in front of the great northern entrance, and its return being announced within, the two other captives were brought forth, each fastened upon a hurdle, harnessed to a stout horse. They looked dead already, so ghastly was the hue of their cheeks. The abbot's turn came next. Another hurdle was brought forward, and Demdike advanced to the tumbrel. But Paslew recoiled from his touch, and sprang to the ground unaided. He was then laid on his back upon the hurdle, and his hands and feet were bound fast with ropes to the twisted timbers. While this painful task was roughly performed by the wizard's two ill-favoured assistants, the crowd of rustics who looked on murmured and exhibited such strong tokens of displeasure that the guard thought it prudent to keep them off with their halberts. But when all was done, Demdike motioned to a man standing behind him to advance, and the person, who was wrapped in a russet cloak, complied, drew forth an infant, and held it in such a way that the abbot could see it. Paslew understood what it meant, but he uttered not a word. Demdike then knelt down beside him, as if ascertaining the security of the cords, and whispered in his ear, "'Recall thy malediction, and my dagger shall save thee from this last indignity.' "'Never,' replied Paslew, "'the curse is irrevocable, but I would not recall it if I could. As I have said—' Thy child shall be a witch, and the mother of witches, but all shall be swept off, all. Hell's torment seize thee, cried the wizard furiously. Nay, thou hast done thy worst to me, rejoined Paslew meekly. Thou canst not harm me beyond the grave. Look to thyself, for even as thou speakest, thy child is taken from thee. And so it was. While Demdike knelt beside Paslew, a hand was put forth, and before the man who had custody of the infant could prevent it, his little charge was snatched from him. This the abbot saw, though the wizard perceived it not. The latter instantly sprang to his feet. "'Where is the child?' he demanded of the fellow in the russet cloak. 
"'It was taken from me by yon tall man who is disappearing through the gateway,' replied the other in great trepidation. "'Ha! He here!' exclaimed Demdike, regarding the dark figure with a look of despair. "'It is gone from me for ever.' "'Aye, for ever!' echoed the abbot solemnly. "'But revenge is still left me. Revenge!' cried Demdike, with an infuriated gesture. "'Then glut thyself with it speedily,' replied the abbot. "'But thy time here is short.' "'I care not if it be,' replied Demdike. "'I shall live long enough if I survive thee.' End of chapter 9Chapter Ten of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, a Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Introduction, The Last Abbot of Whaley. Chapter Ten, The Whole Houses. At this moment the blast of a trumpet resounded from the gateway, and the Earl of Derby, with the sheriff on his right hand and Asherton on the left, and mounted on a richly caparisoned charger, rode forth. He was preceded by four javelin men, and followed by two heralds in their tabards. To doleful tolling of bells, to solemn music, to plaintive hymn chanted by monks, to roll of muffled drum at intervals, the sad cortege set forth. Loud cries from the bystanders marked its departure, and some of them followed it, but many turned away, unable to endure the sight of horror about to ensue. Among those who went on was Hallan Abbs, but he took care to keep out of the way of the guard, though he was little likely to be recognised owing to his disguise. Despite the miserable state of the weather, a great multitude was assembled at the place of execution, and they watched the approaching cavalcade with moody curiosity. To prevent disturbance, arquebusiers were stationed in parties here and there, and a clear course for the cortege was preserved by two lines of halberdiers with crossed pikes. But notwithstanding this, much difficulty was experienced in mounting the hill. Rendered slippery by the wet, and yet more so by the trampling of the crowd, the road was so bad in places that the horses could scarcely drag the hurdles up it, and more than one delay occurred. The stoppages were always denounced by groans, yells, and hootings from the mob, and these neither the menaces of the Earl of Derby nor the active measures of the guard could repress. At length, however, the cavalcade reached its destination. Then the crowd struggled forward and settled into a dense, compact ring round the circular railing enclosing the place of execution, within which were drawn up the Earl of Derby, the Sheriff, Asherton, and the principal gentleman, together with Demdike and his assistants, the guard forming a circle three deep round them. Paslew was first unloosed, and when he stood up he found Father Smith, the late prior, beside him, and tenderly embraced him. "'Be of good courage, Father Abbot,' said the prior, a few moments, and you will be numbered with the just. "'My hope is in the infinite mercy of heaven, father,' replied Pasnew, sighing deeply. "'Pray for me at the last.' "'Doubt it not,' returned the prior fervently. "'I will pray for you now and ever.' Meanwhile the bonds of the two other captives were unfastened, but they were found wholly unable to stand without support. A lofty ladder had been placed against the central scaffold, and up this Demdike, having cast off his hoopland, mounted and adjusted the rope. His tall, gaunt figure, fully displayed in his tight-fitting red garb, made him look like a hideous scarecrow. His appearance was greeted by the mob with a perfect hurricane of indignant outcries and yells. He heeded them not, but calmly pursued his task. Above him wheeled the two ravens, who had never quitted the place since daybreak, uttering their discordant cries. When all was done, he descended a few steps, and taking a black hood from his girdle to place over the head of his victim, called out in a voice which had little human in its tone, "'I wait for you, John Paslew.' 
"'Are you ready, Paslew?' demanded the Earl of Derby. "'I am, my lord,' replied the abbot, and embracing the prior for the last time, he added, "'Vale carissime frata, in eternum vale et dominos tecum, sit in ultionem inimicorum nostrorum.' "'It is the king's pleasure that you say not a word in your justification to the mob, Paslew, observed the earl. "'I had no such intention, my lord,' replied the abbot. "'Then tarry no longer,' said the earl. "'If you need aid, you shall have it.' "'I require none,' replied Paslew resolutely. With this he mounted the ladder, with as much firmness and dignity as if ascending the steps of a tribune. Hitherto nothing but yells and angry outcries had stunned the ears of the lookers-on, and several missiles had been hurled at Demdike, some of which took effect, though without occasioning him discomfiture. But when the abbot appeared above the heads of the guard, the tumult instantly subsided, and profound silence ensued. Not a breath was drawn by the spectators. The ravens alone continued their ominous croaking. Alan Abbs, who stood on the outskirts of the ring, saw thus far, but he could bear it no longer, and rushed down the hill. Just as he reached the level ground, a culverin was fired from the gateway, and the next moment a loud wailing cry, bursting from the mob, told that the abbot was launched into eternity. Hal would not look back, but went slowly on, and presently afterwards other horrid sounds dinned in his ears, telling that all was over with the two other sufferers. Sickened and faint, he leant against a wall for support. How long he continued thus he knew not, but he heard the cavalcade coming down the hill, and saw the Earl of Derby and his attendants ride past. Glancing towards the place of execution, Hal then perceived that the abbot had been cut down, and rousing himself he joined the crowd now rushing towards the gate, and ascertained that the body of Paslew was to be taken to the convent church and deposited there till orders were to be given respecting its interment. He learnt also that the removal of the corpse was entrusted to Demdike. Fired by this intelligence, and suddenly conceiving a wild project of vengeance, founded upon what he had heard from the abbot of the wizard being proof against weapons forged by men, he hurried to the church, entered it, the door being thrown open, and rushing up to the gallery, contrived to get out through a window upon the top of the porch, where he secreted himself behind the great stone statue of St. Gregory. The information he had obtained proved correct. Ere long a mournful train approached the church, and a bier was set down before the porch. A black hood covered the face of the dead, but the vestments showed that it was the body of Paslew. At the head of the bearers was Demdike, and when the body was set down he advanced towards it, and removing the hood, gazed at the livid and distorted features. "'At length I am fully avenged,' he said. "'And Abbot Paslew also!' cried a voice above him. Demdike looked up, but the look was his last, for the ponderous statue of St. Gregory de Northbury, launched from its pedestal, fell upon his head and crushed him to the ground. A mangled and breathless mass was taken from beneath the image, and the hands and visage of Paslew were found spotted with blood dashed from the gory carcass. The author of the wizard's destruction was suspected, but never found, nor was it positively known who had done the deed till years after, when Hallan Abbs, who meanwhile had married pretty Dorothy Croft, and had been blessed by numerous offspring in the Union, made his last confession and then he exhibited no remarkable or becoming penitence for the act, neither was he refused absolution. Thus it came to pass that the abbot and his enemy perished together. The mutilated remains of the wizard were placed in a shell, and hurried away into the grave where his wife had that morning been laid. But no prayer was said over him. And the superstitious believed that the body was carried off that very night by the fiend and taken to a witch's sabbath in the ruined tower on Rimington Moor. Certain it was that the unhallowed grave was disturbed. The body of Pasnew was decently interred in the north aisle of the parish church of Whaley, beneath a stone with a Gothic cross sculptured upon it, and bearing the piteous inscription, 
miserere mei. But in the belief of the vulgar, the abbot did not rest tranquilly. For many years afterwards, a white-robed monastic figure was seen to flit along the cloisters, pass out at the gate, and disappear with a wailing cry over the whole-houses. And the same ghostly figure was often seen to glide through the corridor in the abbot's lodging, and vanish at the door of the chamber leading to the little oratory. Thus Whaley Abbey was supposed to be haunted, and few liked to wander through its deserted cloisters or ruined church after dark. The abbot's tragical end was thus recorded. Johannes Paslew, Capitali Affectus Supplicia, 12th Mensis Martif, 1537. As to the infant, upon whom the abbot's malediction fell, it was reserved for the dark destinies shadowed forth in the dread anathema he had uttered, to the development of which the tragic drama about to follow is devoted, and to which the fate of Abbot Paslew forms a necessary and a fitting prologue. Thus far the veil of the future may be drawn aside. That infant, and her progeny, became the Lancashire Witches. End of chapter 10 and of the introduction Book One, Chapter One of The Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book One, Alison Device. Chapter One, The May Queen. On a May Day in the early part of the seventeenth century, and a most lovely May Day too, admirably adapted to usher in the merriest month of the year, and seemingly made expressly for the occasion, a wake was held at Whaley, to which all the neighbouring country folk resorted, and indeed many of the gentry as well, for in the good old times, when England was still merry England, a wake had attractions for all classes alike, and especially in Lancashire, for with pride I speak it, there were no lads who, in running, vaulting, wrestling, dancing, or in any other manly exercise, could compare with the Lancashire lads. In archery, above all, none could match them, for were not their ancestors the stout bowmen and billmen whose cloth-yard shafts and trenchant weapons won the day at Flodden? And were they not true sons of their fathers? And then I speak it with yet greater pride, there were few, if any, lasses who could compare in comeliness with the rosy-cheeked, dark-haired, bright-eyed lasses of Lancashire. Assemblages of this kind, therefore, where the best specimens of either sex were to be met with, were sure to be well attended, and in spite of an enactment passed in the preceding reign of Elizabeth, prohibiting piping, playing, bear-baiting, and bull-baiting on the Sabbath days, or on any other days, and also superstitious ringing of bells, wakes, and other common feasts, they were not only not interfered with, but rather encouraged by the higher orders. Indeed, it was well known that the reigning monarch, James I, inclined the other way, and desirous of checking the growing spirit of Puritanism throughout the kingdom, had openly expressed himself in favour of honest recreation after evening prayers and upon holidays and furthermore had declared that he liked well the spirit of his good subjects in Lancashire, and would not see them punished for indulging in lawful exercises, but that ere long he would pay them a visit in one of his progresses, and judge for himself, and would grant them still further licence. Meanwhile, this expression of the royal opinion removed every restriction, and old dances with rush-bearings, bell-ringings, wakes, and feasts, were as much practised as before the passing of the obnoxious enactment of Elizabeth. The Puritans and Precisians discountenanced them, it is true, as much as ever, and would have put them down, if they could, as savouring of papistry and idolatry, and some rigid divines thundered against them from the pulpit. But with the King and the authorities in their favour, the people little heeded these denunciations against them, and abstained not from any honest recreation whenever a holiday occurred. If Lancashire were famous for wakes, the wakes of Whaley were famous even in Lancashire. The men of the district were in general a hardy, handsome race, 
of the genuine Saxon breed, and passionately fond of all kinds of pastimes, and the women had their full share of the beauty indigenous to the soil. Besides, it was a secluded spot in the height of a wild mountainous region, and though occasionally visited by travellers journeying northward, or by others coming from the opposite direction, retained a primitive simplicity of manners, and a great partiality for old customs and habits. The natural beauties of the place— contrasted with the dreary region around it, and heightened by the picturesque ruins of the ancient abbey, part of which, namely the old abbot's lodgings, had been converted into a residence by the Ashertons, and was now occupied by Sir Ralph Asherton, while the other was left to the ravages of time, made it always an object of attraction to those residing near it. But when, on the May day in question, there was not only to be a wake, but a maypole set on the green, and a rush bearing with Morris dancers besides, together with wits and ale at the abbey, crowds flocked to Whaley from Wisdall, Coldcoats, and Clitheroe, from Ribchester and Blackburn, from Padiham and Pendle, and even from places more remote. Not only was John Laws of the Dragon full, but the Chequers and the Swan also, and the roadside alehouse to boot. Sir Ralph Asherton had several guests at the abbey, and others were expected in the course of the day, while Dr. Ormerod had friends staying with him at the vicarage. Soon after midnight on the morning of the festival, many young persons of the village, of both sexes, had arisen, and to the sound of horn had repaired to the neighbouring woods, and there gathered a vast stock of green boughs and flowering branches of the sweetly perfumed hawthorn, wild roses and honeysuckle, with baskets of violets, cowslips, primroses, bluebells, and other wild flowers, and returning in the same order they went forth, fashioned the branches into green bowers within the churchyard, or round about the maypole set up on the green, and decorated them afterwards with garlands and crowns of flowers. This morning ceremonial ought to have been performed without wetting the feet, but though some pains were taken in the matter, Few could achieve the difficult task, except those carried over the dewy grass by their lusty swains. On the day before, the rushes had been gathered, and the rush-cart piled, shaped and trimmed, and adorned by those experienced in the task, and it was one requiring both taste and skill, as will be seen when the cart itself shall come forth, while others had borrowed for its adornment, from the abbey and elsewhere, silver tankards, drinking-cups, spoons, ladles, brooches, watches, chains, and bracelets, so as to make an imposing show. Day was ushered in by a merry peal of bells from the tower of the old parish church, and the ringers practised all kinds of joyous changes during the morning, and fired many a clanging volley. The whole village was early astir, and as these were times when good hours were kept, and as early rising is a famous sharpener of the appetite, especially when attended with exercise, so an hour before noon the rustics one and all sat down to dinner, the strangers being entertained by their friends, and if they had no friends, throwing themselves upon the general hospitality. The alehouses were reserved for tippling at a later hour, for it was then customary for both gentlemen and commoner, male as well as female, as will be more fully shown hereafter, to take their meals at home, and repair afterwards to houses of public entertainment for wine or other liquors, Private chambers were, of course, reserved for the gentry, but not unfrequently the squire and his friends would take their bottle with the other guests. Such was the invariable practice in the northern counties in the reign of James I. Soon after midday, and when the bells began to peal merrily again, for even ringers must recruit themselves, at a small cottage in the outskirts of the village, and close to the calder, whose waters swept past the trimly kept garden attached to it, Two young girls were employed in attiring a third, who was to represent Maid Marian, or Queen of the May, in the pageant there about to ensue. And certainly by sovereign and prescriptive right of beauty, no one better deserved the high title and distinction conferred upon her than this fair girl. Lovelier maiden in the whole county, and however high her degree than this rustic damsel, it was impossible to find and though the becoming and fanciful costume in which she was decked could not heighten her natural charms, it certainly displayed them to advantage. Upon her smooth and beautiful brow sat a gilt crown, while her dark and luxuriant hair, covered behind with a scarlet coif, embroidered with gold, and tied with yellow, white, and crimson ribbons, but otherwise wholly unconfined, swept down almost to the ground. 
slight and fragile, her figure was of such just proportion that every movement and gesture had an indescribable charm. The most courtly dame might have envied her fine and taper fingers, and fancied she could improve these by protecting them against the sun, or by rendering them snowy white with paste or cosmetic. But this was questionable. Nothing certainly could improve the small foot and finely turned ankle, so well displayed in the red hose and smart little yellow buskin fringed with gold. A stomacher of scarlet cloth, braided with yellow lace in crossbars, confined her slender waist. Her robe was of carnation-coloured silk, with wide sleeves, and the gold-fringed skirt descended only a little below the knee, like the dress of a modern Swiss peasant, so as to reveal the exquisite symmetry of her limbs. Over all she wore a surcoat of azure silk, lined with white and edged with gold. In her left hand she held a red pink as an emblem of the season. So enchanting was her appearance altogether, so fresh the character of her beauty, so bright the bloom that dyed her lovely cheeks, that she might have been taken for a personification of May herself. She was indeed in the very May of life, the mingling of spring and summer in womanhood, and the tender blue eyes, bright and clear as diamonds of purest water, the soft regular features, and the merry mouth, whose ruddy parted lips ever and anon displayed two rows of pearls, completed the similitude to the attributes of the jocund month. Her handmaidens, both of whom were simple girls, and though not destitute of some pretensions to beauty themselves, in no wise to be compared with her, were at the moment employed in knotting the ribbons in her hair, and adjusting the azure surcoat. Attentively watching these proceedings, sat on a stool, placed in a corner, a little girl, some nine or ten years old, with a basket of flowers on her knee. The child was very diminutive, even for her age, and her smallness was increased by personal deformity, occasioned by contraction of the chest and spinal curvature, which raised her back above her shoulders. But her features were sharp and cunning, almost malignant, and there was a singular and unpleasant look about the eyes, which were not placed evenly in the head. Altogether she had a strange old-fashioned look, and from her habitual bitterness of speech, as well as from her vindictive character, which, young as she was, had been displayed with some effect on more than one occasion, she was no great favourite with any one. It was curious now to watch the eager and envious interest she took in the progress of her sister's adornment, for such was the degree of relationship in which she stood to the May Queen, and when the surcoat was finally adjusted, and the last ribbon tied, she broke forth, having hitherto preserved a sullen silence. "'Well, Sister Alison, you may a frankly May Queen, I mun say,' she observed spitefully. "'But to my mind, neither Sulky Worsley or Nancy Orphia would have looked prettier.' Eh, no, that we shouldn't have,' rejoined one of the damsels referred to. "'There's no lass in Lancashire to hold a condle near Alison Device.' "'Fie upon you for an ill-favoured minx, Janet,' cried Nancy Holt. "'You're jealous of your pretty sister.' "'Ah, jealous!' cried Janet, reddening. "'Why the fillip should I be jealous, eh, you saucy jade? "'When I grow old, I'll make a prettier May Queen than any of you, "'and so the lads are tell me.' "'And so you will, Janet,' said Alison Device, "'checking by a gentle look the jeering laugh "'in which Nancy had seemed disposed to indulge.' "'So you will, my pretty little sister,' she added, kissing her, "'and I will tie you as well and as carefully as Susan and Nancy have just attired me.' Eh, "'Mayhap I shanna live till then,' rejoined Janet peevishly, "'and when I'm dead and gone and laid into the cold churchyard, "'you and they will be sorry for having wedded me so.' "'I have never intentionally vexed you, Janet, love,' said Alison, "'and I'm sure these two girls love you dearly.' "'Aye, we make allowances for our few tempers,' observed Susan Worsley, "'for we know that ailments and deformities are sure to make folk fretful.' "'Ah, there it is!' cried Janet sharply. "'My high shoulders and my small sails are always thrown in my face, "'but I grow tall in time and get straight, "'ah, straighter than you, Suki, with your broad back and short neck. "'But if I don't know what matters it, I shall be feared at any rate.' "'Ah, feared winches by you both!' Oh, "'No doubt on it, though, little good-for-nothing piece of mischief,' muttered Susan. "'What's that you say, Suki?' cried Janet, whose quick ears had caught the words. 
take care what you do to offend me, lass, she added, shaking her thin fingers, armed with talon-like claws threateningly at her, or I'll ask my grandam Mother Demdike to quieten you. At the mention of this name a sudden shade came over Susan's countenance. Changing colour and slightly trembling, she turned away from the child, who, noticing the effect of her threat, could not repress her triumph. But again Alison interposed. "'Do not be alarmed, Susan,' she said. "'My grandmother will never harm you, I am sure. Indeed, she will never harm any one. And do not heed what little Janet says, for she is not aware of the effect of her own words, or of the injury they might do to our grandmother if repeated.' "'I don't know, wish to repeat them, or to think of them,' <laughs> sobbed Susan. "'That's good, that's kind of you, Susan,' replied Alison, taking her hand. "'Do not be cross any more, Janet. You see, you have made her weep.' "'I'm glad on it,' rejoined the little girl, laughing. "'Let her cry on. It'll do her good, and teach her to mend her manners, and nay offend me again.' "'I didn't mean to offend you, Janet.' sobbed Susan. "'But you're so riding and marred, a body cannot speak to please you.' "'Well, if you confess your fault, I'm satisfied,' said the little girl. "'But let it be a lesson to you, Suki, to keep guard of your tongue if you do.' shall, I, I promise you,' replied Susan, drying her eyes. At this moment a door opened, and a woman entered from an inner room, having a high-crowned, conical-shaped hat on her head, and broad white pinners over her cheeks. Her dress was of dark red camlet, with high-heeled shoes. She stooped slightly, and, being rather lame, supported herself on a crutch-handled stick. In age she might be between forty and fifty, but she looked much older, and her features were not at all prepossessing, from a hooked nose and chin, while their sinister effect was increased by a formation of the eyes similar to that in Janet, only more strongly noticeable in her case. This woman was Elizabeth Device widow of John Device, about whose death there was a mystery to be inquired into hereafter, and mother of Alison and Janet, though how she came to have a daughter so unlike herself in all respects as the former, no one could conceive. But so it was. "'So you are done your finery at last, Alison,' said Elizabeth. "'Your brother Jem has just run up to say that Rushcart has set out, and that Robin Hood and his merry men are coming for their queen, and their queen is quite ready for them.' "'replied Alison, moving towards the door. "'Nay, let's have a look at you first, wench,' cried Elizabeth, staying her. "'Fine fiddlers may fine birds. "'I warrant me now you're getting these made you goes on. "'You fancy yourself a queen in earnest. "'A queen of a day, mother, a queen of a little village festival. "'Nothing more,' replied Alison. "'Oh, if I were a queen in right earnest, or even a great lady, "'what would you do?' demanded Elizabeth Device sourly. "'I'd make you rich, mother, and build you a grand house to live in, much grander than Brown's home, or Downham, or Middleton.' Uh, "'Pity you ne'er a queen, then, Alison,' replied Elizabeth, relaxing her harsh features into a wintry smile. "'What would you do for me, Alison, if you were a queen?' asked little Janet, looking up at her. "'Why, let me see. I'd indulge every one of your whims and wishes.' "'You should only need ask to have.' Oh, oh, "'You'd never content her,' observed Elizabeth testily. "'It's no your way to try and content me, mother, even when you might,' rejoined Janet, who, if she loved few people, loved her mother least of all, and never lost an opportunity of testifying her dislike to her. "'Oh, a ponty little wasp!' cried her mother. "'Thou deserve nought but what thou dost not get often enough, a good whipping.' "'You ye hadn't told us what you'd do for yourself if you were a great lady, Alison,' interposed Susan. "'Oh, I hadn't thought about myself,' replied the other, laughing. "'I can tell you what she'd do, Suki,' replied little Janet, knowingly. "'She'd marry Master Richard Asherton of Middleton.' "'Janet!' exclaimed Alison, blushing crimson. "'It's true,' replied the little girl. "'You know you would, Alison. Look at her face!' she added, with a screaming laugh. "'Hold your tongue, little plague!' cried Elizabeth, rapping her knuckles with her stick. "'And behave thyself, or thou shanna go out to wake!' Janet dealt her mother a bitterly vindictive look, but she neither uttered cry nor made remark. In the momentary silence that ensued, the blithe jingling of bells was heard, 
accompanied by the merry sound of tabor and pipe. "'Ah, oh, here come the rush-cart and the Morris dancers!' cried Alison, rushing joyously to the window, which, being left partly opened, admitted the scent of the woodbine and eglantine, by which it was overgrown, as well as the humming sound of the bees by which the flowers were invaded. Almost immediately afterwards a frolic troop, like a band of maskers, approached the cottage, and drawing up before it, while the jingling of bells ceasing at the same moment, told that the rush-cart had stopped likewise. Chief among the party was Robin Hood, clad in a suit of Lincoln green, with a sheaf of arrows at his back, a bugle dangling from his baldric, a bow in his hand, and a broad-leaved green hat on his head, looped up on one side, and decorated with a heron's feather. The hero of Sherwood was personated by a tall, well-limbed fellow, to whom, being really a forester of Boland, the character was natural. Beside him stood a very different figure, a jovial friar, with shaven crown, rubicund cheeks, bull-throat, and a mighty paunch, covered by a russet habit, and girded in by a red cord, decorated with golden twist and tassel. He wore red hose and sandal shoes, and carried in his girdle a wallet, to contain a roast capon, a neat's tongue, or any other dainty given him. Friar Tuck, for such he was, found his representative in Ned Huddleston, porter at the abbey, who, as the largest and stoutest man in the village, was chosen on that account to the part. Next to him came a character of no little importance, and upon whom much of the mirth of the pageant depended, and this devolved upon the village cobbler, Jack Roby, a dapper little fellow, who fitted the part of the fool to a nicety. With bauble in hand, and blue coxcomb hood adorned with long white ass's ears upon his head, with jerkin of green, striped with yellow, hose of different colours, the left leg being yellow with a red pantoufle, and the right blue terminated with the yellow shoe, with bells hung upon various parts of his motley attire, so that he could not move without producing a jingling sound, Jack Roby looked wonderful indeed, and was constantly dancing about and dealing a blow with his bauble. Next came Will Scarlet, Stukely, and Little John, all proper men and tall, attired in Lincoln green like Robin Hood, and similarly equipped. Like him, too, they were all foresters of Bowland, owing service to the bow-bearer, Mr. Parker of Browsholme Hall, and the representative of Little John, who was six feet and a half high and stout in proportion, was Lawrence Blackrod, Mr. Parker's head-keeper. After the foresters came Tom the Piper, a wandering minstrel, habited for the occasion in a blue doublet, with sleeves of the same colour turned up with yellow, red hose and brown buskins, red bonnet and green surcoat lined with yellow. Beside the piper was another minstrel, similarly attired, and provided with a tabor. Lastly came one of the main features of the pageant, and which, together with the fool, contributed most materially to the amusement of the spectators. This was the hobby-horse, the hue of this spirited charger was a pinkish-white, and his housings were of crimson cloth hanging to the ground, so as to conceal the rider's real legs, though a pair of sham ones dangled at the side. His bit was of gold, and his bridle red morocco leather, while his rider was sumptuously arrayed in a purple mantle bordered with gold, with a rich cap of the same regal hue on his head, encircled with gold, and having a red feather stuck in it. The hobby-horse had a plume of nodding feathers on his head, and careered from side to side, now rearing in front, now kicking behind, now prancing, now gently ambling, and, in short, indulging in playful fancies and vagaries, such as horse never indulged in before, to the imminent danger, it seemed, of his rider, and to the huge delight of the beholders. Nor must it be admitted, as it was a matter of great wonderment to the lookers-on, that by some legerdemain contrivance the rider of the hobby-horse had a couple of daggers stuck in his cheeks, while from his steed's bridle hung a silver ladle, which he held now and then to the crowd, and in which, when he did so, a few coins were sure to rattle. After the hobby-horse came the maypole, not the tall pole, so called, and which was already planted in the green, but a stout staff, elevated some six feet above the head of the bearer, with a coronal of flowers atop, and four long garlands hanging down, each held by a Morris dancer. Then came the May Queen's gentleman usher, a fantastic personage in habiliments of blue guarded with white, and holding a long willow wand in his hand. 
After the usher came the main troop of Morris dancers, the men attired in a graceful costume, which set off their light active figures to advantage, consisting of a slashed jerkin of black and white velvet, with cut sleeves left open so as to reveal the snowy shirt beneath, white hose, and shoes of black Spanish leather with large roses. Ribbons were everywhere in their dresses, ribbons and tinsel adorned their caps, ribbons crossed their hose, and ribbons were tied round their arms. In either hand they held a long white handkerchief knotted with ribbons. The female Morris dancers were habited in white, decorated like the dresses of the men. They had ribbons and wreaths of flowers round their heads, bows in their hair, and in their hands long white knotted kerchiefs. In the rear of the performers in the pageant came the rush-cart, drawn by a team of eight stout horses, with their manes and tails tied with ribbons, their collars fringed with red and yellow worsted, and hung with bells, which jingled blithely at every movement, and their heads decked with flowers. The cart itself consisted of an enormous pile of rushes, banded and twisted together, rising to a considerable height, and terminated in a sharp ridge, like the point of a Gothic window. The sides and top were decorated with flowers and ribbons, and there were eaves in front and at the back, and on the space within them, which was covered with white paper, were strings of gaudy flowers embedded in moss, amongst which were suspended all the ornaments and finery that could be collected for the occasion, to wit flagons of silver, swoons, ladles, chains, watches, and bracelets, so as to make a brave and resplendent show. The wonder was how articles of so much value would be trusted forth on such an occasion, but nothing was ever lost. On the top of the rush-cart, and bestriding its sharp ridges, sat half a dozen men, habited somewhat like the Morris dancers, in garments bedecked with tinsel and ribbons, holding garlands formed by hoops decorated with flowers, and attached to poles ornamented with silver paper, cut into various figures and devices and diminishing gradually in size as they rose to a point, where they were crowned with wreaths of daffodils. A large crowd of rustics of all ages accompanied the Morris dancers and rush-cart. This gay troop, having come to a halt as described before the cottage, the gentleman usher entered it, and tapping against the inner door with his wand, took off his cap as soon as it was opened, and bowing deferentially to the ground, said he was come to invite the Queen of May to join the pageant, and that it only awaited her presence to proceed to the green. Having delivered this speech in as good set phrase as he could command, and being the parish clerk and schoolmaster to boot, Samson Harrop by name, he was somewhat more polished than the rest of the hinds, and having moreover received a gracious response from the May Queen, who condescendingly replied that she was quite ready to accompany him, he took her hand, and led her ceremoniously to the door, whither they were followed by the others. Loud was the shout that greeted Alison's appearance, and tremendous was the pushing to obtain a sight of her, and so much was she abashed by the enthusiastic greeting, which was wholly unexpected on her part, that she would have drawn back again if it had been possible. But the usher led her forward, and Robin Hood and the foresters, having bent the knee before her, the hobby-horse began to covet anew among the spectators, and tread on their toes, the fool to wrap their knuckles with his bauble, the piper to play, the taborer to beat his tambourine, and the morris dancers to toss their kerchiefs over their heads. Thus, the pageant being put in motion, the rush-cart began to roll on, its horses' bells jingling merrily, and the spectators cheering lustily. End of chapter 1book 1 chapter 2 of the lancashire witches this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by andy minter the lancashire witches a romance of pendle forest by william harrison ainsworth book 1 alison device chapter 2 the black cat and the white dove Little Jennet watched her sister's triumphant departure with a look in which there was far more of envy than sympathy, and when her mother took her hand to lead her forth she would not go, 
but, saying she did not care for any such idle sights, went sullenly back to the inner room. When there, however, she could not help peeping through the window, and saw Susan and Nancy join the revel rout, with feelings of increased bitterness. "'I wish it would rain and spile their finery,' she said, sitting down on her stool, and plucking the flowers from her basket in pieces. "'And yet, why can't I enjoy such seats like other folk? The truth is, I've no heart for it.' "'Folks say,' she continued, after a pause, "'that Grandmother Demdike is a witch, and can do as she pleases. I wonder if she made Alison so pretty.' "'No, that canna be, for Alison's no favourite of hern. "'If she loves any one, it's me. "'Why don't she make me good-looking, then? "'They say it's sinful to be a witch. "'If so, how come Grandmother Demdike to be one? "'But well, I'm observed that folks as calls her witch are afeard on her, "'so it may be pure spite on their part.' "'As she thus mused, a great black cat belonging to her mother, which had followed her into the room, rubbed himself against her, putting up his back and purring loudly. "'Ah, Tib,' said the little girl, "'how are you, Tib? I didn't know you were here. Let me ask you some questions, Tib.' The cat mewed, looked up, and fixed his great yellow eyes upon her. "'One would think you understand what was said to you, Tib,' pursued little Janet. "'We'll see what you say to this. "'Shall I ever be Queen of May like Sister Alison?' "'The cat mewed in a manner that the little girl "'found no difficulty interpreting the reply into no.' "'How's that, Tib?' cried Janet sharply. "'If I thought you meant it, I'd beat you, Sarah. "'Answer me another question, you saucy knave. "'Who will be luckiest, Alison or May?' "'This time the cat darted away from her, and made two or three skirmishes round the room, as if gone suddenly mad. <laughs> "'I can't make now to that,' observed Janet, laughing. All at once the cat bounded upon the chimney-board, over which was placed a sampler, worked with the name Alison. "'Why, Tib really seems to understand me, I declare,' observed Janet uneasily. "'I should like to ask him a few more questions, if I durst,' she added regarding with some distrust the animal, who had now returned and begun rubbing himself against her as before. "'Tib! Tib!' The cat looked up and mewed. "'Pretty Tib! Sweet Tib!' continued the little girl, coaxingly. "'What mun one do to be a witch like Grandmother Demdike?' The cat again dashed twice or thrice madly round the room, and then, stopping suddenly at the hearth, sprang up the chimney. "'I'm frightened you away at any rate,' observed Janet, laughing. "'And yet it may mean summat, she added, reflecting a little. "'For I neared say as our witches fly up chimneys on broomsticks to attend to their sabbaths. "'I should like to fly in that manner, and change myself into another shape, any shape but my own. "'Oh, that I could be as pretty as Alison! "'I don't know what I'd need do to be like her.' Again the great black cat was beside her, rubbing against her and purring. The child was a good deal startled, for she had not seen him return, and the door was shut, though he might have come in through the open window, only she had been looking that way all the time, and had never noticed him. Strange. "'Tib,' said the child, patting him, "'thou has now answered my last question. I always want to become a witch.' As she made this inquiry, the cat suddenly scratched her in the arm, so that the blood came. The little girl was a good deal frightened as well as hurt, and withdrawing her arm quickly made a motion of striking the animal. But starting backwards, erecting his tail and spitting, the cat assumed such a formidable appearance that she did not dare to touch him. And then she perceived that some drops of blood stained her white sleeve, giving the spots a certain resemblance to the letters J and D her own initials. At this moment, when she was about to scream for help, though she knew no one was in the house, all having gone away with the Mayday revellers, a small white dove flew in at the open window, and skimming round the room alighted near her. 
No sooner had the cat caught sight of this beautiful bird, that instead of preparing to pounce upon it, as might have been expected, he instantly abandoned his fierce attitude, and, uttering a sort of howl, sprang up the chimney as before. But the child scarcely observed this, her attention being directed towards the bird, whose extreme beauty delighted her. It seemed quite tame, too, and allowed itself to be touched, and even drawn towards her, without an effort to escape. Never surely was seen so beautiful a bird, with such milk-white feathers, such red legs, and such pretty yellow eyes, with crimson circles round them, so thought the little girl, as she gazed upon it, and pressed it to her bosom. In doing this, gentle and good thoughts came upon her, and she reflected what a nice present this pretty bird would make to her sister Alison on her return from the merry-making, and how pleased she should feel to give it to her and then she thought of Alison's constant kindness to her, and half reproached herself with the poor return she made for it, wondering she could entertain any feelings of envy towards one so good and amiable, all this while the dove nestled in her bosom. While thus pondering, the little girl felt an unaccountable drowsiness steal over her, and presently afterwards dropped asleep, when she had a very strange dream. It seemed to her that there was a contest going on between two spirits, a good one and a bad, the bad one being represented by the great black cat, and the good spirit by the white dove. What they were striving about she could not exactly tell, but she felt that the conflict had some relation to herself. The dove at first appeared to have but a poor chance against the claws of its sable adversary, but the sharp talons of the latter made no impression upon the white plumage of the bird which now shone like silver armour, and in the end the cat fled, yelling as it darted off, Thou art victorious now, but her soul shall yet be mine. Something awakened the little sleeper at the same moment, and she felt very much terrified at her dream, as she could not help thinking her own soul might be the one in jeopardy, and her first impulse was to see whether the white dove was safe. Yes, there it was, still nestling in her bosom, with its head under its wing. Just then she was startled at hearing her own name pronounced by a hoarse voice, and looking up she beheld a tall young man standing at the window. He had a somewhat gypsy look, having a dark olive complexion and fine black eyes, though set strangely in his head, like those of Janet and her mother, coal black hair, and the very prominent features of a sullen and almost savage cast. His figure was gaunt but very muscular, his arms being extremely long, and his hands unusually large and bony, personal advantages which made him a formidable antagonist in any rustic encounter, and in such he was frequently engaged, being of a very irascible temper and turbulent disposition. He was clad in a holiday suit of dark green serge, which fitted him well, and carried a nosegay in one hand and a stout blackthorn cudgel in the other. This young man was James Device, son of Elizabeth, and some four or five years older than Alison. He did not live with his mother in Whaley, but in Pendle Forest, near his old relative, Mother Demdike, and had come over that morning to attend the wake. "'What you about, Janet?' inquired James Device, in tones naturally hoarse and deep, and which he took as little pains to soften as he did to polish his manners, which were more than ordinarily rude and churlish. "'What you about, eh, say, wench?' he repeated. "'Why don't you go to the green to see Morris dancers foot it round Maypole? Come along with me.' "'I don't want to go, Jim,' replied the little girl. "'But you shan't go, I tell ye,' returned her brother. "'You shan't see your sister dance. You can sit her home any day. But May Day comes only once a year, and Alison will be queen twice in her life. So come along with me directly, or I'll make you.' "'I should like to see Alison dance, and so I wouldn't go with you, Jem,' replied Janet, getting up. "'Otherwise your orders shouldn't have made me stir, I can tell you.' As she came out, she found her brother whistling the blithe air of green sleeves, cutting strange capers in imitation of the Morris dancers, and whirling his cudgel over his head instead of a kerchief. The gaiety of the day seemed infectious, and to have seized even him. People stared to see Black Jem, or Surly Jem, as he was indifferently called, so joyous, and wondered what it should mean. He then fell to singing a snatch of a local ballad at that time in vogue in the neighbourhood. 
if thou wilt now my secret tell the brute aboard he wayly parish and swear to keep my counsel well i will declare my day a marriage go along lass he cried stopping suddenly in his song and snatching his sister's hand what have you gotten there lapped up in your kirtle eh a white dove replied jennet determined not to tell him anything about her strange dream a white dove echoed jem give it me and i'll wring its neck and get it roasted for supper you shouldn't do no such thing jem replied jennet i mean to give it to alison well well that's right rejoined jem blandly he'll make a pretty offering let's look at it no no said jennet pressing the bird gently to her bosom no one shall see it afore alison come along then cried jem rather testily and mending his pace always be too late for round why unscratch yourself he added noticing the red spots on her sleeve anna she rejoined evasively oh now i recollect it was tib did it tib echoed jem gravely and glancing uneasily at the marks meanwhile on quitting the cottage the may-day revellers had proceeded slowly towards the green increasing the number of their followers at each little tenement they passed and being welcomed everywhere with shouts and cheers the hobby-horse curveted and capered the fool fleered at the girls and flouted the men jesting with every one and when failing in a point rapping the knuckles of his auditors friar tuck chucked the pretty girls under the chin in defiance of their sweethearts and stole a kiss from every buxom dame that stood in his way and then snapped his fingers or made a broad grimace at the husband the piper played and the taborer rattled his tambourine the morris dancers tossed their kerchiefs aloft and the bells of the rush cart jingled merrily the men on the top being on a level with the roofs of the cottages and the summits of the haystacks they passed but in spite of their exalted position jostling with the crowd below but in spite of these multiplied attractions and in spite of the gambols of the fool and horse though the latter elicited prodigious laughter the main attention was fixed on the may queen who tripped lightly along by the side of her faithful squire robin hood followed by the three bold foresters of sherwood and her usher in this way they reached the green where already a large crowd was collected to see them and where in the midst of it and above the heads of the assemblage rose the lofty maypole with all its flowery garlands glittering in the sunshine and its ribbons fluttering in the breeze pleasant was it to see those cheerful groups composed of happy rustics youths in their holiday attire and maidens neatly habited too and fresh and bright as the day itself summer sunshine sparkled in their eyes and weather and circumstance as well as genial nature disposed them to enjoyment every lass above eighteen had her sweetheart and old couples nodded and smiled at each other when any tender speech broadly conveyed but tenderly conceived reached their ears and said it recalled the days of their youth pleasant was it to hear such honest laughter and such good homely jests laugh on my merry lads you are made of good old english stuff loyal to church and king and while you and such as you last our land will be in no danger from foreign foe laugh on and praise your sweethearts how you will laugh on and blessings on your honest hearts the frolic train had just reached the precincts of the green when the usher waving his hand aloft called a momentary halt announcing that sir ralph assheton and the gentry were coming forth from the abbey gate to meet them End of chapter 2book 1 chapter 3 of the lancashire witches this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by andy minter the lancashire witches a romance of pendle forest by william harrison ainsworth Book One, Alison Device, Chapter Three, The Ashertons. Between Sir Ralph Asherton of the Abbey and the inhabitants of Whaley, many of whom were his tenants, he being joint lord of the manor with John Bradill of Portfield, 
the best possible feeling subsisted, for though somewhat austere in manner, and tinctured with Puritanism, the worthy knight was sufficiently shrewd, or more correctly speaking, sufficiently liberal-minded, to be tolerant of the opinions of others, and being moreover sincere in his own religious views, no man would call him in question for them. Besides which, he was very hospitable to his friends, very bountiful to the poor, a good landlord and a humane man. His very austerity of manner, tempered by stately courtesy, added to the respect he inspired, especially as he could now and then relax into gaiety, and when he did so, his smile was accounted singularly sweet. But in general, he was grave and formal, stiff in attire and stiff in gait, cold and punctilious in manner, precise in speech, and exacting in due respect from both high and low, which was seldom, if ever, refused him. Among Sir Ralph's other good qualities, for such it was esteemed by his friends and retainers, and they were, of course, the best judges, was a strong love of the chase, and perhaps he indulged a little too freely in the sports of the field for a gentleman of a character so staid and decorous, but his popularity was far from being diminished by the circumstance. Neither did he suffer the rude and boisterous companionship into which he was brought by indulgence in this his favourite pursuit in any way to affect him. Though still young, Sir Ralph was prematurely grey, and this, combined with the sad severity of his aspect, gave him the air of one considerably past the middle term of life, though this appearance was contradicted again by the youthful fire of his eagle eye. His features were handsome and strongly marked, and he wore a pointed beard and moustaches with a shaved cheek. Sir Ralph Asherton had married twice, his first wife being a daughter of Sir James Beltingham of Levens in Northumberland, by whom he had two children, while his second choice fell upon Eleanor Shuttleworth, the lovely and well-endowed heiress of Gawthorpe, to whom he had been recently united. In his attire, even when habited for the chase or a merry-making, like the present, the Knight of Whaley affected a sombre colour, and ordinarily wore a quilted doublet of black silk, immense trunk hose of the same material stiffened with whalebone, puffed out well-wadded sleeves, falling bands, for he eschewed the ruff as savouring of vanity, boots of black flexible leather ascending to the hose, and armed with spurs with gigantic rowels, a round-crowned, small-brimmed black hat, with an ostrich feather, placed in the side and hanging over the top, a long rapier on his hip, and a dagger in his girdle. This buckram attire, it will be easily conceived, contributed no little to the natural stiffness of his tall, thin figure. Sir Ralph Asherton was great-grandson of Richard Asherton, who flourished in the time of Abbot Paslew and who, in conjunction with John Bradill, fourteen years after the unfortunate prelate's attainder and the dissolution of the monastery, had purchased the abbey and domains of Whaley from the crown, subsequently to which a division of the property so granted took place between them, the abbey and part of the manor falling to the share of Richard Asherton, whose descendants had now for three generations made it their residence. Thus the whole of Whaley belonged to the families of Asherton and Bradill, which had intermarried, the latter, as has been stated, dwelling at Portfield, a fine old seat in the neighbourhood. A very different person from Sir Ralph was his cousin, Nicholas Asherton of Downham, who, except as regards his Puritanism, might be considered a type of the Lancashire squire of the day. A precision in religious notions, and constant in attendance at church and lecture, he put no sort of restraint upon himself but mixed up fox-hunting, otter-hunting, shooting at the mark, and perhaps shooting with the longbow, foot-racing, horse-racing, and in fact every other kind of country diversion, not forgetting tippling, cards, and dicing, with daily devotion, discourses, and psalm-singing, in the oddest way imaginable. A thorough sportsman was Squire Nicholas Asherton, well versed in the arts and mysteries of hawking and hunting. Not a man in the county could ride harder, hunt deer, unkennel fox, unearth badger, or spear otter, better than he. And then, as to tippling, he would sit you a whole afternoon at the alehouse, and be the merriest man there, and drink about with every farmer present. And if the parson chanced to be out of hearing, he would never make a mouth at a round oath, nor choose a second expression when the first would serve his turn. Then, who so constant at church or lecture as Squire Nicholas? And though he did snore sometimes during the long sermons of his cousin, the rector of Middleton. A great man was he at all weddings, christenings, churchings, and funerals, 
and never neglected his bottle at these ceremonies, nor any sport indoors or out of doors meanwhile. In short, such a roistering Puritan was never known. A good-looking young man was the squire of Downham, possessed of a very athletic frame and a most vigorous constitution, which helped him, together with the prodigious exercise he took, through any excess. He had a sanguine complexion, with a broad, good-natured visage, which he could lengthen at will in a surprising manner. His hair was cropped close to his head, and the razor did daily duty over his cheek and chin, giving him the round-head look, some years later characteristic of the puritanical party. Nicholas had taken to wife Dorothy, daughter of Richard Greenacres of Worston, and was most fortunate in his choice, which is more than can be said for his lady, for I cannot uphold the squire as a model of conjugal fidelity. Report affirmed that he loved more than one pretty girl under the rose. Squire Nicholas was not particular as to the quality or make of his clothes, providing they wore well, and protected him against the weather, and was generally to be seen in doublet and hose of stout fustian, which had seen some service, with a broad-heaved hat, originally green, but of late bleached to a much lighter colour. But he was clad on this particular occasion in ash-coloured habiliments, fresh from the tailor's hands, with buff boots drawn up to the knee, and a new round hat from York, with a green feather in it. His legs were slightly embowed, and he bore himself like a man rarely out of the saddle. Downham, the residence of the squire, was a fine old house, very charmingly situated to the north of Pendle Hill, of which it commanded a magnificent view, and a few miles from Clitheroe. The grounds about it were well wooded, and beautifully broken and diversified, watered by the Ribble, and opening upon the lovely and extensive valley deriving its name from that stream. The house was in good order and well maintained, and the stables plentifully furnished with horses, while the hall was adorned with various trophies and implements of the chase. But as I propose paying its owner a visit, I shall defer any further description of the place till an opportunity arrives for examining it in detail. A third cousin of Sir Ralph's, though in the second degree likewise present on the May Day in question, was the Reverend Abadias Asherton, rector of Middleton, a very worthy man, who, though differing from his kinsman upon some religious points, and not altogether approving of the conduct of one of them, was on good terms with both. The rector of Middleton was portly and middle-aged, fond of ease and reading, and by no means indifferent to the good things of life. He was unmarried, and passed much of his time at Middleton Hall, the seat of his near relative Sir Richard Asherton, to whose family he was greatly attached, and whose residence closely adjoined the rectory. A fourth cousin also present was young Richard Asherton of Middleton, eldest son and heir of the owner of that estate. Possessed of all the good qualities largely distributed among his kinsmen, with none of their drawbacks, this young man was as tolerant and bountiful as Sir Ralph, without his austerity and sectarianism, as keen a sportsman, and as bold a rider as Nicholas, without his propensities to excess, as studious at times, and as well-read as Abdias, without his laziness and self-indulgence, and as courtly and well-bred as his father, Sir Richard, who was esteemed one of the most perfect gentlemen in the county, without his haughtiness. Then he was the handsomest of his race, though the Ashertons were accounted the handsomest family in Lancashire, and no one minded yielding the palm to young Richard, even if it could be contested, he was so modest and unassuming. At this time Richard Asherton was about two-and-twenty, tall, gracefully and slightly formed, but possessed of such remarkable vigour that even his cousin Nicholas could scarcely compete with him in athletic exercises. His features were fine and regular, with an almost Phrygian precision of outline. His hair was of a dark brown, and fell in clustering curls over his brown neck and his complexion was fresh and blooming, and set off by a slight beard and moustache, carefully trimmed and pointed. His dress consisted of a dark green doublet, with wide velvet hose, embroidered and fringed, descending nearly to the knee, where they were tied with points and ribbons, met by dark stockings, and terminated by red velvet shoes with roses in them. A white feather adorned his black, broad-leaved hat, and he had a rapier by his side. Amongst Sir Ralph Asherton's guests were Richard Greenacres of Worston, Nicholas Asherton's father-in-law, 
Richard Sherborne of Dunno, near Sladeburn, who had married Dorothy, Nicholas's sister, Mistress Robinson of Raydale House, aunt to the knight and the squire, and two of her sons, both stout youths, with John Bradill and his wife of Portfield. Besides these there was Master Roger Nowell, a justice of the peace in the county, and a very active and busy one, too, who had been invited for an especial purpose to be explained hereafter. Head of an ancient Lancashire family, residing at Reed, a fine old hall, some distance from Whaley, Roger Nowell, though a worthy, well-meaning man, dealt hard measure from the bench, and seldom tempered justice with mercy. He was sharp-featured, dry, and sarcastic, and being adverse to country sports, his presence on the occasion was the only thing likely to impose restraint on the revellers. Other guests there were, but none of any particular note. The ladies of the party consisted of Lady Asherton, Mistress Nicholas Asherton of Downham, Dorothy Asherton of Middleton, sister to Richard, a lovely girl of eighteen, with light, fleecy hair, summer blue eyes, and a complexion of exquisite purity, Mistress Sherborne of Dunno, Mistress Robinson of Raydale, and Mistress Bradill of Portfield, before mentioned, together with the wives and daughters of some others of the neighbouring gentry, most noticeable amongst whom was Mistress Alice Nutter, of Rough Lee in Pendle Forest, a widow lady, and a relative of the Asherton family. Mistress Nutter might be a year or two turned of forty, but she still retained a very fine figure, and much beauty of feature, though of a cold and disagreeable cast. She was dressed in mourning, though her husband had been dead several years, and her rich, dark habiliments well became her pale complexion and raven hair. A proud, poor gentleman was Richard Nutter, her late husband, and, his scanty means not enabling him to keep up as large an establishment as he desired, or to be as hospitable as his nature prompted, his temper became soured and he visited his ill-humours upon his wife, who, devotedly attached to him, to all outward appearances at least, never resented his ill-treatment. All at once, and without any previous symptoms of ailment or apparent cause, unless it might be over-fatigue in hunting the day before, Richard Nutter was seized with a strange and violent illness, which, after three or four days of acute suffering, brought him to the grave. During his illness he was constantly and zealously tended by his wife, but he displayed great aversion to her, declaring himself bewitched, and that an old woman was ever in the corner of his room mumbling wicked enchantments against him. But as no such old woman could be seen, these assertions were treated as delirious ravings. They were not, however, forgotten after his death, and some people said that he had certainly been bewitched, and that a waxen image made in his likeness and stuck full of pins had been picked up in his chamber by Mistress Alice, and cast into the fire, and as soon as it melted, he had expired. Such tales only obtained credence with the common folk, but as Pendle Forest was a sort of weird region, many reputed witches dwelling in it, they were the more readily believed, even by those who acquitted Mistress Nutter of all share in the dark transaction. Mistress Nutter gave the best proof that she respected her husband's memory by not marrying again, and she continued to lead a very secluded life at Rough Lee, a lonesome house in the heart of the forest. She lived quite by herself, for she had no children, her only daughter having perished somewhat strangely when quite an infant. Though a relative of the Ashertons, she kept up little intimacy with them, and it was a matter of surprise to all that she had been drawn from her seclusion to attend the present revel. Her motive, however, in visiting the Abbey, was to obtain the assistance of Sir Ralph Asherton in settling a dispute between her and Roger Nowell relative to the boundary line of part of their properties which came together, and this was the reason why the magistrate had been invited to Whaley. After hearing both sides of the question, and examining plans of the estates, which he knew to be accurate, Sir Ralph, who had been appointed umpire, pronounced a decision in favour of Roger Nowell. But Mistress Nutter, refusing to abide by it, the settlement of the matter was postponed till the day but one following, between which time the landmarks were to be investigated by a certain little lawyer named Potts, who attended on behalf of Roger Nowell, together with Nicholas and Richard Asherton on behalf of Mistress Nutter. Upon their evidence it was agreed by both parties that Sir Ralph should pronounce a final decision, to be accepted by them, and to that effect they signed an agreement. The three persons appointed to the investigation settled to start for Rough Lee early on the following morning. 
A word as to Master Thomas Potts. This worthy was an attorney from London, who had officiated as clerk of the court of the Assizes at Lancaster, where his quickness had so much pleased Roger Nowell that he sent for him to read, to manage this particular business. A sharp-witted fellow was Potts, and versed in all the quirks and tricks of a very subtle profession, not over-scrupulous, provided a client would pay well, prepared to resort to any expedient to gain his object, and quite conversant enough with both practice and precedent to keep himself straight. A bustling, consequential little personage was he, moreover, very fond of delivering an opinion, even when unasked, and of a meddling make-mischief turn, constantly setting men by the ears. A suit of rusty black, a parchment-coloured skin, small, weazen features, a turn-up nose, scant eyebrows, and a great yellow forehead constituted his external man. He partook of the hospitality at the Abbey, but had his quarters at the Dragon. He it was who counselled Roger Nowell to abide by the decision of Sir Ralph, confidently assuring him that he must carry his point. This dispute was not, however, the only one the knight had to adjust, or in which Master Potts was concerned. A claim had been recently made by a certain Sir Thomas Metcalfe of Nappe, in Wensleydale, near Bainbridge, to the house and manor of Raydale, belonging to his neighbour John Robinson, whose lady, as has been shown, was a relative of the Ashertons. Robinson himself had gone to London to obtain advice on the subject, while Sir Thomas Metcalfe, who was a man of violent disposition, had threatened to take forcible possession of Raydale, if it were not delivered to him without delay, and to eject the Robinson family. Having consulted Potts, however, on the subject, whom he had met at Reed, the latter strongly dissuaded him from the course, and recommended him to call to his aid the strong arm of the law. But this he rejected, though he ultimately agreed to refer the matter to Sir Ralph Asherton, and for this purpose he had come over to Whaley, and was at present a guest at the vicarage. Thus it will be seen that Sir Ralph Asherton had his hands full, while the little London lawyer, Master Potts, was tolerably well occupied. Besides Sir Thomas Metcalfe, Sir Richard Molyneux and Mr. Parker of Browsholm were guests of Dr. Ormerod at the vicarage. Such was the large company assembled to witness the May Day revels at Whaley, and if harmonious feelings did not exist among all of them, little outward manifestation was made of enmity. The dresses and appointments of the pageant, having been provided by Sir Ralph Asherton, who, Puritan as he was, encouraged all harmless country pastimes, it was deemed necessary to pay him every respect, even if no other feeling would have prompted the attention, and therefore the troop had stopped on seeing him and his guests issue from the abbey gate. At pretty nearly the same time, Dr. Ormerod and his party came from the vicarage towards the green. No order of march was observed, but Sir Ralph and his lady, with two of his children by the former marriage, walked first. Then came some of the other ladies, with the rector of Middleton, John Bradill, and the two sons of Mistress Robinson. Next came Mistress Nutter, Roger Knoll, and Potts, walking after her, eyeing her maliciously as her proud figure swept on before them. Even if she saw their looks or overheard their jeers, she did not deign to notice them. Lastly came young Richard Asherton of Middleton and Squire Nicholas, both in high spirits and laughing and chatting together. "'A brave day for the Morris dancers, Cousin Dick,' observed Nicholas Asherton, as they approached the green, "'and plenty of folk to witness the sport. Half of my lads from Downham are here, and I see a good many of your Middleton chaps among them. "'How are you, Farmer Tetlow?' he added, to a stout, hale-looking man, with a blooming countrywoman by his side. "'Brought your pretty young wife to the rush-bearing, I see.' "'Yea, Squire,' rejoined the farmer, "'and mightily pleased her be we it, too.' "'Happy to hear it, Master Tetlow,' replied Nicholas. "'She'll be better pleased before the day's over, I'll warrant her. "'I'll dance a round with her myself in the hall at night.' "'There now, Meg, why don't you make Squire a curtsy wench and dunk him?' said Tetlow, nudging his pretty wife, who had turned away rather embarrassed by the free gaze of the squire. Nicholas, however, did not wait for the curtsy, but went away laughing, to overtake Richard Asherton, who had walked on. "'Ah, here's Frank Garside,' he continued, espying another rustic acquaintance. "'Hello, Frank. I'll come over one day next week and try for a fox in Easington Woods. 
"'We missed the last, you know. "'Tom Brockholes, are you here? "'Just ridden over from Sladeburn, eh? "'When's that shooting match at the Bodkin to come off, eh? "'Mind, it's to be at twenty-two roads' distance. "'Ride over to Downham on Thursday next, Tom. "'We'll have a foot-race, and I'll show you good sport, "'and at night we'll have a lusty drinking bout at the alehouse. "'On Friday we'll take out the great nets "'and try for salmon in the ribble.' "'I took some fish on Monday, one salmon of ten pounds weight, the largest I've got the whole season. I brought it with me to-day to the Abbey. There's an otter in the river, and I won't hunt him till you come, Tom. I shall see you on Thursday, eh?' Receiving an answer in the affirmative, Squire Nicholas walked on, nodding right and left, jesting with the farmers, and ogling their pretty wives and daughters. "'I tell you what, Cousin Dick,' he said, "'calling after Richard Asherton, who had got in advance of him. "'I'll match my dun nag against your great gelding for twenty pieces, "'that I reach the boundary line of roughly lands before you to-morrow. "'What? You won't have it? You know I shall beat you. <laughs> "'Well, we'll try the speed of the two tits the first day we hunt the stag in Boland Forest.' "'Odds my life!' he cried, suddenly altering his deportment and lengthening his visage. "'If there isn't our parson here! Stay with me, Cousin Dick, stay with me. "'Give you good day, worthy Mr. Dewhurst,' he added, taking off his hat to the divine, who respectfully returned his salutation. "'I did not look to see your reverence here taking part in these vanities and idle sports. "'I propose to call on you on Saturday, pass an hour in serious discourse. "'I would call to-morrow, but I have to ride over to Pendle on business.' "'Tell you a moment for me, I pray you, good cousin Richard. "'I fear you, reverend sir, that you will see much here that will scandalise you, "'much lightness and indecorum. "'Pleasant afar will see a large congregation of the elders "'flocking together to a godly meeting than crowds assembled for such a profane purpose. "'Another moment, Richard. "'My cousin is a young man, Mr. Dewhurst, and wishes to join the revel.' "'But we must make allowances, worthy and reverend sir, until the world shall improve. "'An excellent discourse you gave us, good ear, on Sunday. Eight Romans, twelve and thirteen verses. "'It's graven upon my memory, but I have made a note of it in my diary. "'I come to you, cousin, I come. "'I pray you walk on to the Abbey, good Mr. Dewhurst, where you will be right welcome, "'and call for any refreshment you may desire. "'A glass of good sack and a slice of venison pasty, on which we have just dined.' "'and there's some famous old ale which I would commend to you, "'but that I know you care not any more than myself for creature comforts. "'Farewell, reverend sir. I will join you ere long, "'for these scenes have little attraction for me. "'But I must take care that my young cousin falleth not into harm.' "'And as the divine took his way to the abbey, he added laughingly to Richard, oh, "'Good riddance, Dick. I would not have the old fellow play the spy upon us.' "'Ah, Giles Mercer!' he added, stopping again, and Jeff Rushton, well met, lads. What, are you come to the wake? I shall be at John Law's in the evening, and we'll have a glass together. John brews sack rarely, and spareth not the eggs. But you'll be at the dancing at Dabby Squire, said one of the farmers. Curse the dancing, cried Nicholas. Oh. I hope the parson didn't hear me, he added, turning round quickly. Well, well, I'll come down when the dancing's over, and we'll make a night of it and he ran on to overtake Richard Asherton. By this time the respective parties from the Abbey and the vicarage having united, they walked on together. Sir Ralph Asherton, after courteously exchanging salutations with Dr. Ormerod's guests, still keeping a little in advance of the company. Sir Thomas Metcalfe comported himself with more than his wonted haughtiness, and bowed so superciliously to Mistress Robinson that her two sons glanced angrily at each other, as if in doubt that they should not instantly resent the affront. Observing this, as well as what had previously taken place, Nicholas Asherton stepped quickly up to them and said, "'Keep quiet, lads. Leave this dunghill cock to me, and I'll lower his crest.' With this he pushed forward, and elbowing Sir Thomas rudely out of the way, turned round, and instead of apologising, eyed him coolly and contemptuously from head to foot. "'Are you drunk, sir, that you forget your manners?' "'asked Sir Thomas, laying his hand upon his sword. "'Not so drunk that I know how to conduct myself like a gentleman, Sir Thomas,' rejoined Nicholas, "'which is more than can be said of a certain person of my acquaintance, "'who, for aught I know, has only taken his morning pint.' "'You wish to pick a quarrel with me, Master Nicholas Asherton, I perceive,' 
said Sir Thomas, stepping up close to him, "'and I will not disappoint you. You shall render me good reason for this affront before I leave Whaley.' "'When and where you please, Sir Thomas,' rejoined Nicholas, laughing, "'at any hour and any weapon, I am your man.' At this moment Master Potts, who had scented a quarrel afar, and who would have liked it well enough if its prosecution had not run counter to his own interests, quitted Roger Nowell, and ran back to Metcalfe, and plucking him by the sleeve, said in a low voice, "'This is not the way to obtain quiet possession of Raydale House, Sir Thomas. Master Nicholas Asherton,' he added, turning to him, "'I must entreat you, my good sir, to be moderate. Gentlemen, both, I caution you that I have my eye upon you. You well know there is a magistrate here, my singular good friend and honoured client, Master Roger Nowell. If you pursue this quarrel further, I shall hold it my duty to have you bound over by that worthy gentleman, in sufficient security to keep the peace towards our sovereign lord the king, and all his lieges, and particularly towards each other. You understand me, gentlemen? Perfectly, replied Nicholas. I drink at John Law's to-night, Sir Thomas. So saying, he walked away. Metcalfe would have followed him, but was withheld by Potts. "'Let him go, Sir Thomas,' said the little man of law. "'Let him go. Once master of Raydale, you can do as you please. Leave the settlement of the matter to me. I'll just whisper a word in Sir Ralph Asherton's ear, and you'll hear no more of it.' "'Fire and fury!' growled Sir Thomas. "'I like not this mode of settling a quarrel, and unless this hot-headed psalm singing Puritan apologises, I shall assuredly cut his throat.' "'Or he yours, good Sir Thomas,' rejoined Potts. "'Better sit in Raydale Hall than lie in the Abbey vaults.' "'Well, we'll talk the matter over, Master Potts,' replied the knight. Oh, "'A nice morning's work I've made of it,' mused Nicholas, as he walked along. "'Here I have a dance with a farmer's pretty wife, a discourse with a parson, a drinking bout with a couple of clowns, and a duello with a blustering knight on my hands.' "'Quite enough of my conscience. "'But I must get through it the best way I can. "'And now, hey, for the Maypole and the Morris dancers.' "'Nicholas just got up in time to witness the presentation of the May Queen "'to Sir Ralph Asherton and his lady. "'And like everyone else, he was greatly struck by her extreme beauty and natural grace. "'The little ceremony was thus conducted. "'When the company from the Abbey drew near the troop of revellers, the usher, taking Alison's hand in the tips of his fingers as before, strutted forward with her to Sir Ralph and his lady, and falling upon one knee before them, said, "'A most worshipful and honoured knight, and you his lovely dame, and you the tender and cherished olive branches growing round about their tables, I hereby crave your gracious permission to present unto your honours our chosen Queen of May.' Somewhat fluttered by the presentation, Alison yet maintained sufficient composure to bend gracefully before Lady Asherton, and say in a very sweet voice, "'I fear your ladyship will think the choice of the village hath fallen ill in alighting upon me, and indeed I feel myself altogether unworthy the distinction. Nevertheless, I will endeavour to discharge the office fittingly, and therefore pray you, fair lady, and the worshipful knight your husband, together with your beauteous children and the gentles, all by whom you are surrounded, to grace our little festival with your presence, hoping you may find as much pleasure in the sight as we shall do in offering it to you. Oh, a fair maid, and modest as she is fair, observed Sir Ralph, with a condescending smile. In sooth she is, replied Lady Asherton, raising her kindly, and saying as she did so, "'Nay, you must not kneel to us, sweet maid. "'You are Queen of the May, and it is for us to show respect to you "'during your day of sovereignty. "'Your wishes are commands, and in behalf of my husband, "'my children, and our guests, I answer that we will gladly "'attend your revels on the green.' "'Well said, dear Nell, observed Sir Ralph. "'We should be churlish indeed were we to refuse the bidding "'of so lovely a queen.' "'Nay, you have called the roses in earnest to her cheek now, Sir Ralph,' observed Lady Asherton, smiling. "'Lead on, fair queen,' she continued, "'and tell your companions to begin their sport when they please. "'Only remember this, that we shall hope to see all your gay troop this evening at the Abbey, to a merry dance.' "'Where I will strive to find Her Majesty a suitable partner,' added Sir Ralph. 
stay she shall make her choice now as a royal personage should for you know nell a queen ever chooseth her partner whether it be for the throne or for the brawl how say you fair one shall it be either of our young cousins joe or will robinson of raydale or our cousin who still thinketh himself young squire nicholas of downham ay let it be me i implore you fair queen interposed nicholas he is engaged already observed richard assheton coming forward i heard him ask pretty mistress tetlow the farmer's wife to dance with him this evening at the abbey a loud laugh from those around followed this piece of information but nicholas was in no wise disconcerted dick would have her choose him and that's why he interferes with me he observed how say you fair queen shall it be our hopeful cousin i will answer for him that he danceth the coranto and la volta indifferently well on hearing richard assheton's voice all the colour had forsaken alison's cheeks but at this direct appeal to her by nicholas it returned with additional force and the change did not escape the quick eye of lady assheton you perplex her cousin nicholas she said not a whit eleanor answered the squire but if she like not dick assheton there is another dick dick sherborne of sladeburn or our cousin jack bradhill or if she prefer an older and discreeter man there is father greenacres of worston or master roger nowell of reed plenty of choice nay if i must choose a partner it shall be a young one said alizon <laughs> right fair queen right cried nicholas laughing ever choose a young man if you can who shall it be you have named him yourself sir replied alizon in a voice which she endeavoured to keep firm but which in spite of all her efforts sounded tremulously uh, master richard assheton next to choosing me you could not have chosen better observed nicholas approvingly dick lad i congratulate thee i congratulate myself replied the young man fair queen he added advancing highly flattered as i am by your choice and shall so demean myself i trust as to prove myself worthy of it before i go i would beg a boon from you that flower this pink cried alizon it is yours fair sir young assheton took the flower and took the hand that offered it at the same time and pressed the latter to his lips while lady assheton who had been made a little uneasy by alizon's apparent emotion and who with true feminine tact immediately detected its cause called out now forward forward to the maypole we have interrupted the revel too long upon this the may queen stepped blushingly back with the usher who with his white wand in hand had stood bolt upright behind her immensely delighted with the scene in which his pupil for alizon had been tutored by him for the occasion had taken part sir ralph then clapped his hands loudly and at this signal the tabor and pipe struck up the fool and the hobby horse who though idle all the time had indulged in a little quiet fun with the rustics recommenced their gambols the morris dancers their lively dance and the whole train moved towards the maypole followed by the rush cart with all its bells jingling and all its garlands waving as to alizon her brain was in a whirl and her bosom heaved so quickly that she thought she would faint to think that the choice of a partner in the dance at the abbey had been offered her and that she should venture to choose master richard assheton she could scarcely credit her own temerity and then to think that she should give him a flower and more than all that he should kiss her hand in return for it she felt the tingling pressure of his lips upon her finger still and her little heart palpitated strangely as she approached the maypole and the troop again halted for a few minutes she saw her brother james holding little jennet by the hand standing in the front line to look at her oh how glad i am to see you here jennet she cried and i am right glad to see you alizon replied the little girl jem has told me what a grand partner you are to have this e'en and she added with playful malice who was wrong when she said the queen would choose master richard hush jennet not a word more interrupted alizon blushing oh i don't mean to vex you i am sure replied jennet i've got a present for ye a present for me jennet cried alizon what is it a beautiful white dove replied the little girl a white dove where did you get it let me see it cried alizon in a breath here it is 
replied Janet, opening her kirtle. "'A beautiful bird indeed!' cried Alison. "'Take care of it for me till I come home.' "'Which will be till late, I fancy,' rejoined Janet roguishly. "'Ah!' she added, uttering a cry. The latter exclamation was occasioned by the sudden flight of the dove, which, escaping from her hold, soared aloft. Janet followed the course of its silver wings as they cleaved the blue sky, and then all at once saw a large hawk, which apparently had been hovering above, swoop down upon it and bear it off. Some white feathers fell down near the little girl, and she picked up one of them and put it in her breast. "'Poor bird!' exclaimed the May Queen. "'Ah, poor bird!' echoed Janet tearfully. "'Ah, you dunno, know, oh, Alison!' "'Well, there's no yours whimpering about a dove,' observed Jem gruffly. "'I'll bring yet another first time I go to Cown. "'There's no another bird like that,' sobbed the little girl. "'Show that cruel hawk for me, Jem, will ye? "'Ah, oh, con a wench, when it's flown away,' he replied. "'But I'd rob a hawk's nest for ye, if that'll do as well.' "'Ye dunna understand me, Jem,' replied the child sadly. At this moment the music, which had ceased while some arrangements were made, commenced a very lively tune, known as Round About the Maypole, and Robin Hood, taking the May Queen's hand, led her towards the pole, and placing her near it, the whole of her attendants took hands, and while a second circle was formed by the Morris dancers, and both began to wheel rapidly round her, the music momently increasing in spirit and quickness. An irresistible desire to join in the measure seized some of the lads and lasses around, and they likewise took hands, and presently a third and still wider circle was formed, wheeling gaily around the other two. Other dances were formed here and there, and presently the whole green was in movement. "'If you come off at all tonight, Dick, I shall be surprised,' observed Nicholas, who, with his young relative, had approached as near the maypole as the three rounds of dancers would allow them. Richard Asherton made no reply, but glanced at the pink which he had placed in his doublet. "'Who is the May Queen?' inquired Sir Thomas Metcalfe, who had likewise drawn near, of a tall man holding a little girl by the hand. "'Alison, daughter of Elizabeth Device, and my sister,' replied James Device, gruffly. "'Humph!' muttered Sir Thomas. "'She's a well-looking lass, and she dwells here, in Whaley, feller,' he added. "'No dwells he, Whaley?' "'responded Jem, sullenly. "'I can easily find her abode,' muttered the knight, walking away. "'What was it Sir Thomas said to you, Jem?' inquired Nicholas, who had watched the knight's gestures coming up. Jem related what had passed between them. Oh, "'What the devil does he want with her?' cried Nicholas. "'No good, I'm sure, but I'll spoil his sport.' "'Say but the words, choir, and I'll break every bone in his body.' remarked Jem. "'No, no, Jem,' replied Nicholas. "'Take care of your pretty sister, and I'll take care of him.' At this juncture, Sir Thomas, who, in spite of the efforts of the Pacific Master Potts to tranquillise him, had been burning with wrath at the affront he had received from Nicholas, came up to Richard Asherton, and, noticing the pink in his bosom, snatched it away suddenly. "'I want a flower,' he said, smelling at it. "'Instantly restore it, Sir Thomas.' cried Richard Asherton, pale with rage, or— "'What will you do, young sir?' rejoined the knight, tauntingly, and plucking the flower in pieces. "'You can get another from the fair nymph who gave you this.' Further speech was not allowed the knight, for he received a violent blow on the chest from the hand of Richard Asherton, which sent him reeling backwards, and would have felled him to the ground if he had not been caught by some of the bystanders. The moment he recovered, Sir Thomas drew his sword, and furiously assaulted young Asherton, who stood ready for him, and after the exchange of a few passes, for none of the bystanders dared to interfere, sent his sword whirling over their head through the air. "'Bravo, Dick!' cried Nicholas, stepping up and clapping his cousin on the back. "'You have read him a good lesson, and taught him that he cannot always insult folks with impunity.' <laughs> and he laughed loudly at the discomfited knight. "'He is an insolent coward,' cried Richard Asherton. "'Give him his sword, and let him come on again.' "'No, no,' said Nicholas. 
He has had enough this time, and if he has not, he must settle an account with me. Put up your blade, lad. Or I'll be revenged upon you both, said Sir Thomas, taking his sword, which had been brought him by a bystander, and stalking away. "'You leave us in mortal dread, doughty knight!' cried Nicholas, shouting after him derisively. <laughs> "'Richard Asherton's attention was, however, turned in a different direction, for the music suddenly ceasing, and the dancers stopping, he learnt that the May Queen had fainted, and presently afterwards the crowd opened to give passage to Robin Hood, who bore her inanimate form in his arms. End of chapter 3book 1 chapter 4 of the lancashire witches this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by andy minter the lancashire witches a romance of pendle forest by william harrison ainsworth book 1 alison device chapter 4 alice nutter the quarrel between Nicholas Asherton and Sir Thomas Metcalfe had already been made known to Sir Ralph by the officious Master Potts, and though it occasioned the knight much displeasure as interfering with the amicable arrangement he hoped to effect with Sir Thomas for his relatives the Robinsons, still he felt sure that he had sufficient influence with his hot-headed cousin, the squire, to prevent the dispute from being carried further, and he only waited the conclusion of the sports on the green to take him to task. What was the knight's surprise and annoyance, therefore, to find that a new brawl had sprung up, and, ignorant of its precise cause, he laid it entirely at the door of the turbulent Nicholas. Indeed, on the commencement of the fray, he imagined that the squire was personally concerned in it, and, full of wrath, flew to the scene of action. But before he got there, the affair, which, as has been seen, was of short duration, was fully settled, and he only heard the jeers addressed to the retreating combatant by Nicholas. It was not Sir Ralph's way to vent his collar in words, but the squire knew in an instant, from the expression of his countenance, that he was greatly incensed, and therefore hastened to explain. "'What means this unseemly disturbance, Nicholas?' cried Sir Ralph, not allowing the other to speak. "'You are ever brawling like an Alsatian squire.' Independent of the ill example set to these good folk, who have met here for tranquil amusement, you have counteracted all my plans for the adjustment of the differences between Sir Thomas Metcalfe and our aunt of Raydale. If you forget what is due to yourself, sir, do not forget what is due to me, and to the name you bear. No one but yourself should say as much to me, Sir Ralph, rejoined Nicholas, somewhat haughtily, but you are under a misapprehension. It is not I who have been fighting, though I should have acted in precisely the same manner as our cousin Dick if I had received the same affront, and so, I make bold to say, would you. Our name shall suffer no discredit from me, and as a gentleman I assert that Sir Thomas Metcalfe has only received due chastisement, as you yourself will admit, cousin, when you know all. I know him to be overbearing, observed Sir Ralph. "'Overbearing is not the word, cousin,' interrupted Nicholas. "'He is as proud as a peacock, and would trample upon us all, "'and gore us too like one of the wild bulls of Borland, "'if we would let him have his way. "'But I would treat him as I would the bull aforesaid, "'a wild boar or any other savage and intractable beast. "'Hunt him down, and pull his horns, or pluck out his tusks.' "'Come, come, Nicholas, this is no very gentle language,' remarked Sir Ralph. "'Why, to speak truth, cousin, I do not feel in any very gentle frame of mind,' rejoined the squire. "'My ire has been roused by this insolent braggart. My blood is up, and I long to be doing.' Uh, "'Unchristian feelings, Nicholas,' said Sir Ralph severely, "'and should be overcome. Turn the other cheek to the smiter. I trust you bear no malice to Sir Thomas.' "'I bear him no malice, for I hope malice is not in my nature, cousin.' replied Nicholas, but I owe him a grudge, and when a fitting opportunity occurs, no more of this, unless you really would incur my displeasure, rejoined Sir Ralph. The matter has gone far enough, too far perhaps for amendment, 
and if you know it not i can tell you that sir thomas's claims to raydale will be difficult to dispute and so our uncle robinson has found since he hath taken counsel on the case have a care sir ralph said nicholas noticing that master potts was approaching them with his ears evidently wide open there is that little london lawyer hovering about but i'll give the cunning fox a double i am glad to hear you say so sir ralph he added in a tone calculated to reach potts and since our uncle robinson is so sure of his cause it may be better to let this blustering night be perchance it is the certainty of failure that makes him so insensate and this is meant to blind me but it shall not serve your turn cautelous squire muttered potts i caught enough of what fell just now from sir ralph to satisfy me that he hath strong misgivings but it is best not to appear too secure ah sir ralph he added coming forward i was right you see in my caution i am a man of peace and strive to prevent quarrels and bloodshed quarrel if you please and unfortunately men are prone to anger but always settle your disputes in a court of law always in a court of law sir ralph that is the only area where a sensible man should ever fight fee your counsel well and the chances are ten to one in your favour that is what i say to my worthy and singular good client sir thomas but he is somewhat headstrong and vehement and will not listen to me he is for settling matters by the sword for making forcible entries and detainers and ousting the tenants in possession whereby he would render himself liable to arrest fine ransom and forfeiture instead of proceeding cautiously and decorously as the law directs and as i advised sir ralph by writ of ejectione thermae or action of trespass which would assuredly establish his title and restore him the house and lands or he may proceed by writ of right which perhaps in his case considering the long absence of possession and the doubts supposed to perplex the title though i myself have no doubts about it would be the most efficacious these are your only true weapons sir ralph your writs of entry assize and right your pleas of novel deceasing post deceasing and re deceasing your remitters your precepts your pones and your recordari faciases these are the sword shield and armour of proof of a wise man zounds you take away one's breath with this hailstorm of writs and pleas master lawyer cried nicholas but in one respect i am of your worthy and singular good client's opinion and would rather trust to my own hand for the defence of my property than to the law to keep it for me then you would do wrong good master nicholas rejoined potts with a smile of supreme contempt for the law is the better guardian and the stronger adversary of the two and so sir thomas will find if he takes my advice and obtains as he can and will do a perfect title juris et seasonae conjunctionem sir thomas is still willing to refer the case to my arbitration i believe sir demanded sir ralph uneasily he was so sir ralph rejoined potts unless the assaults and batteries with intent to do him grievous corporal hurt which he hath sustained from your relatives have induced a change of mind in him but as i premised sir ralph i am a man of peace and willing to intermediate and providing you get your fee master lawyer observed nicholas sarcastically certainly i object not to the quidam honorarium master nicholas rejoined potts and if my client hath the quid pro quo and gaineth his point he cannot complain but what is this some fresh disturbance oh, something hath happened to the may queen cried nicholas i trust not said sir ralph with real concern ah she has fainted they are bringing her this way poor maid what can have occasioned this sudden seizure i think i can give a guess muttered nicholas better remove her to the abbey he added aloud to the knight you are right said sir ralph our cousin dick is near her i observe he shall see her conveyed there at once at this moment lady assheton and mrs nutter with some of the other ladies came up just in time nell cried the knight have you your smelling bottle about you the may queen has fainted indeed exclaimed lady assheton springing towards alizon who was now sustained by young richard assheton the forester having surrendered her to him how has this happened she inquired 
giving her to breathe at a small phial. Uh, "'That I cannot tell you, cousin,' replied Richard Asherton, "'unless from some sudden fright.' "'That was it, Master Richard,' cried Robin Hood. "'She cried out on hearing the clashing of swords just now, "'and I think pronounced your name on finding you engaged with Sir Thomas, "'and immediately after turned pale and would have fallen if I had not caught her.' "'Ah, oh, indeed!' exclaimed Lady Asherton, glancing at Richard, whose eyes fell before her inquiring gaze. "'But see, she revives,' pursued the lady. "'Let me support her head.' As she spoke, Alison opened her eyes, and, perceiving Richard Asherton, who had relinquished her to his relative, standing beside her, she exclaimed, "'Oh, you are safe! I feared!' And then she stopped, greatly embarrassed. "'You feared he might be in danger from his fierce adversary?' supplied Lady Asherton. "'But no, the conflict is happily over, and he is unhurt.' "'I am glad of it,' said Alison earnestly. "'She had better be taken to the Abbey,' remarked Sir Ralph, coming up. "'Nay, she will be more at ease at home,' observed Lady Asherton, with a significant look which, however, failed in reaching her husband. "'Yes, truly, truly shall I, gracious lady,' replied Alison. "'Far more so. I have given you trouble enough already.' "'No trouble at all,' said Sir Ralph kindly. "'Her ladyship is too happy to be of service in a case like this. Are you not, Nell? The faintness will pass off presently. But let her go to the Abbey at once, and remain there till the evening's festivities, in which she takes part, commence.' "'Give her your arm, Dick.' Sir Ralph's word was law, and therefore Lady Asherton made no remonstrance. But she said quickly, "'I will take care of her myself.' "'I require no assistance, madam,' replied Alison, "'since Sir Ralph will have me go. Nay, you are too kind, too condescending,' she added, reluctantly taking Lady Asherton's proffered arm. And in this way they proceeded slowly towards the abbey escorted by Richard Asherton, and attended by Mrs. Braddill and some others of the ladies. Amongst those who had watched the progress of the May Queen's restoration with most interest was Mrs. Nutter, though she had not interfered, and as Alison departed with Lady Asherton, she observed to Nicholas, who was standing near, "'Can this be the daughter of Elizabeth Device, and granddaughter of your old Pendle witch, Mother Demdike?' "'supplied Nicholas. "'The very same, I assure you, Mistress Nutter.' "'She is wholly unlike the family,' observed the lady, "'and her features resemble some I have seen before.' "'She does not resemble her mother, undoubtedly,' replied Nicholas. "'Though what her granddame may have been like some sixty years ago, "'when she was Alison's age, it would be difficult to say. "'She is no beauty now.' "'Those finely modelled features, that graceful figure, and those delicate hands, "'cannot surely belong to one lowly born and bred,' said Mistress Nutter. "'They differ from the ordinary peasant mould, truly,' replied Nicholas. "'If you ask me for the lineage of a steed, I can give a guess at it on sight of the animal. "'But as regards our own race, I am at fault, Mistress Nutter. "'I must question Elizabeth Device about her.' observed Alice. Mm, strange I should never have seen her before, though I know the family so well. Ah, I wish you did not know Mother Demdike quite so well, Mistress Nutter, replied Nicholas, a mischievous and malignant old witch who deserves the tar-barrel. The only marvel is that she has not been burned long ago. I am of opinion with many others that it was she who bewitched your poor husband, Richard Nutter. I, I do not think it replied Mistress Nutter, with a mournful shake of the head. Uh, alas, poor man! He died from hard riding after hard drinking. That was the only witchcraft in his case. Be warned by his fate yourself, Nicholas. Hard riding after drinking was more likely to sober him than to kill him, rejoined the squire. But, as I said just now, I like not this Mother Demdike, nor her rival in iniquity, old Mother Chattox. The devil only knows which of the two is worse. But if the former hag did not bewitch your husband to death, as I shrewdly suspect it, 
it is certain that the latter mumbling old miscreant killed my elder brother richard by her sorceries mother chattox did you a good turn then nicholas observed mistress nutter in making you master of the fair estates of Downham. so far perhaps she might replied nicholas but i do not like the manner of it and would gladly see her burned nay i would fire the faggots myself you are superstitious as the rest nicholas said mistress nutter for my part i do not believe in the existence of witches not believe in witches with these two living proofs to the contrary cried nicholas in amazement why pendle forest swarms with witches they burrow in the hillside like rabbits in a warren they are the terror of the whole country no man's cattle goods or even life are safe from them and the only reason why these two old hags who hold sovereign way over the others have escaped justice so long is because every one is afraid to go near them their solitary habitations are more strongly guarded than fortresses not believe in witches why i should as soon misdoubt the holy scriptures it may be because i reside near them that i have so little apprehension or rather no apprehension at all replied mistress nutter 